this is very hard. No, this is okay. I'll just take me two minutes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome here at IRI. So on behalf of the organizers, uh, which include uh, me, Rajiv Jain from IISC, Prava from IIA, Saurabh and Mayuri from RRI, and Ajit from ICTS, uh, it's a pleasure to invite you all to this inaugural uh, version of the uh, Neighborhood Cosmology Meeting. Uh, and this is a series that we have started with the meeting today here. And uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you a few details about why we thought about uh, initiating these meetings. Um, so the first and foremost, as you all know perhaps, that uh, over time the cosmology community in Bangalore has really grown a lot. Okay, If we put together all the institutes, namely IIA, RRI, IISC, and ICTS, uh, there's a large number of people who are uh, um, working on various aspects of cosmology. All right? And of course the community is sizable. Okay, Really a large number of people. I mean, this is evident from this lecture hall. Uh, there are many more to join. The community is vibrant and diverse. Okay? We are working on different aspects of cosmology. Okay? And this includes theoretical, observational, and instrumentation. Okay? Moreover, we are also, this community here in Bangalore is also involved in various missions. Okay? Just to name a few, this is LIGO, LISA, SKA India, CMB Bharat, etc., etc. There are many more. I'm not listing all of it. Okay? So what we thought of is to, you know, in order to you know, exchange ideas, foster collaborations, scientific discussions, and more importantly, to know the community. Okay? For example, I don't know many of you in this room, okay? especially the students. You know? And also, among the student community, to also get to know each other, we thought it is important to, uh, to organize these regular meetings, but short meetings. Okay? We don't really think of you know, two or three days meetings. The idea is to have short one-day meetings which can be focused on, on some topics. And especially, you know, we can ask our younger colleagues, uh, namely students and postdocs, to present their work. Okay? So all these thoughts led us to initiate these one-day meetings. Um, uh, and at some point, we started discussing a couple of months ago. And all these discussions led us to this uh, meeting that we are here for today. And the idea is to organize them regularly, okay? perhaps once every six months. And this is something we can discuss in the discussion session that we have organized later in the day. And of course, the venue will keep rotating. Okay? And of course, as I said, that this is a great opportunity for younger people, especially the PhD students and postdocs, okay? because giving talks is always a good idea. Okay? And uh, you know, to, get, uh, you know, to present their work and also get feedback on your work. Okay? And of course, you know, uh, this meeting is open to suggestions. Okay? Uh, let's say, what about the length and the format, whether we should stick to this one-day format, whether we should make it one and a half day, given the size of the community, whether we should have longer talks, shorter talks, like in a conference style. All these things we can discuss uh, later on. And uh, the discussion session that we have planned for uh, today, we can also discuss some you know, new developments in cosmology, okay? for example, new missions, future missions, you know, ongoing missions, future missions, and you know, what are we going to learn from these new missions. Okay? And uh, as you would have seen the program of the meeting, the large number of topics which are of very recent interest are going to be covered here. I'm not going to name all of them, but you can perhaps look at it. And you can also look at the program. All these topics are of really great interest. Okay? And if you, if you open the archive, okay, any given day, any given random day, you would see at least a bunch of papers from many of these topics, which clearly indicates that these topics are of really great interest. Okay? And you would see, uh, you would hear talks almost on all these topics, I believe, in the meeting today. Okay? So um, before we start the session today, I'm going to hand it over to Saurabh to uh, tell you a few uh, logistic uh, details. Saurabh. Do you need this? Uh, thanks, Rajiv. Um, so, yeah, I think we should get started. Uh, but before that, very quick logistical announcements. Uh, so the, the talks are 15 minutes, 13 plus 2. So uh, our chairs will give you a two-minute warning. Uh, and we please uh, 
stick to the time because we have a lot of talks. Um, as far as uh, other uh, arrangements are concerned, uh, there is water just outside, uh, and there are washrooms on this floor, down the hall, and also uh, downstairs. Um, and then uh, our lunch arrangement is upstairs in the library block, which is the building adjacent to the main building. Of course, we will all go in group. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. And I think without, uh, yeah. And if you have, haven't have uploaded your talks, um, please do them now. Um, uh, and I also want to very quickly check uh, how many of you intend to use laptops? OK, fine. So uh, I would suggest people who want to use their laptops in just uh, when this, before the session starts, please come and check whether the connection is working. So with that, I think uh, we have completed. Yeah, Rajiv, you have something? They want to use the laptop, but they're not necessarily giving talks, I believe. Like, no, no. Uh, huh? No, I think they're giving talks. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. want to use your laptop to use? No, I don't want to use laptop. Okay. okay. No, sorry. I meant laptops. Uh, <laughs> if you have Mac or a Keynote uh, version, yeah. then I think you may have to use your Mac. Uh, other than that, I think um, everything is supported here. Uh, so yeah, uh, who um, wants to do that, please uh, uh, check your laptop connection uh, before the session starts. And with that, I'll uh, hand over to the first chair, Prava. Please take it away. So I'm the timekeeper for the first session. Okay. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm the timekeeper for the first session. And uh, in the first session, I think we have six talks. So 15 minutes each, and I see that there is representation from all four institutes, so which is great. Uh, so we start with uh, Moshmi. So you have 15 minutes. I will give a warning, uh, two minutes at 11 minutes, OK? So that we have two minutes at the end for a couple of questions. You can use this. Can you all hear me? Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, organizers, for letting me share my work with you. It is wonderful to see so many cosmology people. Uh, I didn't know there were so many cosmology people. OK, so I'm starting today with something which is not very theoretical. And it's about dark matter, something that all of us can't see, but we can always detect with the effect of gravity. And I'm going to speak about a work which is basically uh, a summation of two papers which I published where I have tried to use a new technique which is the neutral hydrogen velocity dispersion to determine the shape of galaxy dark matter halos. Now, uh, this is basically the outline of the talk because, but before, since I don't have a lot of time, let me just tell you a quick background. I'm sure all of you know this, that galaxies are our best bet for understanding dark matter, both its nature, its distribution, because galaxies are so close. Most of the uh, dark matter dominated galaxies are very close to us in the universe, very close to our galaxies. So we know from rotation curves of galaxies and other probes that galaxy disks, stellar disks, are embedded in massive dark matter halos. And these halos are the stabilizing potential for all the disk dynamics that goes in the galaxy. So one of the ways to look and understand galaxy dark matter halos is to actually study the dynamics of galaxy disks. OK, so um, I, I didn't do this work alone, um, uh, particularly the second person, uh, Roger. It was very important for this work because he's an expert person in neutral hydrogen velocity dispersion. And of course, Dwarka is from Maradai and the others. Uh, Ankit is an ex-student who is now going to go to Chile. Okay, so let's just quickly go through the observations of dark matter halo shapes. Now, I had forgotten to mention that there are several things we don't know about dark matter in galaxies. The first and foremost is where does the dark matter, dark matter halo end? We don't know where it ends. 
We don't know how it peaks in the center, whether it's a cuspy core, density distribution, or whether it's a flat core in the center. We don't know what it's made of. Is it clumpy? Is it uniform in distribution? There are so many questions. But in this talk, I'm only going to focus on the dark matter halo shapes. OK, so quickly as a primer to how people in the last 30 years have tried to understand the dark matter halo shape. I'll just show you in these couple of slides. I think the first one to mention is the polar rings. Now, many galaxies have been found to have these really extended rings of uh, gas, mainly uh, neutral hydrogen gas, and in some case, uh, stellar matter as well. And these polar rings are uh, very p usually perpendicular to the disk, and they're very extended. This is probably uh, the best example, NGC 4650A. And because they extend so much out into the disk, they are excellent probes of the dark matter halo shape. And from these studies, several decades ago, people found that uh, halo, dark matter halos could either be prolate and in some cases oblate. So there's no consensus. Now, the other uh, very good probe is neutral hydrogen. Because neutral hydrogen galaxies extends far beyond the stellar disk. We know that the stellar disk, for example, in our own galaxy doesn't go much beyond 15 kiloparsecs in radius. But the neutral hydrogen extends to around 30 kiloparsecs in radius. So it is an excellent probe of the outer parts of galaxy halos. Now, if the neutral hydrogen disk is flared or warped, that's telling you something about that large dark matter halo potential. Maybe the axis of that uh, potential is a little different from the axis of the stellar disk, and that's causing the warp. So these kind of ways to understand the dark matter halo, halo shape using neutral hydrogen were, have been very popular. Now, another way to look at it is the equilibrium of the neutral hydrogen disk. Now, the neutral hydrogen disk is kept by the gravity of the stars. You have to remember the neutral hydrogen is like the clouds in our sky. They're very diffuse. So you need some gravity to keep it attached to the disk. Now, when you go beyond the stellar disk, the question arises, what keeps it pinched into the disk? What keeps it rotating? And what is the gravitational force that keeps it in a disk form? And that is a question that we have asked in uh, our papers. It must be the dark matter halo. So the halo potential is enough to make sure that the neutral hydrogen continues to be a disk even beyond the stellar disk. And so that fact has been used by several people to understand the hydrostatic equilibrium, basically, to understand the uh, halo potential shape. And this has been done also by Chanda at IAC with uh, uh, Arunima. Now, another way, uh, observational way to look at the halo is looking at the globular clusters. Because the globular clusters are distributed in the halo. So their distribution can tell us something about the halo potential. And people have used this, especially uh, with Gaia observations. And they find that our Milky Way, for example, has a prolate shape. And tidal streams also are used. And the tidal streams, which you can see here, are very faintly around nearby galaxies, are very faint structures, which are the tidal debris of infalling satellites. So they're like the dynamical friction-generated tails of satellite galaxies that have been swallowed up by the main galaxy. So they will tell us also something about the potential. Now let's go to the theoretical side. On the theoretical front, um, there has been, of course, for several decades, but as the computational uh, facilities improve, so do our understanding of the dark matter halo shape. Now, this is a very early simulation in 1994 by Dubinsky, which showed that as the, uh, as the halo, dark halo forms, and as, it, as matter starts to fall into the halo, the matter will have some angular momentum and start to rotate. It will also pull the dark halo also as well. So it's, it's like an adiabatic contraction. In fact, that is what it is called, the adiabatic contraction of the halos. Now, as the ma matter starts to also uh, form stars and stabilize in a disk, it will tend to form a disk and, the, and pull the halo also into a kind of disk. So the halo potential, this was theorized in the mid-90s, the halo potential will have axis A equal to B in the plane of the disk, stellar disk, 
but the axis on the vertical side may vary. So this has been pursued by, uh, more recently by cosmological simulations, which start from uh, you know, the beginning and star formation. Now, these cosmological simulations are more uh, sophisticated because they not only look at the stellar mass, but they also look at star formation and agent feedback. Now, these processes, what they can do is they can push matter outside. So as star formation happens, the winds can push matter outside, changing the shape of the halo. Star formation itself will also change, maybe change the halo. A lot of this will happen close to the stellar disk. And you can see here the difference. These black lines are the dark matter only simulations, and the red colors are the ones with star formation and AGN feedback. And so, but generally the consensus is, is that in the plane of the stellar disk, the halo axis B and A are approximately equal. So B is equals to A. So the real parameter we have to look for in galaxy dark matter halos is the vertical direction, the C by A axis. That C by A axis I've termed as Q, the oblateness of the halo or prolateness of the halo Q. And this is just some more simulation. Now let's get down to my work. Um, so this is an, uh, I think this is a very exciting picture of a galaxy. On the left, you see the stellar disk. On the right, you see the neutral hydrogen. And, and you know, when I first looked at this image, I thought they, they can't be on the same scale, but they are. And so that shows that the neutral hydrogen extends two to two and a half, sometimes even three times beyond the stellar disk. So there are two questions here. Number one, what stable, what, you know, what keeps the neutral hydrogen in a disk? What is the hydrostatic equilibrium of the neutral hydrogen beyond the stellar disk? What gravity keeps it in a disk? That's the first question. The third question is that, um, the third question is what is the halo shape that keeps it in this kind of, a, um, uh, kind of an equilibrium? So we utilize this, um, this, pr uh, this property of galaxies. We took the, ha um, the neutral hydrogen distribution beyond the stellar disk, so we've avoided the stellar disk, and we have tried to use the velocity dispersion to calculate the hydrostatic equilibrium and then calculate the shape of the halo. Now let's just step back a bit because I just want to mention the equilibrium of neutral hydrogen disks. We all know from our first year or PhD studies that when we have a neutral hydrogen disk, the rotation velocity V squared by R is equal to GMM by R squared. That's something we learned in class 12. That is the rotation equilibrium of the rotating disk, stellar disk and the gas disk. And using that, we can, using the rotation curves, we can find the mass of the halo. However, you have to remember that this is assuming that it's a spherical halo. Okay, if it's oblate, this would not hold. So this is the equilibrium of the rotational or plane, in-plane hydrogen disk. Now, what about the vertical direction? In the vertical direction, the gravity that will keep the hydrogen in place will be the stellar disk, because the stellar disk has a lot more gravity. However, when you go beyond the stellar disk, the question is what keeps it, um, what keeps it in place? Okay, so these were our main questions. So what I did was the hydrostatic equilibrium of the neutral hydrogen disk, and then I found in the first project that there is a lot more uh, dynamical mass in the outer parts of galaxies, and this you can see from the difference between the, uh, the green one and the red one. This is dynamical, this is the... So this dynamical mass I then modeled with a logarithmic potential for the halo. And in this logarithmic potential, you have a Q factor, which is the oblateness or prolateness of the halo, basically C by A. <clears throat> and then when we applied it, we, we, we were lucky enough to get 20 galaxies. It's very hard to get face-on galaxies when you go through the literature. So we got about 20 galaxies, and a large fraction of them were dwarf, dark matter-dominated dwarf galaxies. These are the H1 velocity dispersion curves that we used. So you have to remember that I'm using a face-on galaxy where I'm looking at the velocity dispersion, which is the vertical dispersion in the disk. And that vertical dispersion will tell us about the hydrostatic equilibrium. And finally, 
the oblateness parameter q. So these are the curves. I, you won't have time to look at it right now. But let me just tell you that we are looking at the part beyond the R, R25 radius, which is this dash dash line. And you can see that it more or less becomes constant. Now, the interesting thing would be to connect this Q with the other properties of the galaxies. So the first property was the stellar mass. And on, this, uh, on the x-axis, this is the stellar mass, log of stellar mass, and this is the oblateness parameter Q. And you, we can see that there is a, a somewhat, there is a correlation of about 0.78. But the most interesting correlation, well, not really correlation, but um, uh, effect that we saw is that when we have gas-dominated galaxies, and these are all dwarfs, then the halo is usually oblate. Whereas when we have stellar-dominated galaxies, which may have gone a lot of mergers from early epochs, we have a variety of parameters. So this basically tells us that gas-rich dwarfs have a lot more angular momentum and maybe that's what makes the halos more ablate, whereas the uh, uh, stellar dominated galaxies can have a variety of Q values. And uh, why is it important? Let me just quickly flash this slide. It's important because if you have uh, uh, a galaxy halo which is ablate, you're putting more and more mass into the disk of the galaxy. That increases the mass, increases the stellar velocity dispersion of the disk stars. Increasing stellar velocity affects the disk dynamics, delays the bar formation, and makes it more difficult to have strong spiral arms. So this was shown by Ankit. I will stop here because I think I'm out of time, okay? And just keep my summary up. Thank you, Mashmi, for a wonderful opening talk. We will take one quick question. Yeah, Ranjan. And there have been some. Who has shown? Sorry, I didn't get Gaia. It. Looking at Gaia people, ah, yeah, yeah, Helmi yeah. et al. and company, I mean yes. Helmi and company. And then yes. very recently there are these uh, simulations from Charlie Conroy who says that the galaxy dark matter halo mm -hmm. is uh, not aligned with the, uh, with the ah, stellar, with stellar, uh, stellar halo. I mean, yeah. do you have any com is this something similar or do you have any comments on uh, this? No, this, in, in, that we, in this project we have assumed non warping. The warping, which I have looked in the literature, the warping usually starts in the extreme outer yes, yes. parts of galaxies. Yes, yes, yes. In this, in our study, we don't go that far. We don't go further than R25 or 1.5 R25. But the warping usually starts very, very. So much this is there. a dwarf galaxy, you said, right? These are dwarf galaxies. These some are dwarf. About. Do they have disks? Oh yes, yes. They are yeah. all disk dominated. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. Okay. Uh, thanks. So we move on to the next speaker, Vidya Ganeshan. Vidya, I will warn you at 11 minutes. So I will be talking about my ongoing work on chameleon dark energy model, which I am working uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Shubhnai Das, uh, Arka Banerjee, Amlan, and Tulip. The title, the title of my talk is Chameleon Dark Energy Model Revisited in the Context of Hubble Tension. Uh, the dark sector makes about 95% of our universe, and it is, uh, which is uh, 68 68% uh, dark energy, 27% dark matter, and 5% visible matter. Even though dark sector makes a ma major part of our universe, but its fundamental nature is still a mystery. So, uh, so far, the observational evidence strongly points to lambda CDM model, uh, where lambda is the cosmological constant, CDM is the cold dark matter. But from the theoretical point, point of view, it is still not satisfactory. So one, one problem is the cosmological constant problem, where a constant energy density associated with the co cosmological constant from observation is about 10 to the power of minus 47. Mm. 
the cosmological can, uh, constant can be interpreted as the vacuum energy density, which from particle physics comes to be about 10 to the power of 74, which, uh, which shows uh, uh, 121 orders of magnitude difference. So another such problem is the coincidence problem, where the dark energy density of uh, dark matter and dark energy, even though they have a completely different dynamics, their, uh, f their current value seems to be the same order. In order to have such coincidence, the initial condition needs to be very finely tuned. Because of such problems, people started thinking of alternative dark energy models. One such model, alternative model, is Quintessence. Uh, in the Quintessence, uh, the dark energy is modeled as a scalar field phi rolling down a potential V of phi. So the, the equation of state W of, uh, is um, uh, is defined as uh, pressure by density. So, for uh, in order to have accelerating ac accelerated expansion, W has to be less than minus one by three. So, in quintessence, we cannot have W less than equal uh, less than minus one. Mm. But Planck uh, constrains W to be uh, minus one point zero three, which is uh, slightly less than minus one. So another, uh, another alternative model is interacting dark energy model, which is the focus of our work. So in this work, if the, there is no, in the absence of any uh, symmetry forbidding an interaction, an interaction is still possible in nature. So if we consider uh, dark energy to be interacting with uh, baryons or radiation, uh, it is going to, it has a very tight constraints from uh, local gravity tests and stellar source observations. So we, if we consider uh, dark energy interaction with the dark matter, we expect it to be small because uh, we, uh, lambda CDM is still the best fit model. So uh, another interesting feature is that uh, any interacting model can be re-expressed uh, re, uh, re in terms of the modified gravity model. So as I told in quintessence, W cannot be less than minus one we can ask whether the introducing and interacting dark energy, whether W can take values less than minus one. I will come back to this question at a later slide. So this is a chameleon model I am working on. So it is called chameleon because the mass of the chameleon scalar field depends on the local matter density. So uh, this was first proposed by Justin Cowrie and Amanda Weltman. Mm. So in high dense regions, a chameleon scalar field becomes massive and it becomes a short range force. So it manages to hide from the local gravity test. But in uh, um, large scales where the density is low, the chameleon scalar field becomes long range force and it can, it can drive the accelerated expansion. In a work by J. Wang, they showed the chameleon force range corresponding to the interaction with baryons was uh, below one megaparsec, so it cannot uh, drive the accelerated expansion. However, this can be circumvented if we consider the scalar field to be only interacting with dark matter. So we, in this model, we consider the interaction between dark matter and dark energy to be of the echova type, that is the interaction with Dirac spinner phi and scalar field phi. So this is the modified Friedman and klein gordon equation. The modification is in this term and this term, where F is the coupling function and V is the potential. We can uh, redefine this potential as a new potential, effective potential. So effective potential. And F, we take the coupling function to be of the exponential form and the potential to be the power law, uh, power law form. Uh, these forms are motivated from string theory models. The, the dark energy density and, uh, and dark matter density density in this model is, uh, is comes in this form. So we see the dark matter density is modified uh, with this coupling function and the dark energy is defined as the usual form, but the uh, dynamics phi is controlled uh, by this uh, Klein-Gordon equation, modified Klein-Gordon equation. The, the entire dynamics of phi is defined by the V effective. So we see this is the V of phi, and this is the interaction term. And if we consider the interaction, uh, if there is no interaction, if we consider only V of phi, let's say if we phi starts off with at some phi initial value, it phi will roll down and it will go to infinite values. 
the interaction uh, if term acts as a stabilizing uh, uh, factor. So then if we consider the interaction with the interaction, the phi initial, we start off, we, it will roll down and stabilize uh, and after that as V effective uh, evolves, the, the phi will uh, follow the minima of the V effective. Uh, in this model, we have the standard lambda CDM, 6 lambda CDM model and additionally we have two extra parameters which is the alpha and beta. So if we consider a universe where the dark matter and dark energy are interacting, then the dark energy dark matter will be in this form. But if an observer is going to assume the dark matter dark energy to be non-interacting, and he analyzes the data, he will end up getting, this is the correct ed, uh, energy density, and will end up getting a different energy density. So, the, let's say that uh, dark energy density is uh, rho d e observed, and this is the rho d m 0 by a cube. If we associate the, uh, if we, um, the equation of state associated with uh, this observed energy density is W observed, W phi is the actual equation of state of the interacting dark energy, so this is how it will be uh, related. So x is given by this expression. So um, uh, this uh, this has been, this expression is derived in this paper by Shubhnoi, and I, uh, this W phi of the uh, the actual uh, equation state of the of the interacting dark energy will still be uh, have values greater than or equal to minus one. Sorry, what, uh, is huh? what is phi naught? Phi naught is the value of the scalar field at the current value of the scalar field. Right. So, uh, so W phi will uh, continue to satisfy, like in quintessence as I tell, W will always be greater than or equal to minus 1. W phi of the interacting field is still have values greater than or equal to minus 1. So now let's see whether W observed, that is, uh, that is calculated by the observer, can take values less than, mm, sorry, less than minus 1. So if we take for a monotonically increasing uh, coupling function, we get uh, we, uh, x takes values greater than equal to 0, where x is equal to 0 corresponds to today, x greater than 0 is past. So if for x is equal to 0, we get W observed is equal to W phi, which takes values greater than equal to uh, minus 1. So for x greater than 0, for flat potential, W phi is approximately minus 1, then W observed can takes values less than minus 1. It is possible that the observer can, uh, by mistake, um, calculate values, uh, equation of straight values less than minus 1. So he sees an apparent phantom behavior. So when we take uh, this interacting dark energy, the observer by mistake can calculate, uh, get uh, equation of straight less than minus 1. So in this, uh, this is a work we have done where we are for the first time we have uh, solved the full uh, Friedman and Klein-Gordon Klein equation using class and cam and this is the plot for the phi and uh, uh, density parameter that we get. So in this, um, the phi initial, um, in order to get the proper correct dark energy density, the phi initial needs to be finely tuned. So because the phi initial has to be chosen such that that uh, the phi initial after rolling down it settles down at the v effective minima at the around the time of uh, radiation dominated era and then so then only it will have the uh, proper current dark energy density so we have finely tuned and then we have uh, we this is the equation of state we got from the, after solving the 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 two modified friedman and klein gordon equation so this uh, the the blue one. This is the W phi, uh, which is the actual uh, uh, equation of state of the interacting dark energy. So that we see is still remains greater than or equal to minus one. W observed that the observer, by, uh, if he assumes it to be non-interacting, then we will end up getting uh, that we see goes below minus one. Then. Mm, then the another thing is that the background evolution does not depend on the coupling parameter because the scalar field phi can be redefined as beta phi. So in order to measure beta, 
uh, we need to consider the effects on the evolution of homo inhomogeneities. So these are the modified perturbation equations, uh, which includes the interacting dark sector. So I'm going to skip the Hubble tension. So this is the final uh, result. So uh, in a work by Eric, uh, they have found that the, uh, the combination of data set with CMB, baryon acoustic oscillation, supernova data set, puts very strong constraints on dark energy models and curvature. Mm or in other words, it strongly supports the flat lambda CDM model. They have observed that the various quintessence models, when they are analyzed with the BAO data set, they always seem to mm, uh, get lower H0 values. So in our work, we have modified class to include chameleon model and incorporated in the Montepython to constrain various parameters. So, we found that chameleon model consistently is giving a higher Hubble parameter values with the data set with Planck alone, Planck and BAO, Planck, BAO, Pantheon Plus, and SHU. This shows that the chameleon model is capable of, um, it can, can alleviate the Hubble tension. And further, we constrained the dark energy, dark matter coupling parameter beta, which shows a peak around the 0 0.09 with this data set which hints on the existence of dark sector interaction. So these are the plots we got. So we get with the lambda CDM model, we get uh, H0 about 67.3. And this is with the chameleon model. With only Planck, we get 74.5. With Planck plus BO, we get 73.9. And this is the, with the, this data set. And this is the contour plot we got. And this is the uh, H0 value. 73.9 and beta value 0 0.09. And future directions, uh, we expect large scale structure to be sensitive to the presence of dark sector interaction. So we, uh, we uh, intend to do n body simulation of large scale structure with uh, dark sector interactions. So then study the using tensor Minkowski function, which is a tensor type morphological observable, which can, uh, which can study the features induced due to the presence of dark sector interaction. So then uh, the full coverage of the future surface like Euclid can put a stronger constraint on beta. Thank you, Vidya. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, Rajiv, first question. Excluded. So, what is the comment? Is this model already excluded? Okay, I'm not sure I understand completely, but let's talk uh, later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we can discuss more in the coffee time. So let's move on to the next speaker, Chetan. So Chetan, I'll warn you at 11 minutes. Sorry? I'll yeah. warn you at 11 yeah. minutes. sent it. I think I uploaded it, hopefully successfully. <laughs> yes, that's the one.
start? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, series of works that we have been doing. Um, it started out with my student, Renjini. And I was hoping that she would give this talk, but uh, unfortunately, she, because of medical reasons, she had to go to Calcutta. Uh, and uh, so these are, uh, so we started out doing this uh, in this paper. Uh, and uh, now Shaheen in, uh, in, in Sharif has also gotten interested. So he is like, you know, I think he is kind of like more of an expert on this than I am at this stage. Uh, but yeah, so I'll try to give you a general overview. And uh, so I also should say that, you know, this paper, we had a hard time getting it published. So uh, I think unnecessarily, but uh, you know, you might want to take some of this with, uh, uh, you know, a grain of salt. So, so the so 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 the basic idea. So let me just because there are too many slides for this the time that is there. So I'll uh, there is 21 slides, but I'll try to kind of give you an overview of the general idea in the next five to six slides, and after that, you know, depending on how things go, maybe I'll skip some slides and so on. Okay. So the basic idea is that uh, I want to talk about a certain class of anisotropic Bianchi universes. So Bianchi universes are a class of universes which have anisotropies in them. And generally speaking, they are kind of a formal curiosity. Okay, so, but I want to argue that they might be of some phenomenological interest. So, uh, so and this, in the very specific class of uh, Bianchi cosmology that I'm interested in, I'm calling dipole cosmology. And I don't feel, I don't think that the metric version of those things have been written down, even in the even in the, you know, in, yeah, I'll talk about what is the specific reason why I'm interested in it and why is it distinct from the previous uh, things that people have done. So, uh, so the, the basic reason for our interest in it is that these are cosmologies that are the most symmetric or most Copernican uh, generalization of FLRW paradigm that admits a flow in the cosmic fluid. And so the question is, um, why are we interested in it and what is the, uh, what are the consequences of it? So, so I'm, so the, so the, so it's in some sense, so the, so the so selling point, once you get to get, once you buy into dipole cosmology, the selling point is it's a model building paradigm as, uh, you know, sort of simple as FLRW. It has two extra functions, both of which are functions of time. So these are ODE still. So you can do the conventional model building that people do for lambda CDM. And uh, you can write down models that look very similar to dipole lambda, you know, uh, to flat lambda CDM in this setting. So that's what makes it interesting. So in some sense, it's like a slight variation of FLRW, which allows uh, departures from it in a sort of a controlled way. So and while being completely tractable. So the reason why it is, uh, so generally speaking, I think the reason why people don't like uh, Bianchi cosmologies as candidates for like, let's say, actual phenomenology is because of the fact that generally there are these general um, cosmic no hair theorem sort of arguments, which imply that at late universe, you know, all the you know, perturbations and anisotropies and everything just dies down, especially if there is a cosmological constant. So this cosmic no hair theorem is very specifically for the case when there is a positive lambda, so that the expansion is accelerating and everything dies down. So I would claim, and in fact, you know, it follows very trivially, sort of, if you just evolve our equations, that this, is, uh, this doesn't happen in these cosmologies. Okay, so these are, in some sense, homogeneous perturbations of the FLRW setup, which do not die out at late times in the sense of cosmic no hair theorem. So that's what makes them sort of phenomenologically interesting. And the reason for that is that the, the, the dipole flow, which is in the matter sector, which is to be distinguished from the shear anisotropies that people usually talk about in the context of, uh, uh, you know, these cosmic no hair theorem kind of arguments. And the, the point is that the matter sector, if the flow it doesn't carry as much energy to back react too strongly on the matter, oh, sorry, on the metric. So that's the reason why uh, this is, these are kind of like a, let's say a loophole, or at least they evade this cosmic no hair theorem kind of arguments. So, uh, and so, and the, and the sort of, the, so, so if, even if after all this, it would have not have been, so it would have still been only a formal interest in my opinion, if it was the case that there did not, you know, these, they did not admit solutions which departed from FLRW at late times. But some of the solutions do. In fact, it's quite generically true in solutions which contain radiation as well, okay? In, uh, in, uh, in these dipole cosmologies which contain radiation and matter, there is always, or, or quite generically, in the space of initial conditions, you find that the flow of the matter and the flow of the, uh, the, the radiation kind of are, are depart from each other, which basically means that there, these, there are CMB dipoles or generic predictions of this kind of setting. So, and this observation may be relevant for various claims about, you know, the recent observational claims about quasars and all that kind of thing. So I will probably talk about that a little bit. Ah, yeah. So, 
so yeah, so that's the so that's what I'm showing here. So I'm not you know I don't want to necessarily get behind uh, all of these uh, this uh, this ob this observational claims because some of them are there are various reasons one might be suspicious of some of them. But I do want to emphasize these two observations: one of them from coming from quasars and one of them coming from radio galaxies, both of which are independent data sets. You might criticize each of them for various reasons, but it still is interesting that there has been uh, you know almost five sigma evidence for a dipole which is not consistent with the CMB uh, in uh, two sets of uh, cosmological data sets. OK, so yeah, so, 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 so in some sense, you could think of it as the possibility. So what we are trying to do here is what happens if we take the possibility that the CMB, CMB dipole is not entirely kinematic, OK? And, uh, and is, the result of, of a, is the result of a cosmic flow, should we take it seriously? So this is the question that one could ask. And I also want to, like, I think uh, Tarun Sauradeep is maybe somewhere here. I don't know. So, yeah, so we, I think we had some kind of, uh, uh, you know, co a conversation about this. So I want to kind of point out why it is distinct from some of the claims about why the CMB, the, you know, the, 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 the dipole in the CMB, if you treat it as, uh, if, you, if, you, if you imagine that the dipole in the CMB is intrinsic and whatever you're seeing is d due to a motion, then that is good enough to, exp then one can argue that the other, other multipoles in the CMB are consistent with it being just due to a bo boost. So this is sometimes called evidence that the CMB dipole is intrinsic. Okay, so, but I want to distinguish between the CMB, di CMB having an intrinsic dipole versus the possibility that there being a flow between the last scattering surface and now. So which is a different statement. So that will not be accessible to a calculation like this. We have no problems with their calculation, but I want to emphasize that it does not address the precise point that I'm trying to make here, which is about the fact that there can be a non-kinematical, that is cosmological slash dynamical flow in the universe between the CMB and now, which this calculation is not sensitive to. And that's what we are kind of capturing here. Okay, so, so sort of broader motivation. So those are my kind of my main slides. Now I will, you know, kind of skip through some stuff and uh, at the end I'll show you the, the equation, so to speak. And so the, so, the, so the sort of the broader motivations for me, uh, you know, uh, is that, so there are these observational tensions, tensions in late time universe, you know, whether one takes them seriously or not is your, uh, you know, kind of one's own prerogative. But at the same time, I also want to point out that there are also theoretical challenges from coming from late time cosmology, which is that we don't have a satisfactory, uh, you know, explanation, I mean, at least in the fundamental theory, for why there is an acceleration at late times. So there is, the late time universe is just both theoretically and observationally problematic. So I think it is good to investigate what are the places where our current paradigm may have cracks. So you know, it's, even if you do not buy fully into the idea that this, what we are saying here, is sufficient to resolve all these tensions, at least it is worthwhile looking at why the paradigm has problems of some kind. So I think it is, uh, that's the more of the more philosophical, let's say, motivation for why we are doing what we are doing. Okay, so, um, so let me just start by, so I'll kind of give you a general outline of how we get to it. So, so the Copernican principle, we think of it as a statement about priors. So we assume there are no priors in our universe, then we assume that the universe is as symmetric as possible. So if you make that assumption, then, you, so then the claim would be that the universe is maximally symmetric, you know, not just uh, in uh, sp spatial slices, but also in space time. And then you end up with what is, as we know from a cosmology textbook, what is called the perfect cosmological principle. Okay, so the perfect cosmological principle, the, the, if you assume that, that's essentially a statement about no priors, you know, like the universe is, a, if, if, you, if uh, there is as symmetric as possible, and then you're ending up with some space time, let's say, you know, the only possibilities really are uh, Minkowski space or anti deciduous space, or uh, deciduous space. So, and uh, so, but if you, if you believe that your, our universe is Minkowski space, then you run into trouble with the fact that there is an observational prior that you put into it, which is that, okay, the universe is expanding, coming from Hubble's observations and all kinds of things. And if you put in that prior, then our uh, paradigm changes. And then we come to the conclusion that we only demand homogeneity and isotropy only on spatial slices. So we have, what we have done is we have revised our Copernican principle to incorporate a, uh, incorporate a prejudice slash prior. Okay, so that's what we have done when we go from the perfect cosmological principle to the cosmological principle. And when you do that, you immediately get FLRW, Friedman equations, and you know, standard cosmology. So what we want to do is we want to look at, we want to further revise the prior. Okay, so further revision of a prior basically means that uh, I want to look at universes which only allow some kind of a flow. Because I take the CMB dipole as a phenomenological fact about the universe that is there. So you could argue that it is just due to local motions. Certainly you can do that. But I'm saying that if you were to follow this procedure, this philosophy, of the universe, 
just based on phenomenology, then you would come to the conclusion that, okay, so maybe you should admit the possibility that the universe has a flow. And if you do that, so how should we revise our priors is the question. And this question is essentially, like you could say that it's a one more step in the sequence of, you know, perfect cosmological principle to cosmological pr principle to some special cosmological principle or dipole cosmological principle or something like that. So I think we call it dipole cosmological principle in our paper. So, um, and it turns out that the most symmetric generalization of FLRW that is compatible with such a prior is, uh, uh, is basically you can just, you know, by using symmetries and old papers, we can figure out that it turns out this is a kind of a technical statement. It's not very important that, uh, you know, we get into it. So it is, there is a special class of Bianchi non-isotropic universes which have certain properties and that's the one that we land upon, okay? So, and uh, it turns out, so this is something that you can look up in some, one old paper of King and Ellis. Uh, so Ellis, uh, yeah, oh. So, 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 so f with that, we come to the conclusion that, you know, we, essentially just by putting it in and working through the details, you can show that the metric has to have this form. This is a standard type five uh, Bianchi class. But the stress tensor, as far as I know, has not been written down before, but that also gets determined by the symmetry. So anyway, so the point is that once you have that, you essentially have two, one extra function, this B, and in the matter, metric sector, and one extra function in the, in the stress tensor, which is this beta, which corresponds to the flow. And if you do that, you find that, you know, this, uh, the, FLR, the FRW, the Friedman equations basically just generalize to these equations, which I want to emphasize that essentially as, you know, just basically two equations, two more equations for two more unknown functions, okay? So they are still ODEs, you can solve them trivially on Mathematica. So, uh, so, so that's the statement, and if you get set beta equal to zero, and uh, you know, this A naught is really like, essentially you can set it to one, it's not important. So, um, so beta equal to zero, so then you get back our standard FLRW system. Okay, so the point is that we can do model building with this system, you know, so it's not, it's as uh, flexible or amenable to model building as standard FLRW. And uh, so, so let me also give credit where it's due, which is that most of our, you know, formal work was sort of based on the work of Ellis with various collaborators. And uh, they were the, the reason why uh, somehow this, this particular structure kind of fell through the cracks is because of the reasons that I say here, which is that they, they were always interested in the generality. They wanted to make, consider the, uh, you know, within the symmetries that, they, they wanted to consider the most general homogeneous type of universe that one could look at. So, but that's a fairly complicated universe. But we are less ambitious. What we are doing is, we are trying to look for the most symmetric generalization which incorporates a flow, which means that we can actually make things extremely explicit and do not have to stick to the field bind spin connection kind of uh, formalism that, um, you know, Ellis was using. So that's really the point I'm making here. So most general examples was their interest, most symmetric is ours, so things may get simpler. And another thing, another important kind of pragmatic thing is that they were only concerned with single fluids. So they didn't really see any interesting phenomenology. But if you actually look at multiple fluids, which in fact is one has to show that it is possible to incorporate multiple fluids into the, the system, and it is possible, then you find that the phenomenology gets interesting, and uh, you know, you, yeah, so that's sort of the point that I made at the beginning. So yes, so and right now one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, we are trying to do you know, observational signatures of what one might see. So that if, if at all it is possible to connect to this quasar anisotropy kind of stuff, or if, you know, even if this is allowed, maybe that's not possible. The kind of anisotropies or dipoles that are being seen by quasars and radio galaxies may not be possible in this kind of setting. So that's something we need to actually check. So that's something what we are working on. And in order to really make it a fully fledged theory, of course, you have to do perturbation theory in order to connect with CMB observations and all that. So that is very much wide open, and uh, I don't have the courage to embark on it at the moment anyway. So, uh, so the question, one generic question that one might ask is this flow kind of setups, can we completely get rid of the cosmological constant altogether? I'm not optimistic about that, but one, could, one has to really look at it. So since, you know, so just to be subversive, since I have been selling this dipole cosmology, I'll end with a statement about why I think it might actually not be the case that the universe is a dipole cosmology, and that is because of, and this criticism I have not actually heard from critics of people who, uh, are, you know, critics of anisotropies. So the, the, I think there is a, a valid criticism for uh, not looking at anisotropic universe, and that is something that we try to kind of mention in this paper, which, uh, you know, in some other context, which is that the flow velocities that we see in, uh, you know, in, in, in the, the local flow velocity that we see seems to be roughly consistent with the flows in cluster velocities. So if, if there's a cosmological flow, then that's a fine tuning problem. Why is the cluster velocity the same thing as the flow in the cosmological setting? So, you know, so that's something that might be worth understanding. Maybe there's a dynamical reason, but uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Chetan.
One quick question. Okay, I, I had a question about uh, the, yeah. so in this background, if you set up inflation yeah. models, what are the implications for the plus that's, uh, that's a very good question, but we have not tried. So, but I think there is an old paper where, uh, I forget the author's name, where they had looked at inflation, at the, at the end of inflation, you can have these kinds of tilts. And this is an, there is an old paper, I can find it actually, but, uh, so it, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily the case that inflation completely wash out these uh, tilt, tilt or flow instability. So this is something that is known from old literature, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it? But yeah. Uh, so, but in your yeah, this is this this is one of uh, those things. So that's uh, essentially, um, you know. So the simplest way of doing it would, would be what is called type one. Yeah. So this is basically a type five thing. So it's you know the, the the same structure exists here. So, but it's a very specific kind of structure. That's the point that we're trying to emphasize. So why is it very specific? Because this is the one that is allowed by the symmetry. So okay. if you just demand that there is a, a, a you know a, a, a chosen direction. So instead of just uh, homogeneous expansion, if you have a chosen direction in the sky, then the symmetry is just completely fix everything. So that's the statement. Okay, so uh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker, Saubik Jana. Jana, sorry. So I will be talking about our recently completed work probing the nature of dark matter using strongly lensed gravitational waves. So the work is done in collaboration with Saswat, Tejasi and Ajit. So just a brief uh, classification of dark matter. As you know, 25% of the mass energy of our universe is in the form of non-baryonic dark matter. So <coughs> there are several proposed candidates that, uh, that ranges from elementary particles of like neutrino to the supermassive black hole, uh, supermassive pri primordial black holes. As you can see, that can expand this 80 orders of magnitude on the mass scale. So the, they are mainly classified according to the velocity dispersions of the dark matter particle that defines a free streaming length scale, which affects the structure formation. So the CDM, the cold dark matter, mainly WIMPs and axions, they have a <coughs> very small free streaming length scale and doesn't affect, affect the structure formation. And <coughs> whereas the hot dark matter, the neutrinos, they are very highly relativistic and they are, <coughs> they are very, the free streaming can erase the perturbation in the total matter density even on the galaxy cluster scale. So um, just from the existence of the large scale structures, and these, are ruled, these models are ruled out. Now the WDM warm dark matter is a, um, sits in between there, the cold matter and the cold and hot dark matter. So they are non-relativistic, but they have some non-negligible free streaming length scale and that is shorter than regular neutrinos and that can erase structures at galaxy scale depending on the mass of the WM part particle. And there are other proposed candidates also um, like dark matter model. The wave dark matter model is the fuzzy dark matter and the self-interacting dark matter. So gravitational lensing, so like light gravitational waves also can be deflected by the intervening mass distributions, mostly by the galaxy and galaxy clusters. And the lensing probability is uh, of the order of 10 to the power minus two. This is for 3G detectors. So there are uh, proposed third generation detectors, Cosmic uh, Explorer Einstein Telescope. So they, they can detect uh, all the BBHS up to very high redshift. And the first detection of the lens event is expected in 05. Uh, with 3G detectors, uh, the expected uh, merger rate is millions of events per year. 
So out of those tens of thousands can be lensed and can be lensed and those will be completely new data set and that can be a completely new probe, new and complementary probe to cosmology and nature of dark matter. <coughs> so nature of dark matter and strong gravitational lensing of GW. So strong lensing of GW, the signature of strong lensing is it can, uh, it will produce multiple copies of the signal and that will arrive at the detector at different times. So there will be time delay between the lens signals. This number of to total number of lens events and the distribution of this time delay uh, strongly depend on the halo mass functions and that in turn depend on the nature of the dark matter, whether the dark matter is cold or warm. So if the dark matter is warm, that hinder the formation of low mass halos and that is uh, that will be reflected in the time delay distribution as the absence of lower time delays and less number of lens events as these lower time delays are produced mainly by the low mass halos. So depending on the mass of the WDM particle, the effect will be different. So measuring the distribution of uh, the time delays and the total number of lens events can put constraint on the MWDM. So expected number of lens events, so to calculate the expected number of lens events, we need few components. So here in this uh, expression, R is the BVH merger rate and PBJ is the redshift distribution of the binaries. So these two can be obtained from the uh, observation of unlensed binaries and PL is the lensing, lensing probability and it is simply 1 minus exponent, exponential minus tau. Uh, tau is the optical lensing optical depth. It depends on the uh, nature of the dark matter. So if the uh, dark matter is warmer, then the uh, this this uh, suppressed the total lensing probability is reduced by uh, reduced. So that will cause the reduction in the total number of lens events. And this uh, green bracketed term is the um, considering the fact that we can observe up to some our observation time period is ten years. So we cannot observe the time delays which are greater than the 10 years. So yeah, the time delay between the two lens uh, signals, uh, two images is given by if we consider our lens to be a SIS model, singular isothermal sphere model. So this is given by the, this expression, so where the sigma is the um, lens velocity dispersion, we can think at the lens mass because it has a one-to-one -one relation to the mass of the lens. And this is a particular distance combination um, for SIS and it, at, it depends on the source red shift, lens red shift and the cosmological parameters and Y is the source position uh, in the lens plane, so that is the impact parameter. So the distribution of the time delays can depend on the lens mass and redshift distributions, source redshift distributions, and what is the cosmological parameter values and the distribution of the impact parameter. So if we marginalize over all these astrophysical parameters, we can get the time delay distributions for a given uh, MWDM. Now, <coughs> as I said, this time delay distribution depends on the halo mass function. So Mm, the signature, uh, what is the effect of this nature of dark matter on the halo mass functions? So you can see that the suppression of the low mass halos as the dark matter uh, is getting warmer. So as you reduce the MWDM, there is a suppression in the low mass halos. So this reflects in the mm, velocity dispersion distributions that the low sigmas are uh, becoming less abundant. And this particular combination, sigma to the power 4 dp, d and d sigma, this uh, actually tells us what is the lensing efficiency of those sigmas. So sigma is the mass. So if the um, if the halo is more massive, it is more pro, uh, it is um, it has more lensing efficiency. But how abundant is the lens? Is. So this two combination tells the drives the lensing probability. So you can see that uh, as we as we reduce the MWDM, the lensing probability reduces for the low mass halos. Now the time delay distributions. Uh, yeah, so the uh, effect of this uh, MWDM on the time delay distribution. So in this direction, the MWDM increases. So as, as the MWDM increases, it, it, it approaches the CDM time delay distributions. But uh, with lesser MWDM, we can see the sub, um, their um, absence of the lower time delays. So this is just uh, applying the 10 years, uh, the observation time period cut. And you can see how the total number of lens events also reduces as we uh, reduce the MWDM. So we have this model time delay distributions given some NWDM. Now if we have some data or observed time delay distributions, by matching them we can put constraint on the MWDM. So for that we do the Bayesian analysis. So now let's say, okay, so I simulate a N number of lens events in considering the uh, um, CDM universe and try to recover it with, the, with our constructed templates as in some the, for WDM universe. So if the, um, so it should peak around MWDM so MWDM infinity means the CDM, so it should peak around 
or the 90 percent of the contours would contain the m this zero mwd inverse zero so we can see if we consider the only total number of lens events so this is the constant the red one and if we see mm, if we consider the time delay distribution the constant is the blue one and this black one is the combined constant so if we consider a total mm, a merger rate of 5 into 10 to the power 5 per year and an observation time period of 10 years then our con constant is uh, mwdm inverse less than 0 0.035 which is equivalent of saying mwdm greater than or less than 28 kv can be ruled out so this is for different merger rates uh, uh, this is the optimistic one and for the pessimistic one so you can see the constant here so for the pessimistic one the constant is like mwdm should be greater than 11 or 12 kv and this is the um, this is the, this shaded region so the if we consider a, let's say uh, merger rate of 5 into 10 to the power 5 then the our projected constant or the expected constant constant should lie in between this shaded region depending on the observation time period so we translate our constant um, this wdm constant to the wave dark matter model fuzzy dark matter model just by uh, simply translating the constant by equating the half mode mass scale so you can see mm, this for 5 into 20 to power 5 the okay so the current uh, i think the best constant on the wdm is like 6.048 some in kev and also uh, so these are the like, different margins so this is 1 into 20 to power 4 so with the pessimistic also one we can say that it is better than the current existing constant and also there is a c orders of magnitude i think improvement on the uh, psi mm, this wave dark matter fuzzy dark matter model constant so there are systematics and challenges. So mostly in 3G era, some of the astrophysical or nuisance parameters such as the source distribution of the binaries uh, can be obtained from the observation of the unlensed binaries. So at the time when we will have many, many lens events, there will be several unlensed uh, events. So from that we can get the source distribution and the merger rate and the variation of the merger rate with redshift. And however, the mass and redshift distribution of the lenses, that we need some inputs from the theory or observation. So this hello mass functions model so wrong hello choosing wrong hello mass function or choosing wrong lens red shift and mass distribution can give a bias estimate so there is a possible way out we can calculate the pair of edge base factor so the true model will will have the high highest evidence so wrong also the any identification of the wrong uh, so when you identify the strongly lens event so there could be some uh, like contaminations so wrong identification of the lens events so that can also affect the measurement. So though we check that it's not a significant effect, it will change, but not significantly. So the correlation with the cosmological parameters. So we check the correlation with cosmological parameters and we see there is no such significant correlations. And there is a degeneracy with core radius um, of the lenses, but uh, we check that that doesn't affect the measurement of the um, WDM. So in conclusion, so with the, um, um, the pessimistic and moderate merger rate, also the constants are better than the existing or the proposed constant for um, from different observations and the source distribution can be obtained from the unlensed binaries and this for the lens parameter distributions we need hello mass function and observational input and there are caveats we neglected the se selection function of the detectors and <coughs> we assumed some simple lens model uh, singular isothermal lens model also um, like while modeling the core we need accurate modeling of the red shift evolution and wdm mass dependent of the core radius and this fdm constant what i showed that just a simple simple translation so in for actual analysis we require the hmf in the fdm universe and other effects of fdm on the lens profiles need to be considered yeah so i'll stop here thank you so we have time for questions uh, ranjan hi thanks for the nice talk uh, so you're talking of time delays but because of lensing there'll also be multiple images right shouldn't that create a confusion in what is the redshift of the source so this is a population study. So this is a forward modeling. So we, uh, we model the time delay distributions. No, no, I agree. You're doing the time delay. No, I agree. I'm talking of the multiple images due to lensing. Okay, so, so that. So, the, uh, so, so instead of here on the sky, it will probably be here on the sky, right? Yes. So then uh, determining, so, 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 so how do you determine the redshift of the source, right? Or the distance to the source, right? You'll yes, probably sir. cross correlate with some galaxy maps, right? Okay, so we are so not doing this by event by event. So okay. those information, the redshift distribution of the binaries, that will yes. come from the unlensed binaries. Ah, okay. Okay, and since this is 10 power minus 2, you say that it's the same. 10 the, the probability is 10 power minus 2. Yes, so yes. yes, yes. Okay, okay, good, good. Thanks. Thank you. Are 
because this is how you introduce the warm dark matter in the first place, right? To solve the small scale structure problem. So are there any constraints on that and are they consistent with what you are quoting here? Yes, so the current constraints are MWDM less than 6.048 is ruled out. That comes from the Lehman Alpha or also the satellite observation of the satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. Okay. So that is ruled out. So we are, uh, we are saying that our constraints are better, much tighter than this. So if the universe is truly CDM, mm -hmm. then that is the case. So okay. None of the problems. So yeah. So then it is warm dark matter will be completely ruled out if this is true. So any caveat because this is much stronger than the state of the art constraint on. Oh, oh, forecast. This is a future. Okay. 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 Then okay. Many and what mass function you took like analytical set tormen or like. Uh, or Beruji. Huh? Beruji. Oh, Beruji. Mass function. So. Okay. So can you use this to find dark halos of CDM like where? Baryons are not there. Like, what is the lowest mass CDM halo that you can measure using this? Lowest mass of CDM halos. Yeah, lowest mass CDM halo using this. Can you? Sorry, CDM halos. Oh, yeah, lowest the mass. Lo lowest the mass CDM halo that will so forget the warm dark matter, fuzzy dark matter. Let's assume that we are just thinking of cold dark matter. So you can also use this to measure the HMF, right? Halo mass yeah, function, yeah. right? So what is the lowest mass of the CDM halo that you will find? Ten to the ten to the power eight hours. We can probe. So ten to the power eight, you can probe. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, I think we can have more discussion later in the coffee time. Let's move on to the next speaker. Thanks, Sauve. Devika. Good morning. So um, I am uh, a postdoc in IIC Bangalore. I have just joined yesterday. Uh, until two weeks back, <laughs> until two weeks back, I was a postdoc at Swansea University in the UK. So the talk, uh, this talk will be based on the work that I was doing with my supervisors there. And I have cited that paper here. Um, it has been accepted in JCAP. It should appear soon. So uh, the basic point, uh, okay, so the outline of my talk is that I will be discussing a certain kind of modified cosmological scenario, and uh, I will be uh, trying to describe how it can leave its imprints on the, on the gravitation wave spectrum. And there is also a second part of the talk where I will discuss how it can also have some effects on dark energy, how it can actually account for the dark energy of the universe. Uh, and then uh, I will finish with a summary of my talk. And I should mention that the gravitation wave spectrum that I am talking about here, I will mainly be focusing on the pulsar timing area, the recent pulsar timing area observations, and uh, specifically the nanograph data. So the basic uh, idea behind this work is that there is an unconstrained window of time. When I say unconstrained, I mean observationally relatively unconstrained window of time after the end of inflation and before the onset of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, during which there can be non-standard evolution in the universe. And, uh, but it would not uh, tamper with the BBN observations uh, or anything like that. So, uh, so it can, there can be such non-standard evolution. And the way to, one of the uh, ways to detect that would be via its imprints on the gravitational wave spectrum. So this is just a, this is um, a figure that probably everyone has seen multiple times. But uh, the window that I'm talking, oops, the window that I'm talking about is around this era. Uh, so um, this, uh, so in our case, we have a D-brain uh, motivated scalar tensor setup, and uh, here we work with a disformally coupled metric. The metric is given uh, by this expression, where this uh, one by m power four, this m is related to some uh, the tension of the D-brain. This um, is the modified metric that we will be working with, and this is this form of the coupling is known as disformal coupling. So what happens, I, I, I don't have time to discuss uh, or go through all the equations of motion and everything, but when we use this disformally coupled metric in this setup, we, can, uh, we get a set of equations, uh, a modified uh, uh, set of uh, equations, Friedman equations, 
which can be solved numerically to get the evolution of the expansion rate or the Hubble parameter. And that is what I have plotted here. So uh, it, it is plotted as a function of the temperature of the universe. And if you look at this plot here, the blue line, it corresponds to the uh, evolution of the Hubble parameter that we would have observed in the absence of this modification. So this is just what we would have observed in the lambda CDM scenario. But due to the presence of this modification, what we instead have is this uh, kind of an early universe, uh, uh, non-standard evolution of this uh, expansion parameter. So this is uh, the, the red, the line in red is the one that we actually have in this scenario. So uh, uh, if, if on the basis of this, uh, of this plot, we can uh, try to guess what will be its effect on the gravitational wave spectrum. So if you look at this, there is a peak in this H, uh, the value of H here. So if we, uh, from here, since we know that the gravitational wave spectrum is directly related to the behavior of the expansion parameter, we can expect that the gravitational wave spectrum itself will exhibit this sort of a peak at uh, the frequencies corresponding to these uh, temperatures. So, uh, so to sum it up, we expect a broken power uh, sort of shape in the gravitational wave power spectrum, uh, the gravitational wave energy density spectrum. So uh, before I show you the gravitational wave spectrum, uh, I have to take a little detour and uh, try to explain how we are going to detect it. That is, uh, how, how do we expect the sensitivity curves of the gravitational wave experiments to look like against these observations? So the way to do, the way to uh, check uh, whether our scenario is co consistent with gravitational wave experiments is to compare it against something known as power law integrated uh, sensitivity curves or the PLS curves. This is uh, important for uh, scenarios like uh, our case, which is basically a stochastic uh, background, that is it is a broadband signal. So we can take advantage of this broadband nature of the signal to gain in uh, signal to noise ratio, to gain in SNR. And so what is usually done in this PLS uh, scenario, in this PLS curve for plotting these curves is that a gravitational spectrum of a power law form are assumed. So it is assumed to be like of this form where the beta is the spectral index. And this F star is the reference frequency that uh, when we do this analysis, this F star doesn't affect the results of the analysis. It is just taken as a normalization to make the analysis easy. So after considering the GW spectra of this form, uh, we can calculate the SNR corresponding to this spectrum uh, against uh, by uh, taking the noise spectral density of whichever gravitational wave experiment you are interested in. And then what is done is we take a large number of sets of these spectral indices, uh, this power law indices, and we plot these straight lines that you can see here of different uh, slopes because we, they correspond to different spectral indices. And after plotting these lines, uh, we uh, then plot an, an envelope over these lines. And this envelope of lines is what is known as the PLS curve. And the way to interpret this curve is that if you have a gravitation wave signal that is entering within this PLS region, then it will be detected by the instrument. But what will be the SNR of that uh, detection? That will uh, depend on the signal. But these uh, lines are usually plotted with a specific SNR. Let, let's say we assume that we want to detect uh, a signal with an SNR of 10. Then we will assume that SNR and plot these lines. Then these, this envelope will be uh, the PLS curve of, with an SNR of 10. So anything, any signal that enters within this PLS curve will be detected with an SNR greater than 10. So this is what is usually done. But if we, uh, as I was telling you just before, uh, just before this, that we expect our signal to be of a broken power law form, not a power law form. So then it is evident from this discussion that this PLS curve will not be uh, appropriate for us to compare with our signal. What we instead need to do is extend this analysis for the case of broken power laws. So that is what we did uh, in, a previous, in our previous work here. We extended it to the case of a generalized broken power law signal. And we call this the broken power law integrated sensitivity curves or the BPLS curves. And if you look at the uh, red and the blue lines here, they actually depict the BPLS and the PLS respectively. And you can see that there is some difference between these, P th these two curves. What this means is if you have a broken power law signal, but you compare it against a PLS curve, you will actually be overestimating the detection probability of your signal. So 
if, if you have a broken Paolo signal, you need to compare it against the BPLS curve instead, and that will give you the correct uh, detection probability uh, for any particular instrument. Here I have plotted it for the nanograph uh, instrument, but this, the similar analysis can be done for any gravitational wave experiment. So uh, with this in mind, let us now look at what the gravitational wave spectrum for our scenario actually looks like. So this is uh, what it looks like here. Um, uh, these for the these sensitivity curves for the other experiments I have just uh, plotted here for reference. But what we are interested in is the nanograph sensitivity curve here. So here the solid violet line that is the BPLS curve, uh, the broken Paolo sensitivity curve that I was talking about. The dashed violet line is the PLS. This dashed line would have been the one to compare against if we had a power law signal. But we have a broken power signal, so we compare it against the BPLS curve. And here you can clearly see the difference between the two curves. So our signal is, uh, our uh, gravitational wave uh, spectrum is actually this red one. Here you can see the peak that we were already expecting on the basis of the behavior of the expansion rate of the Hubble parameter. The blue line is what we would have had if uh, there was no such modification. This is the lambda CDM case. And this is the case that we have in our modified scenario. And here we can see that since our signal enters the nanograph BP, BPLS region, so it, sh it should be detected. Uh, it uh, should be detected by nanograph, or rather, it should account for the observations of nanograph. And the black dot here, this is the value, the amplitude of the signal that was quoted by nanograph for a PL, uh, for a power law signal. It is not exactly valid for our signal because it is our signal is a broken power law. But this is an indicative uh, amplitude of what uh, the signal's uh, amplitude should look like. But uh, we are not just uh, happy with this. We want to see what are the ranges of parameters that would be allowed by nanograph uh, data for our model. So in order to do that, we fit the peak of our spectrum with this template for a broken Paolo signal. So here you have, uh, we have this quantities AB, which is the amplitude of the, the maximum amplitude of the signal. And we have the uh, frequency FB, which is the uh, point, which is the frequency where there's a break in the signal, the break in the power law. And these other sigma, epsilon, and mu, they actually uh, quantify the slopes of the power law on either side, uh, slopes of the signal on either side of the break. So what we do is we keep these slopes constant because the slopes are determined by the underground, uh, sorry, the background uh, dynamics. And we actually just vary these two parameters, a, b, and f, b. We do it using the publicly available code PTRK, and we use these priors. Uh, on the basis of this, we get these two uh, set of sets of best fit values. If we compare this against the values that we actually obtain by fitting it to our data, you can see that our values are actually within this best fit range. So what this means is that our, um, our scenario gives uh, rise to a gravitational wave signal, which is consistent with nanograph data. And this is, of course, the constraint plot for our uh, two parameters. And here we can see that uh, if you compare it with the previous values that I was saying, it lies within the 99% uh, credible region. So this is the gravitational wave part. Now I will just quickly discuss the dark energy scenario. So in our scenario, the scalar, the scalar that we were, uh, were working with the scalar tensor setup, it, can, it also has a potential, which is not very important in the early universe, because the, in the early universe, the potential is subdominant. But in the later universe, the potential can have uh, a lot of uh, effect. And we can see that by, uh, by this way. So we have, uh, there are uh, two comp components of this dark energy. One is early dark energy, which has been proposed recently to address the Hubble tension issue, which we already heard about in the, uh, in the first, second talk. And this can be driven by a scalar field, and we choose this form of the potential. Here I should mention that the first part of the potential is what actually drives the early dark energy. And the second part of the potential drives a phase of late dark energy. And uh, by a careful choice of parameters, uh, which is uh, done by uh, comparing the energy scales of the uh, universe at these two phases, during the early dark energy and late dark energy phases, uh, by, uh, by this choice of parameters, we can both drive a phase of early dark energy as well as late dark energy using the same potential. And uh, so this is what I'm showing here. This is the evolution of the scale factor. Uh, this is in the early period when there is a peak in the gravitational wave power spectrum. But this is what is important here. This is, shows the uh, oscillations in the scalar when it, um, uh, when it is oscillating at the bottom of the potential, the first part of the potential that we have here. This leads to the early dark energy part. Uh, but what is important to, uh, for us to see is the uh, uh, evolution of the energy densities. 
so in uh, blue and red, I have the radiation and matter energy densities, and in green, I have the uh, energy density due to the scalar. If you look at the later part of it, here we have a phase of early dark energy here, close to matter radiation equality. And then we are again, uh, okay, so this component has to decay faster than radiation after contributing a certain amount so that it doesn't affect the late evolution. But at later period, it again starts to act as dark energy and leads to a period of late dark energy domination, which can account for the current accelerated expansion of the universe without, uh, without adding any cosmological constant. So uh, yeah, so th in this way, this can account for uh, these three evolution periods. And so this is the summary of my talk. So with the same, uh, we can account for, um, we can have a gravitational wave signal as well as both an early dark energy and a phase of late dark energy domination. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Divika, a nice summary. Uh, okay, Rajiv first. No, we didn't. Uh, we, uh, uh, okay, so in this code, PT arcade, we can have two modes, one which computes the base factor and what, one which doesn't. But when we were, we had some issue running the part, uh, the mode which also computes the base factor. It, it was, um, what should I say, it was more of a, I don't know what exactly the issue was, but it was just wasn't running, so we needed a little bit of more time to do that, and we are in the process of doing that now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't really want to say anything without uh, doing it, yeah. So the way you design the early dark energy and then late dark energy and also the initial. Yeah. So how do we know that it is coming from the same potential or suppose I have a different physics, different because you have different parameter, no, V0 and D, V0, ED. So it can be like two different dark energy. Is there a prediction that this model over two different sets of non-connected dark energy. Okay, so, um, okay, then let me just show you the action. Maybe that will be easier. So I have an extra slide. So this is the action, where, where the action that we were using in this scenario. So this is the potential that we use. So this potential, we are putting it uh, to be uh, of this form from the very beginning. But, uh, uh, so, okay. But you are fine-tuning the energy scale. V yeah, zero, because uh, that we want it. this part to dominate yeah. due around matter energy, yeah, right, and this part to dominate much later. So it is actually very subdominant at early times, and it doesn't contribute anything. It only starts to contribute around the region where we want yeah, it to. I, I understood, yeah. but whether there is a prediction, uh, we can discuss maybe later. Okay. Okay, so no more questions. So let's move on. Uh, let's thank Devika, and we move on to the next speaker, Raghavendra. Firstly, I thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I will be discussing uh, uh, this uh, topic of a special class of inflationary models called ultra-slow roll inflation and the unique three predictions it uh, gives rise to. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will mainly be focusing on uh, describing the crucial characteristic features of the class of models called ultra-slow roll inflation and then quickly present the results, the observational imprints, the three predictions I mentioned at the title, the primordial black holes it gives rise to, the scalar-induced secondary gravitational waves, and dip in correlations. Just the results, but I will be happy to discuss any specific details offline in the interest of time here. Lastly, I will summarize and conclude with the possible outlooks. First, to set up, inflation is the paradigm that we all, all uh, roughly know, is the paradigm that solves the hot, you know, shortcomings of the hot Big Bang model, and uh, without inflation, what I have tried to depict here in this uh, uh, picture, inflation constitutes the ex expansion on the left-hand side of the co-moving Hubble radius, and this is the standard hot Big Bang evolution of the same. If not for the left-hand side, the co-moving scales corresponding to different observations over different range of scales, which I have just uh, briefly indicated with uh, typical probes, large-scale CMB, intermediate 21 centimeter, and small scales of secondary gravitation waves, all these scales would have started outside the causal uh, contact at some time around here, 
uh, without any naturally motivated initial conditions. Inflation comes to the rescue, which when dialed back sufficiently, last, uh, sufficiently farther back in the past, it uh, covers all these uh, observable scales well within the Hubble radius, and then we can impose naturally motivated initial conditions, which then translates to the corresponding observational inference that we can observe here today. When we try to drive or model this ep uh, epoch of inflation using a, uh, using a single canonical scalar field uh, dictated, uh, whose uh, dynamics is dictated by a potential such as V of phi, a smoothly, uh, uh, smoothly behaving uh, function, then the one-to-one -one correspondence between the scales and the time they exit the Hubble radius during inflation gain one more uh, step of connection in that they now correspond to different evolution, different periods of evolution of the field over the different regimes in the potential. So in some sense, different scales that we probe to today using observations then correspond to different periods uh, of the inflaton's evolution over the potential. This is just the cartoonish setup of uh, inflationary paradigm. To give a mathematical understanding of the same, the background is dictated by the scalar field evolution, the typical Klein-Gordon equation with a drag term dictated by the Hubble parameter, which captures the expansion. I would like to specifically focus on the slow roll parameters that I have, uh, uh, that I have shown here, epsilon 1 and higher order 1s. The epsilon 1, along with Friedman equation and its definition, can be expressed as something like a dimensionless kinetic energy of the inflaton field. I won't go much into the details of how this is obtained, but it is uh, intuitively uh, interesting to remember that this epsilon 1 captures the kinetic energy of the inflaton, and typical values in slow roll inflation is of order 10 power minus 2. But in the special class of ultra slow roll that I will be just discussing now, this can go to extremely small, exponentially small values, and that leads to some interesting effects. So as to the perturbations that evolve on top of this background evolution during inflation, I will mainly be focusing on these two uh, scalar and tensor power spectrum, basically two-point correlations of scalar perturbations and tensor perturbations in Fourier space, which in slow roll inflation can be neatly related to background quantities as such. The scalar power spectrum is just a ratio of Hubble parameter square by slow roll parameter. Recall that the uh, kinetic energy now sits in the denominator of this power spectrum, and tensor power spectrum is just proportional to h squared itself. With this quantity setup, I will now uh, focus on ultra slow roll class of models. What makes, it, uh, what makes it unique is that during the evolution of the inflaton field over a, such a smooth potential, it may occasionally suffer, due to the shape of the potential, a brief stagnation towards close, typically close towards the end of uh, its evolution. This leads to the exponential drop in the kinetic energy that I mentioned, and that leads to telltale signatures in the scalar and tensor power spectrum, which has been depicted here. This enhancement in the scalar power spectrum that you see has garnered much attention in recent, recent literature, particularly in the context of production of primordial black holes and uh, hence scalar-induced secondary gravitational waves. But it is not just uh, now that these models have been gaining attention. This has also been uh, discussed earlier in the CMB literature because this enhancement was then considered as a suppression with an overall rescaling of the scalar power spectrum. And when pushed back over large scales, this suppression can indeed fit the low uh, power, uh, power deficit over low per multiples of the CMB spectrum. So ultra slow roll models have been known in the literature for quite some time. And as I said, the defining feature is epsilon 1 dropping exponentially with respect to time. And this can be achieved by various features in the potential. The most common one, the prevalent one that is resorted to typically is the inflection point. But of course, if you have a break in the potential or an artificial bump or dip introduced by hand just for the sake of argument, you can achieve the same epoch of ultra slow roll. So, what we did recently is just a wild attempt to compile a possible list of uh, classes of models of uh, potential that, has, that are available in the literature in this uh, review that we put together and try to see if this defining feature of exponential drop in the first slow roll parameter is reproduced and we see that in all these different varieties of potentials, this characteristic uh, dip occurs. Of course, the exact uh, location and shape depends on the various choices of the model parameters. But this is very much a prominent feature in all ultra slow roll models. In fact, a defining feature. And higher order slow roll parameters reach to large values. And correspondingly, the perturbations when we compute numerically, they also, the scalar power spectrum leads to ex uh, exorbitantly large values in amplitude. And the tensor power spectrum correspondingly pl plotted in dashed line be, uh, exhibit uh, somewhat a different uh, signature as presented here. We also, since this, these models are messier to handle and are extremely fine-tuned in uh, choice of parameters, we also attempted something like a 
reconstruction of this epsilon 1 just for the sake of easier uh, analysis and comparison against various data. Epsilon 1 we tried to construct using uh, such a parametric construction in terms of e-folds and this of course is much uh, cleaner and easier to track. For instance, I can dictate by hand where I want the epoch of ultra slow roll to occur, occur based on the choice of n1 and the corresponding uh, spectra also neatly shows a shift in the occur occurrence of this enhancement in the corresponding color shades presented over here. So these are the two classes of uh, models, so to speak, reconstructions and the potential models, for which I will now uh, quickly go on to show the corresponding results, the observational results, what possible uh, predictions it can make. As I, first, as I mentioned, I will first focus on primordial black holes. These are basically large amplitudes of scalar perturbations re-entering the horizon during the radiation-dominated epoch, and because of their large amplitude of fluctuations, they can push the density perturbations, the over densities to exorbitantly high values which can instantly collapse into primordial black holes. I'm not discussing the mathematical details, but I will be happy to discuss offline. I'm showing the results here corresponding to models on the left hand side with various constraints on the parameter FPBH on top of this panel and the reconstructions, the corresponding predictions on the right hand side. FPBH is just the ratio of the uh, energy density corresponding to primordial black holes with respect to the uh, same of uh, dark matter today. Basically, the ratio of primordial black holes and how much they can form uh, dark matter today. So the models have difficulty in achieving something like 1 to 10 percent of FPBH, whereas reconstructions, of course, because of their ease of construction, can be easily varied to produ produce a wide spectrum of uh, FPBH over whatever uh, mass range that we wish, based on the onset of ultra slow roll in my inflationary epoch. And correspondingly, whenever scalar perturbations have been amplified to exorbitantly large values, the tensors corresponding to those frequencies will also get sourced at the second order of perturbation theory. And th these are what are called scalar-induced secondary gravitational waves. And the defining equation I have just indicated briefly here, in, in the absence of this uh, sourcing due to scalars, this will just be a homogeneous differential equation at the first order, primary gravitational wave. But because of this uh, sourcing term, now these the enhancement in scalar will also get reflected in the enhancement in tensors, and that is what I have plotted again for models on the left-hand side and potential models and reconstructions on the right-hand side with various uh, sensitivity curves, which also were briefly discussed in the, just in the previous talk. Once again, I have a ease of modeling with the reconstructions compared to the potentials, but once again, we see that there, are, uh, there is a nice capturing of the feature in the scalar, primordial scalar power spectrum in the spectral density of omega GW. But let, I will, I'll just pause at this moment where I can, uh, by, where I should say that ultra slow roll models are not the unique or only resort to, resorted to models in the literature to produce such enhanced uh, formation of primordial black holes or secondary gravitational waves because there are of course plethora of alternatives. The very uh, previous talk discussed one such and there are also other uh, scenarios like phase transitions, multi-field models, other uh, dynamic, uh, uh, dynamics that could have occurred during inflation which can, in principle, lead to FPBH like this and the corresponding omega GW. So with these two double predictions being degenerate with other models of inflation or other scenarios, what can be uniquely distinguishing ultra slow roll models with respect to them? Or what is the defining feature or defining prediction of ultra slow roll models? You may have already noticed from the spectra that I presented, whenever there was an enhancement in the scalar power in ultra slow roll, it was always preceded by a sharp dip or a sharp downward spike in the amplitude of scalar power spectrum. And that is what is defining with respect uh, for ultra slow roll model. And we wanted to capture that in observations as well. So we focused or zoomed in around the dip in the scalar power, which is something like a unique prediction of ultra slow roll. We chose these two representative models of ultra slow roll and uh, chose a parameter such that the dip occurred at this uh, wave number, 7.6 mega per sec inverse. And as this dip occurred in uh, this uh, range, we wanted to capture this in a corresponding probe. And the corresponding probe turned out to be a 21 centimeter uh, spectrum, the power spectrum of 21 centimeter signals. We computed the corresponding 21 centimeter spectrum for these two models, uh, for the first model on top, second model in the bottom. And we saw that at two redshifts of interest where, where we computed, redshift of 27 and 50 plotted in solid lines, the dip was much, uh, much pronounced compared to a typical nearly scale invariant spectrum that can arise from slow roll models. So this dip is a telltale signature from ultra slow roll that can be captured in a uh, probe that is sensitive to suppression in power. 
and that always occurs before enhancement in scalar power. So in principle, we have three unique predictions arising out of ultra slow roll, a dip prior to enhancement and enhancement leading to primordial black holes and secondary gravitational waves. So these are the three predictions I wanted to uh, mainly uh, uh, showcase about. And this is a uh, Fortran package that we developed to compute all these three unique predictions and also other related quantities, which I'm not discussing in this talk, primordial scalar bispectrum and associated parameters, which also have something interesting about them, but let's not uh, discuss that. So to summarize, ultra slow rule models are promising candidates in enhancing scalar power and lead to primordial black holes and secondary gravitational waves of significant strengths and uh, population but they also lead to nulling or dip in the correlations which is something unique and if we look for such a triple prediction through combinations of data sets it will be easier to verify or rule out ultra slow rule models so with that i thank you for your attention and will be happy to take questions thanks raghavendra nice talk okay we have many questions i'll take chetan first Okay. So uh, you, you said that, is there a statement about the, the epsilon 2 yes. or eta? So for instance, is, is these statements true also when epsilon 1 is very close to 0, but epsilon 2 is large? I think you made a, made a statement about it being large, right? Yes, it will be large because there is a sharp turn in epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 basically is a logarithmic derivative. Epsilon 2 reaches to very large values and typically it is set to minus 6 in the literature but realistic potentials can have values around minus six, like minus four to minus eight. Thank you. So I think in your first slide, you mentioned that epsilon one could be large. It's actually epsilon two, which goes large. Sorry, Here, the very last line. No, no, uh, inflation ends okay. when epsilon one reaches okay. to large values. Okay. That okay. is uh, this regime. Okay. Uh, here, when it reaches to large values, that is the end of inflation, okay. not during ultra. -slow. Okay. And the second one is not a question, but a comment, which sure. I think I have told you earlier. Sure. The plot that you are showing in one of your previous slides. Go, which one? Go back, please. Back, yes. This one. Yes. The bottom plot is originally not from this paper that you are quoting. You oh, should correct okay. yourself. This is from one of our papers from 2008 oh, to 2009. I okay, I will correct. Okay, and of course, Plavon is also one of the authors on that paper. I understand. Okay, yes. but the original plot that you are showing, this very plot, okay. it's called the punctuated inflation model. Yes, I know that. So paper. please we correct have... yourself sure. and cite the original reference sure. okay. where you are picking it up from. Okay, okay? I Thank have you. cited in my paper, but yeah. yes, I understand. Thank yes. you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so no more questions, so we are ready for tea time, right? Uh, if you have any comments. Uh, thanks, Rivan. So the coffee and tea is just downstairs, and people who are supposed to give talks in the next session, and if you have not uploaded your talks, please do it. <laughs> yeah. We'll be back at 11.30. OK, so we'll start with the next session now. Uh, so our first speaker is Nilman Raj talking about dark baryons in cosmology. Uh, I'll give you a warning at two minutes. Okay, OK, thanks. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here, and thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, so the point of my talk is to show that uh, cosmology is not, not just for cosmologists. Uh, it's super useful for hardcore particle physics as well, although I won't really have the time to talk about the hardcore particle physics part. Uh, and this picture is, well, I, I'll talk about this picture in a bit. Um, so this is how the talk would go. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what I mean by dark baryons or dark neutrons. Uh, where do they come from? Why should we care about them? Um, and, and, and in this talk, I'll have time to talk about just how these dark neutrons or dark baryons would reshape the early universe and give us a probe um, to constrain them. OK? There are also other very interesting signatures, uh, which I can talk about offline such as overheating neutron stars through what we call the OJ effect. Uh, and you could also shine neutrons through a wall because they could transform into dark neutrons as they pass through the wall. That's what I'm showing here. It's cricket season, so I, I had to show this slide. OK, so we'll be talking about, as I was mentioning, a new hypothetical particle. I'm going to label it chi. And I'm going to give it these properties. Uh, I'm going to uh, give it, I'm going to make it neutral under uh, all the fundamental forces. It's going to be electrically neutral in particular. I'm giving it a spin half. And more importantly, I'm giving it a baryon number of 1. Okay? 
Now, if I describe a particle this way, the disgruntled ghost of James Chadwick is going to come up and say, what I just mentioned, what I just described is the neutron, right? And of course, there could be other flavors as well, the delta baryon, the, the sigma baryon, and so on, right? And James Chadwick wouldn't be so wrong because this is a sort of a neutron, except it's not the standard neutron. We could call this a new hidden or dark neutron, okay? The difference being that while we know the mass of a neutron, uh, to, to very good precision, we have no idea what the mass of this hypothetical new neutron is, okay? And described this way, I can write, always write down a Hamiltonian like this, uh, where in the, in the diagonal uh, uh, elements, I write down the, uh, okay, the diagonal masses of, of the system, uh, but importantly, there's nothing that forbids me from writing uh, an off-diagonal mass for this two-state system, and if nothing, if, if, not, if, if it is not forbidden, it is compulsory in, part, in, in field theory, right? So I have to write down the term, and when I have a Hamiltonian like this, this gives rise to the phenomenon of quantum mixing between these two states, right? And of course, quantum mixing is nothing new. We've seen this uh, in many systems in nature. The photon mixes with the rho meson. The photon also mixes with the Z boson, so we don't see with just the photon. We also see, see through Z bosons and rho mesons. And famously, the neutrino flavors mix among each other, uh, which is how we know that neutrinos have mass, right? And, and the, the uh, real life consequences of mixing with uh, uh, dark neutrons for neutrons are neutron oscillations, which would give rise to things like these, neutrons be, being shown through walls. Um, it would also give rise to a transition dipole moment between the neutron and the photon. Basically, neutrons themselves interact with the photon uh, th th through a dipole moment, which is how we can control neutrons with magnetic uh, fields. But now instead of there being two neutrons in the interaction vertex, you have one neutron and a dark neutron and a photon, okay? By which you can have neutrons decaying to the dark neutrons by emitting a photon or vice versa. Okay, so um, why do we care about all this? To begin with, this dark neutron could very well be the dark matter of the universe. Okay, because there's a lot of parameter space where this dark neutron, this neutral particle, um, is, is long-lived enough uh, to form the dark matter of the universe. Okay, and dark matter, as we know, everybody in this room knows what it is, uh, the, the ubiquitous uh, substance uh, that, that makes up most of the mass of the universe and gives the, the, the universe its large-scale looks, right? Um, another reason you want to study these dark neutrons, and people have done this, uh, in, in, a, in great detail is it plays a ubiquitous role in models that try to address the primordial baryon asymmetry of the universe. Okay? Uh, this I'm not going to talk about much in this talk. For that matter, I'm not going to talk about the other particle physics motivation of dark neutrons as well, which is the neutron lifetime puzzle. Uh, we have very little uh, experimental idea of what really the, the lifetime of the neutron is. There are two different methods for measuring the lifetime of the neutron, and they have been historically discrepant uh, significantly discrepant for a, for a very long time, and today the discrepancy stands at around 4.5 sigma between these two methods. Um, and enter dark neutrons, people have uh, proposed dark neutrons as a solution, as a fix, as a band-aid uh, to fix this discrepancy. Okay? And, okay, this can, this, there was an excess in the xenon-110 experiment a couple of summers ago. It's now gone, but then dark neutrons could have explained those also. Okay. Um, so, so if you want to do cosmology with dark neutrons, let's count how many dark neutrons were there in the early universe, okay? Uh, and, and a couple of interesting cases that uh, we can think of is if the dark neutrons, the number density of dark neutrons was comparable to the number density of the actual baryons, right? In that case, the dark neutrons could make up a significant fraction of the dark matter, if not all the dark matter. Um, Another interesting case, which I may not have time to talk about, is if the dark neutrons, uh, the number density of dark neutrons was only around a percentage of the number density of the dark baryons. Maybe they were never in chemical equilibrium in the early universe, in which case also you still get, this could still be some relic of the early universe that could still leave interesting signatures in cosmological probes, right? Uh, okay, this is a, it's an equation heavy slide. Maybe I don't have time to go a lot into it, but basically you compare the number changing rate of the neutrons with the dark neutrons through this dipole operator, which was an inevitable consequence of having mixing, right? So you compare the number changing rate with the expansion rate of the universe, um, and then you do it in 
before the QCD transition and after the QCD transition to be consistent. And you find that for a very large range of parameters, which turn out to be the parameters of interest, um, the dark neutrons and neutrons were very probably in chemical equilibrium in the early universe, um, because the universe was probably hotter than about a GeV to PeV. Right? Probably the reheating temperature was higher than that. So that, as a consequence of that, you expect them to have been in chemical equilibrium and then the dark neutrons and the neutrons to have been uh, comparable in numbers. Okay? That would mean that this, this dark neutron could very well be the dark matter of the universe. Okay. Now where do you find dark neutrons in the context of cosmology? Um, so well, it turns out that wherever you have neutrons shaping the universe, there you can, they, that is a very good testing ground for dark neutrons as well. Um, and in particular, the twin pillars of Big Bang cosmology, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and the cosmic microwave background, both turn out to be super sensitive, super important probes of uh, dark neutrons. Okay? And let me show you how. Let's start with the primordial nucleosynthesis, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, epoch, uh, and let's see how, how it goes. Um, this network should be familiar. Just forget the dark neutron down here. This is the, the food chain, the, the reaction network that you need to build up uh, uh, heavy nucleides, right? Um, now, if you introduce a dark neutron into this bath, then if you are in a kinematic regime where the neutron is heavier than the dark neutron, so that the neutron decays to the dark neutron and emits a photon, um, then what happens is you've now opened up a new channel for the neutron, and that uh, affects the total decay rate of the neutron, and hence, which, which determines the, the rate of neutron proton interconversion in the first place. And that in turn determines the time at which freeze out happens. The neutron proton freeze out or freeze in happens, um, which as we famously know, the, the, that, the ratio of the neutron to proton number density at the time of freeze out is what ultimately determines the abundance of helium in the first place, right? Helium 4. And consequently, it also has a, a, has a say in the deuterium bottleneck and the abundance of deuterium, right? But now you've changed that with the introduction of this dark neutron channel. Um, and that would basically affect the, the ratio at, at freeze out, the ratio of neutrons to protons, and hence the timing of the signal. And what I'm showing here is uh, signals for a couple of benchmark points. I'm taking, this is the mixing parameter between the neutron and the dark neutron, the theta. Uh, and I'm taking a couple of uh, benchmark uh, points for the mass of the dark neutron with a difference uh, of mass of 0.1 and 1 MeV. Um, and as you can see, if the, the dashed one corresponds to a larger uh, value of the splitting, which is about an MeV. In that case, the, the, the timing is so much off that the helium abundance uh, is completely off the error bars uh, that we've measured. Okay? Uh, the deuterium turns out to be a little more sensitive, um, especially when you go for smaller mass splittings. That is a solid line. The reason why the deuterium is more sensitive than the helium in this case is that now the dark neutron mass is so close to the neutron mass that the inverse decay happens. Now, the, the, the dark neutron now uh, uh, interacts with the photon bath. There's so many more photons than the baryons, as we know, that the inverse decay happens, and then you populate the neutrons a lot more, and that affects the deuterium abundance. Okay? Either way, you mess up the abundances a lot, and that gives you a testing ground for uh, dark neutron interactions. Right? Uh, okay, this I'm not going to talk about. This is when you have the, the dark neutron heavier than the neutron, in which case it can spit out a photon, and the photon comes out energetically and hits on the nucleides that you've already formed in standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis and breaks the nucleides. Okay? That misses with abundances again, but uh, that, we are not, that we are skipping today. Another pillar that I mentioned, of course, is the cosmic microwave background. My favorite term for it is relic radiation. Um, so what happens to the relic radiation? Uh, now, there could be a mass range where, without changing anything in the Lagrangian that, uh, that we are showing, uh, the, the, uh, the dark neutron could decay uh, to a proton, electron, and neutrino. Okay? Because, again, this is just like beta decay. right? The neutron, could, the neutron does decay to this. In the correct kinematical range, the dark neutron could also decay to this, because the dark neutron is, after all, a, something that mixes with the neutron. Um, and then, similarly, if, if, the, if the dark neutron is heavier than the neutron, it can decay to the neutron and the photon. In, in, in any case, the electron or the photon that you get here dumps um, electromagnetic energy into the, uh, into the medium, right, which would basically rewrite the ion reionization history after the CMB book, thanks. Right? 
and in other and in that would basically uh, add give you extra distortion uh, in the CMB spectrum because you've not changed the optical depth to the last cataract surface, right? Um, so this formalism had been worked out in the context of dark matter by other authors. We, we made use of this. Um, and basically, you can now turn this into a, a limit on the rate of the dark neutron uh, decay to these channels. OK? Um, OK, let me skip this also. This is not quite cosmology. So let me just get to the punchline. Um, so the punchline I'm showing in this very busy plot where I have not really labeled the axis, but the x-axis is basically the mass of the dark neutron. The y-axis is the mixing parameter with, between the dark neutron and the neutron. And I would like you to remember that as you go down on the y-axis, uh, you are reducing the mixing parameter, and hence the, the dark neutron lives longer. Okay? Um, so what that means is anywhere on this plot, can you, you can probably see this little dot dashed line there. Um, Anywhere on this plot that is not in that little triangle up there, the dark neutron could be the dark matter of the universe. This is where the dark neutron lives longer than the age of the universe. Okay? Um, the other thing I want to highlight here is that uh, there are many constraints here, which I'm not going to talk about. A couple of them are this blue jagged line and the green line. These come from terrestrial experiments looking for dark neutrons in a direct way, okay? through the direct decays and so on. Okay. Now, th before we wrote this paper, these were the only constraints. But now, with the cosmology, with the, with the, with the very reasonable assumption that the dark neutron has uh, comparable number densities with the neutrons and the, and the protons, um, we find that the deuterium, this is the helium abundance constraint, that's the deuterium constraint, and that's the constraint from the CMB. Okay? So let's see that in a different plot. Um, what we are showing is that at this point, because of constraints from the CMB, there's only a very small window, 100 kV, thanks, uh, 100 kV window, uh, where um, the terrestrial experiments that make use of ultra cold neutrons could now target and still address the neutron lifetime puzzle that I mentioned before. Okay, that's one of the punchlines of our work. Um, you could play games with changing the number density and so on. Uh, Many cool things have come out of this, so I'll just put, it, put this up here, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Nimal. Uh, questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering, so what is the, so uh, is there a dark QCD? There could be. So this, the, the way I've described it, it's just an effective model that I said in the, in the, the hadronic level. It could be just an elementary particle that mixes with a neutron. It could also be a composite particle with a dark or mirror QCD. Sorry, can you explain how this? Some people have, yes. Some people have, but I, but we are not going there. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, yes. Sir. So this dark neutron uh, will decay to the ordinary neutron and have a photon line, right? Yes. So uh, do you, uh, where are the constraints from photon line searches? These are uh, on the MeV range. Yes, yes, yes. That's a that's a, actually a very good question uh, because that that was done right after our work was done, and those lines uh, come somewhere here actually. Okay. Zihui, no, Wang, and collaborators did that. You should be on the. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. That, sorry. Yes, right, yes, right, yes, yes. Right. Yeah, I'm not. Where is that plot? Anyways, yeah, fine, it's fine. Yeah, it, it, it's somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kaito okay. and Gamma. Exactly. Yes. yes. So, uh, I, yes. Uh, here. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, you showed a decay. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. showed one of the decay channel chi going to E P nu, right? Yeah. So if that happens, uh, does it mean that the neutrino freeze out uh, epoch will be affected? No. Um, the neutrino freeze out epoch. No, because um, this. The, the, okay, it will be, in a sense, all these processes actually ultimately do affect the neutrino freeze out epoch also. Because that, that first happens, and then the neutron proton, they, they both happen more or less at the same time. So both those epochs are affected, not by just, just this process, but by the fact that you have this extra channel that affects the entire um, weak interconversion rate already. It so turns out that the chi to E P gum uh, nu this actually affects it the least because there's a 
this comes with a mixing angle, and the mixing angle is around 10 power minus 10 or so. Uh, so uh, this dark neutron, yeah. um, neutrons play an important role in stellar, you know, all the stellar nuclear reactions. Yeah. And, you know, and there's even within neutron stars, you have the neutron drip process. Yes. So won't it affect all this? Isn't it like Pandora's box? Absolutely, it will affect all that. Yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was seriously the most exciting thing that we found in this paper. So that's these constraints down here. Oh. So what could happen is, I'll just very quickly tell you what could happen. So in neutron stars, um, the neutrons are all in a Fermi C, right? Because of this process, the neutrons would disappear. The neutrons would disappear to a dark neutron. So even if the dark neutron is heavier than the neutron, it could convert to a dark neutron. Basically, you form a hole in the C. When you form a hole, nature abhors holes. And the rest rush into form, fill the hole. When that happens, everything heats up. And the neutron star is heating up like crazy. And you can use neutron star temperatures to set constraints like these. So that's, that's the biggest effect that you see from this. So you'll be using observations of, say, neutron stars, you'll be able to put constraints. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we are at time okay. now. So next, next uh, rest questions can be taken offline. Uh, thanks, Nirmal. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Kirti Priya Satish, uh, talking about recent developments in Apsara experiment. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'll be talking on the recent developments for the Apsara cosmology experiment. And this work has been done uh, along with Dr. Mayuri, who's the PI for the experiment. So starting up um, first, along in the history of universe, uh, the timeline which is of interest for the Apsara experiment is the recombination epoch, during which the primordial plasma recombined into neutral hydrogen and helium atoms as the universe expanded and cooled after the uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So what is Apsara is, it's an acronym for Array of Precision Spectrometers for Epoch of Recombination. Uh, now before I explain what is the primary objective of the experiment, I would like to uh, say a few words about this uh, recombination ripples and what we are trying to detect first. Uh, so in the recombination epoch itself, uh, initially the helium recombination, it uh, started around the redshift of 5000 to 8000. Uh, during which the doubly ionized helium uh, recombined into a singly ionized helium. And this occurs in thermal equilibrium by Saha's recombination, so it's a faster process. But the singly ionized helium to a neutral helium as well as the hydrogen recombination, uh, they do not occur in thermal equilibrium. And it, we have to consider a model where the electron trickles down to the ground state uh, through multiple higher energy levels. So the plot here, it is a, uh, it, it's showing the photons which were emitted during this recombination epoch, they appear as additive spectral distortions in the CMB spectrum. Now this plot is taken from a, a prediction by tool called Cosmospec, uh, which is referred here. So this uh, algorithm, it considers 500 shells in hydrogen and helium atoms and considers the energy transitions of the electron through all these levels. And it also considers the inter-element photon feedback effects as well. So if you see in this plot, uh, the, he, there, there are a few prominent uh, lines here which are coming from this helium um, transition from a singly ionized to a neutral helium which causes few absorption features which are very prominently uh, uh, seen. So if you see the total distortion line here, the black line here, it is the combined effect of helium plus hydrogen uh, where you can easily distinguish this helium absorption features from the hydrogen uh, features. Therefore, detection of these kinds of ripples will uh, help in understanding the pre-stellar helium abundance. Uh, and also, uh, detection of these ripples itself will be a, a experimental evidence for the recombination physics. And we can also understand other cosmological parameters like the baryon density and CMB monopole temperature itself. Now, coming to the main objective of our experiment, um, we are trying to detect these recombination ripples uh, in the frequency range of 2 to 6 gigahertz. Uh, why 2 to 6 gigahertz? Because um, there is a feasibility study which has been conducted, uh, it is referred in this paper here, uh, where the, it has been identified that the signal to noise ratio will be high if we try to do the detection in this band, provided we are 
Ours is a ground based radiometer experiment. Uh, so, there are other experiments which are trying to do this detection, uh, but in the frequencies which are greater than 10 gigahertz, and mostly there are space based experiments like Pixie, Super Pixie, they have been proposed. Uh, our experiment is a ground based radiometer experiment, and we are trying to do this detection in this 2 to 6 gigahertz range. So, if we just take the 1 to 7 gigahertz band of interest and see how is the amplitude of the spectral distortions which we are trying to detect. It has an amplitude in the level of nano Kelvin, which means we are trying to detect a signal which is 9 orders of magnitude at least weaker than our foregrounds when we do ground based experiments. So, it comes with lot of challenges therefore. Um, so, there are a lot of challenges associated with the experiment uh, building, um, sorry, the development of radiometers as such um, because so far um, the main challenges are the antenna response itself. So, the antenna when it sees the sky, the field of view of the antenna, it should remain stable across frequency. So, any change in the field of view of the antenna, it will uh, come into our final spectrum as systematic and it will be difficult to do this foreground separation and the signal separation. Uh, so, the antenna design is a, a primary challenge. Uh, following that, there are other challenges with the system calibrations also because now we, are, we have to have a system where the after calibration, the sensitivity should be at least 9 orders of magnitude. Uh, so, therefore, the calibration procedures are difficult. Then uh, the other important thing is the radio frequency interference because we are doing this in as a ground based experiment. Now, our frequency range of interest is 2 to 6 gigahertz and uh, the, all the mobile communication signals today right from the 2G, 3G, 4G, today 5G has come, they all fall just within this band. So, we have to identify a location where this RFI is at minimal so that we can later during the post processing we can remove it or flag it. So, the RFI itself identification of these uh, remote locations is another challenge. So, our ultimate goal of Apsara experiment has been proposed to have an array of 128 mini telescopes with cooled receivers observing the sky for nearly 255 days and it will have a signal uh, detection with 90 percent confidence and we, if we observe for more days we can increase this confidence. Um, but this is uh, in the uh, you know long road uh, goal, but then the current design objectives what are we have targeted uh, because this is in a very nascent stage, we have just started building our, our radiometer. So, the current goal is to have a single radiometer receiver chain, develop the calibration strategies for that and then go on to develop into an array configuration. So, so, I have highlighted two points here uh, because among for this primary objective, we have currently tackled two of these challenges. Uh, so, I will be showing some of the results and developments which has happened in the recent past six months. So, the first challenge what you have addressed is the RFI interference. So, what we have made, done is we have developed our own RFI survey system for operating from 500 megahertz to 7 gigahertz and we have deployed it across four different locations in India. Uh, first, we started with Bangalore, uh, just RRI and then uh, we went to Gauri Bidunur Observatory. And then from there, uh, we did not get the required RFI free zone for certain frequencies. So, we went on to uh, a more remote location, IAO Handley Observatory. And from there, we also went to a location which is little more remote, 30 kilometers from Handley called Tamsungiri. So, this is a basic overview of our system. We have an antenna which is a commercial antenna and we connect it to our receiver electronics. So, the Im this is the image of our receiver electronics. It is a very compact receiver and it is a very portable and deployable one which we have made it entirely powered by battery. So, the antenna connects to this receiver and the output from this receiver goes to an instrument called spectrum analyzer which is then controlled by laptop through ethernet cable. Now, what we have done here is all our electronics, we house it inside a shielding cage. So, these are some of the images from our deployments in Gauri Bidunur as well as Hanley uh, observatories. So, what we have done is in all the cases, we have enclosed our electronics inside a shielding cage. Why a shielding cage? Because we do not want our own self-generated RFI from getting picked up the, by the antenna. So, we have enclosed everything inside a shielding cage and we do this measurement. And in each location, we were able to observe uh, during the day, night with antenna in different positions for uh, time duration of 3 hours in each, uh, e e each measurement. Why 3 hours? Because we were currently limited by the battery capacity of our instruments. Uh, so, therefore, we were able to observe for 3 hours and we have some future uh, developments planned for this also. So, these are some of the recent results in the past 6 months results, current RFA situation in this band across these 4 locations. So, this is a waterfall plot, uh, the x axis is the frequency, y axis is the observation time. 
and the lines which you see here prominently are the RFI power levels basically. So RRI uh, Bangalore uh, as expected we have a lot of mobile signals here so you do expect the RFI here um, and these other plots here show the median of the observed data. So as uh, it, this plot all these mobile signals are there uh, which are completely interspersed through the band making any kind of observation here you know uh, not possible. So the other cases of Gauri Bidhanu, Hanle and Tamchungiri if you see. So the Tamchungiri location has the best case scenario we can say because we were free from all the mobile signals there. Uh, but we were able to pick up as expected some satellite signals. Uh, but these satellite signals are low power signals and they are mostly geostationary which we think we can flag later in our post processing stages as well. Um, and if we see the Gauri Bidhanu and the Hanley Observatory, no, typically we will uh, like to have these experiments in a location where logistics are easy for us. So we prefer somewhere near to the observatories. When we see in that case, uh, in the Hanley Observatory, we were able to pick up one prominent mobile signal, uh, whereas the rest of the band, it was mostly uh, with just the satellite signals. And Gauri Bidhanu, the good thing is so far 5G has not yet ventured there. So we still have a free band from 2.6 to 6 gigahertz. So we, we, our idea is that finally we'll, uh, for initial prototype development testing, we'll use Gauri Bidhanu at least for 2.6 to 6 gigahertz band and the best case scenarios of Hanle and Tamchungiri for the later stages. Now there are some future works from this RFA setup also, uh, which I'll explain the future work slide later. So this is the first uh, uh, set of development or uh, the RFA challenge which you have tackled. The next is the antenna design now. So why antenna design is important as I told earlier, uh, if you see in this equation, the antenna's gain or the radiation pattern or the field of view, whatever you can say in your terms, that gets coupled with the uh, sky. Now when it, it a part of the antenna's uh, gain, it couples with the sky and part of it also couples with the soil beneath it. So therefore the final temperature what we see from this coupling, uh, the overall temperature that will have effect of soil as well as sky as well as the radiation patterns chromaticity effects. So what will happen if, if my pattern, I have a 2 to 6 gigahertz band which is more than an octave bandwidth. So across this band it's very difficult to design any antenna which has similar response across, it's a very difficult engineering challenge. Um, but you have tried tackling it uh, to a certain extent uh, because any kind of this dispersion effects in the radiation pattern, it will uh, come into our final spectrum. So some preliminary de design guidelines we have made up for the antenna. One is that again the beam should be achromatic. The next thing is after this beam coupling, there is also the coupling of the transfer function of the antenna. Now transfer function of the antenna means how the antenna's impedance is matched with the next stage of the receiver. And if there are any impedance mismatches, it will create some standing waves in the cables, whatever we connect. And that will also occur as systematics in our uh, final uh, temperature. So the antenna's transfer function should be smooth um, and meaning it shouldn't have any ripples inside it or any kind of uh, resonances in the band. The other thing is our foreground sky is polarized but the recombination signal which we are trying to detect is unpolarized. So we have gone for a dual polarized antenna design in order to just increase the efficiency of detection. The other thing is since our final goal is to have 128 radiometers, we want an antenna which is easily scalable also. So taking all these design guidelines into consideration, we have made uh, an antenna and we have also made measurements of the pattern and all these transfer functions. So this is our antenna, it's a very small antenna, the size is uh, around 14 centimeters square um, for the substrate and this is a dual, dual pole antenna and how we feed the antenna is by using these substrates. These substrates carry something called as a ballon uh, and these substrates can fit like a jigsaw puzzle here and this entire part gets inserted into this antenna substrate for feeding. Now this is the antenna which we have developed and this is, these are some of the images from our testing. Now coming to the results from these antenna, so there are a lot of plots here but I want you to focus mainly on this plot here which is the radiation pattern, uh, measured radiation pattern in fact. So I am saying this pattern is achromatic, we need achromatic antenna and this can be seen here. So across this 2.5 to 4 gigahertz, these two I have marked as a E plane and H plane which is just like I take a 3D pattern of antenna and I have plotted two orthogonal cuts from that. And you can see that it is relatively achromatic. Uh, if you want to put a number to it, you can see this scatter plot which shows that the uh, variation in this peak gain and the beam width variation of the antenna is of the order of 0.83% and 1.5% uh, 
which is like according to our knowledge is best in literature for these non standard antennas in cosmology. So, how do we validate our antenna then is we have our own pipeline for doing this where we model the sky, we add the recombination signal and the CMB temperature to it and then we multiply that with the antenna's gain as well as the antenna's transfer function. The final spectrum what we get here, we fit it with a function called maximally smooth function because our current approach to do this foreground separation is by considering the foreground to be smooth. Uh, so, we model the spectrum by using a maximally smooth function and the residual of the fitting uh, we, uh, that is how we validate our antenna. So, this is one plot which shows uh, how our pipeline works. So, here we have taken an ideal antenna like uh, having a sin square theta beam meaning, meaning it is perfectly achromatic and uh, when we use it in our pipeline we can see that uh, it the if the recombination signal is present we are able to detect that signal at the end of pipeline. If there was no recombination signal this is a null hypothesis case. So, this is how our va uh, validation pipeline works. With this we validated our antenna. Now, I want to focus just in these two plots. We have validated our antenna the measured patterns itself. Uh, so, we are getting a residue around the order of 31 milli Kelvin and we knew there are some points which can be improved in the antenna and we tried it in simulation aspects uh, and with the same antenna we were able to achieve a residual of 0.4 milli Kelvin which is 10 power minus 4 level of uh, sensitivity let us say. So, we understand that with this antenna itself if we have a receiver with a calibration sensitivity of 1 part in 10 to the power of 4 then it, we can use it for absolute sky temperature measurements to verify the recent excess radio background reported in RK2 measurements and the ultimate goal is to have like a sensitivity level of 10 power minus 9 so that we can do the recombination ripple detection. Um, so, there are some future works uh, related to this. So, one is apart from the smooth functions we are also exploring other techniques uh, for this foreground separation because 10 power minus 9 sensitivity is really difficult to achieve in antenna design also. So, we are exploring other alternate uh, techniques for antenna improvement and for the RFI measurements also even in the remote sites we want to go with the cooled receivers and evaluate the site for the low level RFI as well. Uh, then we are working on the calibration strategies also and the cooled receiver electronics development are also ongoing for these experiments. So, with this I will like to conclude. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Yeah, so you said uh, the foreground you have taken it to be smooth, but smooth can mean many things. Right? It can be constant or it can be linear. So, what is the nature that you took? Uh, so far we have just modeled our sky in the pipeline by using this uh, uh, power law kind of form okay. uh, where we have just taken the spectral index uh, basically is modeled from three sky maps uh, that is our current model. We have just taken it as a power law. Power law in frequency right? Yes. So, smooth means in frequency yes. phase. Yes. Oh, okay. Not specially. Yes. Okay. Last question. Yes. A priori, if the if you immerse your antenna in a blackboard in in a com uniform sky, then the beam patterns variation with frequency should be unimportant. So the smooth the ripples in the response really would be important when you have a an isotropic sky, like sources, because they will ring with a different. View. So, how anisotropic is the sky in this region? I don't, I don't have a number for it, so. Um, bright point sources are not important, are very important, but the gradual change in the spectral index across the sky matters more, and that's what we are picking up. So, um, I think uh, our uh, kind of connecting to Prava's question, it is a power law, but the power law spectral index is uh, varies as a function of spatial um, position. So, that is what shows up in our final fitting. Uh, we have done some simulations where we do eliminate soil or earth and we immerse the antenna like you say entirely in sky and that is what she said the residual is at 0.4 milli Kelvin or so. So, we it is an order of magnitude import, uh, improvement, uh, but we do not assume the sky is uh, spectrally flat 3 uh, 4 pi. Uh, thanks, Girti. Um, and we'll go to the next talk now. Uh, so the next is uh, Brijesh Kanodia talking about the faint light of old neutron stars and its uh, related.
detectability. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to our organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. So this is slightly older work, uh, which is done in collaboration with uh, Shivili, Lagveer, Rajiv, Nanda, and Sudhir. So what I'll be talking about is like a uh, faint light coming from the old neutron star. By old neutron star, I mean these are like giga year old neutron star whose rotation and thermal energy have died out. And they are like non-spinning as well. And what I will talk about is that, how can we detect this old neutron star do we have a detectability prospect through JWST? Okay, so let's go about it. So first I will uh, give a brief motivation that uh, why this neutron star can act as a probe for dark matter. Then I will talk about like uh, how the dark matter particles can get trapped inside this old neutron star which can eventually rise its temperature and the temperature as will be sufficient enough that it will fall in the infrared regime so that we can observe it through JWST. Later I will talk about like what are the various dark matter and neutron star parameters that you can tune to get an uncertainty band on this uh, temperature? So let's go. So we already know that a lot of talks have been already talked about that we do, do know that there is an existence for the dark matter and there is a wide range for the dark matter that we know. And we know that there is around 27% of the dark matter that exists in our universe. So there is, have been already various hunt to find the possible candidates for the dark matter. So here what we are doing is that we are particularly interested in the neutron star. So these neutron star are basically going to act as a laboratory for the dark matter particles. So we are saying that uh, these neutron star are present inside a dark matter halo and the dark matter particles can be get trapped inside the neutron star by losing its kinetic energy. So neutron star will also have some velocity. Dark matter is also having some velocity. The th point is that if the dark matter particle loses, loses enough energy and become less than the escape velocity of the neutron star, then these particles get, get, get trapped, right? So because of this trapping, we are saying the temperature of the neutron star will be raised and we are trying to have a detectability prospect. Similarly, uh, we, we also, uh, as I said before, we are trying to gain an uncertainty band. Like if you vary all the tunables which are present for the dark matter as well as for the neutron star, can you get a range of temperature by like a wide range of temperature in which uh, the rise in the temperature of the neutron star can be observed? Okay, so let's start with this. So as we already know that uh, neutron star are a very compact object. Uh, their mass is roughly around the solar mass and their uh, radius is roughly around 10 kilometers. And we are particularly interested in the neutron star which are much older as I said initially, like giga years old neutron star. And their thermal energy have died out and their uh, temperature is roughly around 100 Kelvin. Okay, so this is a semantic diagram you can think of. So suppose this is a dark matter halo and the neutron star are lying inside it. So what happens is that, uh, as I said, this, the dark matter particles can fall towards this neutron star and you can have a capture, okay? So the, if the dark matter particle is thermalized, the temperature rise will be even more because once the particles get captured, it can annihilate and it can even rise the temperature more. So what we are trying to do is that, we are trying to say that, suppose what if all the dark matter particles which are coming towards the neutron star gets captured, what could be the maximum rise in the temperature, okay? So we'll see the math behind it and then I'll show the resultant plots. Okay, so suppose this is the scenario. So neutron star is suppose moving with a velocity V star. Dark matter particles are coming towards it with a velocity VD, right? And these dark matter particles are suppose getting trapped at the first scatter only on the surface. So I'm not talking about the dark matter particles getting trapped inside the neutron star. I'm saying if they are falling and in an idealistic scenario, if all the dark matter particles are getting trapped in the first scatter, what are the various uncertainties that could come and what will be the maximum temperature rise that we can get. So here, the uncertainty could arise from like equation of state, which is the neutron star mass and radius, which will eventually give you the escape velocity. Then there could be uncertainty coming from the dark matter density, dark matter dispersion velocity, neutron star velocity, and all this thing will ultimately go in computing the capture rate. And once you have the capture rate, from there you can compute the temperature and ultimately we will have the probe in JWST. Okay. So here I have defined what is called the geometric capture rate. By geometric, I mean uh, what is the maximum capture rate that can happen. I mean, what if all the dark matter particles which are coming is getting trapped. So as you can see, this geometric capture rate actually depends upon the dark matter density, the escape velocity, the neutron star and dark matter 
velocity. So the, from this capture it, you can actually calculate the two temperatures. So as I discussed that if the dark matter particle just get trapped on the surface of the neutron star, then it is the kinetic temperature that you will get. But if the dark matter particle is thermalized, there could be annihilation also that can happen and it will give given rise to even more temperature. So for a dark matter density of 0.42 and the neutron star velocity of 220 kilometer per second and dark matter velocity of 270, you can get a kinetic, kinetic temperature of around 1800 Kelvin. But then if you have a thermalized thing, you can get up to 2500 Kelvin. So we are trying to explore the maximal case scenario. So we will be interested in this scenario and we will plot the distribution curves corresponding to this. Okay. So these are the inputs that are going. So dark matter parameters are uh, dark matter density, uh, which is ranging in this re regime, 0.39 to 0.52 GV per centimeter cube. Then we have a dark matter dispersion velocity, which is going from 214 to 258 kilometer per second. And so these are the dark matter inputs. Now we have the neutron star parameters. So the neutron star parameter could be equation of state. So this equation of state correspond to different uh, simulation points, which is like BSK models and different models. And this shaded regimes, uh, non, I mean non-black shaded regime, this is different, yellow, white, these are the favorable from different things, like from pulsars and other, other things, okay? And the left plot basically shows you that uh, the probability distribution for the only, uh, probability distribution for the velocity for the neutron star. Okay, so these are the tunables that will go for the neutron star, and in the last slide, I show the tunables that can go for the dark matter. So if you feed all these tunables, then what, what is the temperature range that you can get on the uh, spectral energy distribution curve, is uh, what I will show. Okay, so these are the results. So as you can see, if you are uh, fixing your neutron star to be supposed at a distance of 10 parsec, and you are trying to get a spectral energy distribution curve. So as, we, as, you, as I discussed, we actually computed the capture rate, from the capture, we computed the temperature. So once you have the temperature and you fix the distance, you can actually calculate this SED plots, right? So forget about this uh, black thick line for the while. Uh, let's just talk about these three. So as we figured out the maximum temperature rise we can get is around 2500 Kelvin. And this figure actually gives us the two information. So first is that you are getting the, what is the maximum temperature rise, as well as you're also getting the information about what filters of JWST will be important. So these are the near cam filters. By near cam, I mean near infrared camera, okay? So as you see, this, this is peaking roughly in the, this regime, which is F150 W2 filter, okay? So this basically shows that this filter of JWST will be important to uh, uh, pluck out this temperature scenario. And we feed this SED curve into the, uh, there is something called JWST exposure time calculator. So you feed the SED into that based on the different uh, uh, background and filters. So we, we choose a corresponding survey, suppose deep eight survey, some dithas, and some background you choose. On basis of that, you can feed your SED and you can get a SNR plots, okay? And so I forgot to talk about the black line. So black line is corresponding to a, a minimal cooling paradigm. So this is corresponding to the neutron star which are mega years old. So this is corresponding to like a 15 mega years old neutron star. And the temperature is roughly around 3500 Kelvin for this. And this actually comes in the late, late evolutionary stage of the neutron star. I mean, so if you uh, draw the neutron star cooling curve, you will have th those scenarios where you will have this uh, thing. And where you can say that, uh, like these are the neutron star which, who, who are thermally died out and they are non-spinning and non-rotating. So from there, you can even put a constraint on this. So here we actually see that uh, for these neutron star, we are getting a signal to noise ratio of 10 within 24 hours, okay. And this is corresponding to the same filter which we, which we have it here, which is F150 W2. Now, uh, these are the different other plots uh, which is corresponding to the other filters, okay? And you can see we can get an SNR of five as well. So basically this SNR will be much important because uh, like this is giving the best SNR for this scenario, okay? Now, this further plot is basically uh, like combining these two plots together. So again, for the neutron star at 10 parsec, uh, we are plotting the temperature, which is the, so here I'm only discussing about the kinetic plus annihilation case because we are interested in the more temperature, right? So as you can see, the temperature is actually varying from uh, roughly around 1600, it's going up to 2500 Kelvin, right? So this is the temperature variation. And since we have chosen, a, we know the particular interest of the filter that we are interested in. Now, these are the different quantums. So the different quantums tell you the SNR values. So this contour will basically tell you that if you have a signal to noise ratio of 10 and above, you can probe this range of temperature for this mass of the neutron star, and this can be achieved within 24 hours. 
Similarly, for this dashed contour, you can say you can achieve an SNR of 5 and above for this mass range of neutron star and this temperature within 6 hours or 5 hours roughly. Okay. And this different line correspond to the uh, temperature scenario, which is max, mid, and min, which is uh, a feed which is goes in the JWST calculator. So actually, uh, I'll conclude in a way. So, so we actually had two results. So first is that we concluded that you can actually calculate the temperature rise in the neutron star. And we observed that this temperature rise will be, uh, we can achieve an SNR of 10 within 24 hours of exposure time through 152W filter. Again, we also figured that if we include the various tunables of dark matter and neutron star, uh, we can actually get an uncertainty band. And we can get the uh, total variation in the temperature, which is roughly around 40%. So this was an idealist, idealistic scenario where we assumed that whatever dark matter particles are falling, they are getting trapped. But uh, we can assume a more realistic scenario, and we can say that it won't get trapped in one scatter. It can get trapped in multiple scatter. So we are extending this analysis. And we are saying that if the dark matter particle is falling, it is not getting trapped at one scatter. It can get trapped at multiple scatter, as well as what if the dark, dark matter particle is trapping inside. So we even include multiple scatter with optical depth. So it is not happening just at the surface. You can say it is happening even inside the neutron star. For that, you can assume a particular profile, and then you can calculate how you can uh, basically calculate the capture rate and eventually the temperature. So I'm done. Thank you. Time for questions. I have a very naive question. So in your, one of your early pictures, you, it looked like the neutron star was sitting in the halo. Is that? Uh, yeah, dark matter halo. Is that, is that, does it happen? I mean, it's just my very basic question. Yeah, it does happen. OK. So uh, neutron and star exists also in the halos, is it? It's not just in the disk of the galaxy. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, he's just taking the standard halo disk. It can be much higher, it can be much lower, but he's taking the local halo density. So, yeah, so 10 parsec is in the. Uh, yeah, but I'm saying that there are neutron stars in the halo. That's my question. Oh, oh, no. Oh, off the disk. Off the disk. No, 10 parsec is nothing. That's his question. No, I don't know. He's no, but in his picture. Is it, no, that picture is not like. Uh, not scalable, I mean. Oh, that picture. Ah, okay. That picture. Okay. 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 It's just to yeah. show that, uh, yeah, yes. that they are neutron stars and okay. they're covered by. Yes. yes. So how would you distinguish if suppose you saw one such thing in within ten parsecs, how would you distinguish it from I don't know I don't know, like some very cold white dwarfs or some planets that giant planets that formed and are losing their heat of formation? So for so Right now, you won't directly point your telescope through neutron star. So firstly, you have to do a large sky survey. Yeah, okay, you will uh, find some point source. I'm yeah. just curious, how would you know that it's a neutron star? I mean, um, so there are certain things. First is that you have this temperature range, right? This will be specific, I guess. And um, it follows in the, uh, you are saying the other, there, there could be other infrared regimes which can No, but the, the, this won't come in pulsars. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Mashim. So why only capture by neutron star? What about like no, no, say giant can, planets or yeah, yeah. stars? You can extend this analysis to white dwarf exoplanet. Anything yeah, like pe that? people have done those works. Okay. We were particularly interested in like old neutron star and like getting a probe through JWST. So, so we were trying to figure out that if we get a temperature range, that can be actually go in the infrared regime of JWST. And we were trying to get uh, more information that how you work with exposure time calculator of JWST, like how you tune those parameters mm -hmm. and how you can actually. So, if you have an observation of some temperature, you have LCD. How can you work with JWST exposure time calculator to get the SNRs? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right. I'll just make a remark uh, to your question, is that these neutron stars are old and cold. 
okay? So they are otherwise undetectable. There's no way to detect them directly because they're also not pulsers, okay? But by this mechanism, they can now fall into the infrared band of the JWST. So this is a mechanism by which these uh, old and cold neutron stars could possibly be detected. That's the idea. But of course, the same mechanism would uh, happen to all or any object, whether compact or not, it would happen. Yeah, the kin kinematics will basically remain yeah. same. Yeah, yeah, please. Pulse are pulse and things like that, but suppose the pulse is not detectable or something, some some crazy thing. Then I think for brown dwarf you have to somehow get into the size. I don't know that. I think he knows it better than me. Nirmal knows it better than me. If I, if you can somehow get the size of the object, I think planet will not be a problem. Yeah. Very few. No. no what? Sorry. I, what? I, for exoplanets there, yeah. But. Freely footing, yeah, I know free, freely footing, friend, but they're probably, one can calculate the probability, yes, I know, in some sense, if yeah, there is yeah, a detection, one has to do this right, quantitative, right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But I think maybe if some, somehow one can get the size of the object, so I don't know, JWST can do it, or some, somebody can so do it. Some okay, instrument. size information actually means so that will Actually, uh, we can take this offline in interest okay. of time okay. and uh, uh, go to the next talk. So thanks, Prajesh, for the next talk. Uh, the next talk is by Shairi Ansar, the Stellar Bar Dark Matter Halo Connection, mm -hmm. Cosmological Simulations. Thank you for having me here. I am Shayuri, and I'm a PhD student at Indian Institute of Astrophysics. I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. So today I'm going to talk about stellar bar dark matter halo connection in cosmological simulations. So there are uh, large scale uh, cosmological simulations. For example, here I'm showing uh, one of the current cosmological simulations, the illustrious CNG simulations. So these are uh, large boxes of uh, 300 megaparsec or 100 or 50 megaparsec size uh, of the uh, length scale of, of, uh, of each of the side of these boxes. And they have thousands of galaxies and uh, different other components like uh, dark matter, gas in them. So I want to study uh, if there are any connection between the disk of these galaxies and the dark matter halo component that is surrounding the galaxies. So for example, here I'm showing a very cartoon diagram of a dark matter halo, which is for the simplest case I'm taking to it spher spherical. But uh, there in the center, uh, there is the baryonic disk, which consists of a, of a disk galaxy. And there is a bulge or a bar. So I'm going to talk about how the disk properties are connected with dark matter halo properties. And, uh, and I'm going to answer this question. Can we connect dark matter halo properties with the disk properties or not? So for that, uh, the takeaway from this presentation will be that uh, dark matter halo properties affect the disk properties. And particularly, I will be trying to convince you that bar properties are connected to dark matter halo properties. So now, what is a stellar bar in a galaxy? Sorry, so first of all, let me uh, explain what kind of properties are, are we talking about. So we, we know that there are dark matter halos and the galaxies are sitting at the center of these halos. And we would like to know what kind of halo potential are there uh, for these uh, galaxies. So that means that what kind of uh, parameters, like what kind of concentration is there in the mass in the central regions of these galaxies, and also uh, what kind of velocities are there in the, of the dark matter particles in observations. 
we would also like to know what kind of angular momentum these uh, dark matter halos have. And for that, uh, previous works have described uh, a quantity called the halo spin, which is proportional to the angular momentum of the dark matter halo, which is uh, denoted as J here. And it can be estimated very uh, easily from cosmological simulations and people have done that, but we cannot measure it directly from observational studies. So we would like to do that, but we have a lot of work to do before that. So now, yeah, so what is a bar? So this is a barred galaxy where you can see the stellar component at the very central region. It is an elongated structure. We, this is a uh, basically a global disk instability that arises in disk galaxies, uh, which are mainly cold, uh, cold, kinematically cold, and they can also arise due to galaxy encounters. That is, satellite galaxy encountering, enter, encountering with uh, bigger galaxies. So these have uh, uh, these range from uh, about 100 parsec to several kiloparsecs in length. So they are very large in size. And why is this important for this talk? This is because the bar is seen to interact with the dark matter halo. So the uh, bar transfers angular momentum from the disk to the dark matter halo, and it enhances the angular momentum of the dark matter halo. And this has been studied previously in different in-body simulation. Uh, and we also know that uh, the number of bars in our current uh, local group of galaxies and also at the high redshift universe is not, it is not constant. So we see that uh, here is a plot of bar fraction, which means that the fraction of galaxies containing a bar. So this is plotted with redshift and we see that in different observational studies, people have seen the bar fraction decreases with as we go to higher redshift. So we want to understand what kind of dynamics is happening, and that can also help us study the nature of dark matter. So again, uh, what I will do particularly in, in this talk, I will explain how the bar properties can be evaluated. For example, here is the bar strength, which is basically the maximum amplitude of the M equal to two Fourier decomposition of the face on surface density of these galaxies. So in simple terms, what is done is that we can uh, take annular regions and we can estimate this quantity. Wherever there is a bar, there will be a high signal. And wherever there is, uh, there is no bar or no asymmetry, there will be no signal. So uh, one thing we uh, want to understand is that how the bar grows in, in, in simulations. And that also accompanies with the uh, increase of angular momentum of, of the galaxies or the dark matter halo particularly uh, in these simulations. So we want to connect what kind of uh, bars are there in different uh, galaxies and how the angular momentum of different uh, galaxy dark matter halos are, uh, are, is it related to bar properties or not? So for that, I use uh, the, uh, the state-of-the-art uh, cosmological simulation TNG-50. So here are samples of galaxies from TNG-50, barred and unbarred galaxies. So here, here is an example of uh, sample 1, which is at redshift 0. Sample 2 is at redshift 0.1. And sample 3 is at redshift 1. And the red color indicates the barred galaxies, which is, uh, which is denoted by the barred strength, as I described earlier. And the blue dots represent the galaxies which are unbarred, which does not contain a barred structure. So th the first thing that we did is that if there is any difference between barred and unbarred galaxies in terms of uh, the angular momentum of the dark matter halo. So for that, we need to make a sample of galaxies uh, such that they have similar properties of the dark matter halo in terms of the mass. So for that, we uh, use uh, rotation curves of galaxies. So these are basically the circular velocity curves and that, uh, that constitutes the, uh, or that uh, captures the total mass of the, of, the, of, uh, of total mass, let's say, uh, uh, a particular rotation curve, let, let's, uh, let us consider, then it will uh, tell about what, what is the total amount of mass contained within a radius at, at this particular uh, point. 
So if we can uh, make a sample of galaxies which has similar kind of mass in terms of dark matter uh, mass, and then we can uh, uh, we can do that for different. Uh, bar strength bins or bar strength groups and then we can study what kind of uh, halo properties are there for these different bar strength groups and see if they vary. So this is what we find. So here is a plot where we have the median bar strength of, of all those galaxies from the sample and here is the halo spin which is also proportional to the dark matter angular momentum. Now what we see is that for strongly barred galaxies, we find there are less, uh, uh, there is less halo spin for these galaxies, which means that strongly barred galaxies are rotating slower compared to the uh, unbarred galaxies, which is quite interesting because uh, we know from previous studies that bars are supposed to transfer angular momentum from the disk to the dark matter halo. So in that case, dark matter halos should have higher angular momentum if there are strong bars. But still, we see a different uh, kind of result. And we also note this in terms of uh, specific angular momentum of the dark matter halo, the total angular momentum. And here you can see that uh, the total mass which I'm considering of, the, of, this, uh, of, of this sample of dark matter halo is almost constant throughout the different bar strength bins. So this, uh, uh, so so now the next question is that uh, this is at redshift zero. What happens at higher redshifts? So we see uh, at a little higher redshift, like redshift point one, we see that the same kind of relation is uh, still persistent. We see uh, lower uh, halo spin or lower angular momentum for the strongly barred galaxies compared to the unbarred galaxies. Now, if we go to higher and higher redshift, then at redshift one, we see a more compli complicated relation. So here, there is not a very uh, straightforward trend that we see, and it is much more complex, both for the halo spin, the angular momentum, and the specific angular momentum of dark matter halo. So this is kind of uh, uh, kind of new result in the sense that uh, we are not expecting this from n-body simulations, but we are having or, or we are seeing this in cosmological simulation. Now we have to explain what we are seeing here. So this could be due to multiple phenomena, uh, and and that could be related to the uh, the underlying dark matter and how it is interacting with the disk of these galaxies. So uh, the angular momentum exchange at different stages of galaxy evolution uh, can affect or, or, or is the result uh, or, or it is causing this kind of phenomena to arise in these uh, simulations. So I will uh, just stop here with the summary. We have strongly barred galaxies uh, in low spin dark matter halos and, and halos with low specific angular momentum. And we see that at high redshift, the bar spin and uh, sorry, uh, bar strength and halo spin connection is more complex, which indicates an evolutionary phenomena uh, that has resulted into this inverse correlation between uh, spin and uh, 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 spin and uh, bar strength. And we still uh, we are still working on uh, what could be the possible reasons for these uh, this this kind of trend which could be due to uh, early formation of the disk of barred galaxies compared to unbarred galaxies, and, uh, and also due to the interaction between the disk and the dark matter halo. So with this, I will uh, stop here and take some questions. Thanks. Uh, time for questions. Yeah. Yes. But um, in n-body simulation, there are only uh, dark matter particles, and bars are composed of gas particles. So I was wondering how the results were derived from n-body simulation. So in n-body simulations, you can both have the stellar disk, but it will act as a uh, collisionless uh, component. And the dark matter halo is, will also be there. So you, what you study is that how the different potentials of the different components are interacting with each other. Now you can also ad advance uh, these simulations to include hydrodynamics, and you can still study what kind of uh, transfer of angular momentum is happening between the disk and the dark matter halo. So I guess it's mostly 
the baryonic subgrid physics that affects the angular trans angular momentum transport mechanism. So maybe uh, have you tried checking with other type of hydrodynamic simulations with different subgrid models such as Simba or? Um, yes, so that is uh, um, like it's 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 on the plan. So we, so we have checked in one cosmological simulation. We will also uh, like to check in other cosmological simulations whether this same phenomena is happening or not. And we would like to do a comprehensive study between uh, these simulations and how the uh, physics is, um, physics will be same, but uh, what is happening into the details, uh, we have to look into further. Okay, thank you. Um, so since the bar, bar is an instability, right? Yes. So is it possible to answer the question of what is the typical lifespan of a bar? So uh, strongly strong bars are usually very hard to uh, be unstable. So they, if, if once they are formed, they will stay for uh, like throughout the lifetime or throughout the evolution of the uh, universe. You mean age of the universe. Age, age of the universe. But if there, there are weak bars also, they, are, uh, they can be destroyed. So the main theme is to uh, somehow get uh, angular momentum into the stars which are constituting the bar, such that the bar orbits can be disrupted. Uh, yeah. Okay. And can you relate this to tidal torque theory? Yes, uh, so so the initial condition of, of the of these simulations is, uh, which is creating actually some distribution of angular momentum in the dark matter halos at different mass scales, mm -hmm. and that is coming from the tidal torque theory. But afterwards, during evolution, there is an interaction between the baryons and the dark matter, and also the um, satellite galaxies which are falling into such uh, galaxy uh, dark matter halos. So those uh, interaction which are coming at later airship are also changing the okay. initial so this condition. Is the feedback. Uh, not the only reverse. feedback, but but the dynamics uh, dynamics of the of the of the mass of the halos and the baryons. So okay. both are playing uh, a role in changing the initial conditions of the uh, angular momentum distribution. Thanks, Shari, for a nice talk. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, Shayan, um, you want to uh, okay. So our next speaker is Shayan Saha, talking about statistical methods for parameter inference for CMB surveys. So hi everyone, uh, I am Shayan. Uh, I am a PhD student under Professor Tarun Shorodev. And today what I'm going to talk about is basically giving you an overview of the things that we do and uh, the contribution that we make and the statistical tools that we provide to the community. So I'll start with a bit of prologue. So I always like to start with this analogy is the universe is like an onion. Not because it makes the cosmologists cry, but you know you can think of it as different layers. And uh, the times, different times as different layers, and you look at the sky, you see the structure, and the farthest thing that you can see is the cosmic microwave background. And the cosmic microwave background is the ancient light, the most ancient light in the, in the universe that you can see. 
So when you have this cosmic microwave background, you see this beautiful isotropic uh, temperature throughout the sky, which is 2.7 Kelvin. But when you go to a uh, millikelvin scale, you see this dipole, which we believe is because of the motion of the observation frame that we see the CMB from. But we are concerned about the fluctuations in smaller angular scales, which are these. And this tell you, tells you a lot of things. First of all, it tells you about the primordial universe, what the universe was, how it was at the time of the last scattering. And it also tells you about some other things. For example, it tells you about the late time universe because the light has been traveling to us throughout the late time universe and it has been interacting with the underlying mass distribution. And that's why the information about the mass distribution gets imprinted in the observed CMB. And also, it tells us about the motion of our observation frame from which we are observing. It gives you some effects in small angular scales as well. So the takeaway is CMB is cool, literally and figuratively. So, uh, so I'm going to use these two things to you know, show you how you can infer, first of all, the motion of our observation frame. And secondly, use, I'm going to use the weak lensing part to probe the largest objects in the universe, which are the clusters of galaxies. So the first part, which has been done with this wonderful people, Shabbir, Shubhadeep, Tarun, and Benjamin. And here, first of all, I start with the effect of the motion in the largest scale possible. So you have this CMB monopole. And if you are moving through the CMB, you see this dipole in the sky due to your motion. But the problem is, when you see this dipole, you don't know if the dipole is totally because of the kinematic reason or if there is, a, there is an intrinsic dipole present. So you need to infer the velocity from some other thing in order to check if this dipole is totally kinematic or not. So we go to small angular scales, and we see that uh, there are some effects due to the motion. So there are some effects called modulation and aberration. So due to modulation, what happens is that the fluctuations in the direction of the velocity becomes a bit brighter, and it becomes a bit dimmer in the opposite direction. And due to aberration, the, the direction of the incoming photons uh, gets a bit deflected. And as a result, what happens is that the statistically isotropic nature of the CMB fluctuations gets violated. And you want to capture this violation of statistical isotropy in order to know about the motion of our observation frame. So yeah, so just to give you an overview, like don't go into the maths, just want to show you that this term was the statistically isotropic temperature fluctuation. And due to this modulation and aberration because of our motion in the observation frame, we see this two extra term in this temperature fluctuations, which are kind of the correction due to the motion. And as a result, what happens is the covariance matrix, which is the CMB covariance matrix, what we know to be diagonal in, in a statistically isotropic CMB, is not diagonal anymore. But again, don't, don't go into the math. What I want you to notice here is that this, these are the off-diagonal terms. And these are made of this beta quantity, which is basically your velocity. So you want to capture this off-diagonal terms, and you want to get the motion out of it. So what we do is basically, uh, we uh, sample a joint posterior distribution of this covariance matrix, CMB covariance matrix in, uh, in uh, harmonic uh, space, and also the signal is as well. And the CS contains the motion of our observation frame. So we, use, we do this channel, so we do this using something called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo technique, HMC, and we do it on Planck 2018 spin car temperature map using different choices of mask and multipoles. And uh, we show here is the, the velocity, the ampli velocity amplitude uh, distribution, also the direction uh, distribution from the small angular scales. And the takeaway from this uh, work we, we want you to take here is that we get the motion from small angular scales, uh, which is consistent with the motion, with the ve velocity from the dipole. So it's kind of constraining the possibility of an intrinsic dipole in the observed CMB dipole. And we do it in a very high significance, like 5 sigma, which is higher than Planck. But Planck did it uh, with two frequency channels. But yeah, that's the kind of the punchline on this project. And the second part is done with Julian and Louis at the University of Geneva, where we use the weak lensing part, as I talked about, to probe galaxy clusters. 
So why clusters are important? So the clusters are universe's largest object. And if you can, you can uh, like count how many clusters there are as a function of the mass and the redshift, you basically know the evolution history of the universe. You can probe the cosmological parameters like sigma -8 or omega m or you know, some of the neutrino mass. But in order to do that, you need to measure the cluster mass very precisely. And that's the goal of our project. So you can measure the cluster mass using the lensing signature of the cluster in background signals. For example, the background signals can be galaxy surveys and also the CMB. And we, we, we use CMB uh, in our work because of so many reasons. For example, it is like you can access to cl clusters which are very high redshift, which are not accessible by uh, galaxy surveys. So what happens is that when there is a cluster in the line of sight of your CMB, uh, this lensing has this amazing phenomena where it conserves the surface brightness. So if there is no gradient in the background CMB, you don't see anything. You don't see the cluster. But if there is gradient, what happens is that it makes the hotter region a bit cooler and the cooler region a bit hotter. And you see this, you see the signature, you kind of try to probe the mass out of it. Okay, so some important stuff, which is the potential. Uh, we already talked about this is the lensing potential, gravitational potential of the universe. And then there is this deflection angle, which is gradient of that potential. And then there is convergence, which is the Laplacian of the potential. But it's, it is important because it basically probes directly the underlying mass density. And mind you, this, all these things are in 2D. Everything is like integrated over the line of sight. So yeah. So when you have a cluster convergence profile, which is uh, circularly symmetric, and uh, it has a truncation here, and you lens it, your unlensed CMB, and you see this dipole-like structure in the lens minus unless sky because it kind of like makes the hotter region a bit cooler and the cooler region a bit hotter. And the idea is to, again, to probe the cluster from this dipole-like structure. So, the thing that is important here is this quantity kappa zero. Again, I told you this quantity convergence basically probes the mass of your mass density of the cluster. And the kappa zero, which is a normalization for the convergence quantity, uh, is a tracer for the mass of the cluster. M200 is a variable mass. So you want to constrain this kappa zero in order to constrain the mass of the cluster. So what exactly happens? So you are given a observed CMB map, and you do something which is called quadratic estimator, and you get this lensing map. This is the Planck 2018 lensing map, by the way. And what exactly happens, as the name suggests, QE, quadratic estimator, it is a product of two maps. This one is the WF, which is called Winnet filtered map. This is basically your best guess of how the unlensed CMB should look like given the observed CMB. And the gradient gives you the gradient on the unlensed CMB. And this one is the noise filtered lens CMB map. So you get a product of this and you get this quadratic estimated for the deflection. But we don't use this quadratic estimator. What we use, what we do is we infer the potential in a Bayesian approach. So we maximize the posterior distribution of the uh, lensing potential. And what we do is we use the gradient of this posterior distribution iteratively to reach the phi map. So it's like uh, rubbing smudges of your uh, glasses. So with quadratic estimator, it's like rubbing it once. But with MAP, or the iterative estimator, it's like rubbing it iteratively until unless you get the cl clearest vision. Now, with the past CMB experiments like Planck, the noise level itself was very high. So the vision that you were trying to see was itself very blurry. So it didn't quite matter. Now, with upcoming experiments like S4 or SO, uh, you need better vision in order to find out the lensing potential more precisely. So that's kind of the idea to uh, use the MAP estimator. And in a more te technical sense, this is the separation of reconstruction noise in the lensing potential. And as you can see, this MAP, the uh, 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 orange line is the MAP line. And it, it suppresses the noise in the kappa or the you know, lensing potential reconstruction for CMBS4 like experiment. So you can construct the mass of the cluster from the convergence that you have found uh, from your map. And you can use it to like, get the mass, right? And your Error in the mass, mass construction will depend on the error of your kappa or the lensing construction. So that's the, basically the idea. The noise separation in the uh, lensing reconstruction uh, 
kind of like propagates to the noise separation in the mass reconstruction. And this here I show you the in x axis is the noise level of the experiments and and this is like the inverse signal to noise ratio. So the lower the curve is, the better your estimator is. So as you can see, for lower and lower noise level, it becomes better and better. So here, again, I show you for different channel estimators, like temperature only, polarization only, and combined, uh, the reconstruction from simulations and prediction as well. And as you can see, we uh, forecast and also do this in simulations that we give 20% improvement in over quadratic estimator uh, than the uh, uh, in the map than the quadratic estimator. So, so that's basically the punchline of this uh, this work. So we are giving to the community a better tool to estimate the mass for upcoming experiments like CMBS4. So other works that has been work going on in the group, for example, Savish, who is a postdoc here, using machine learning techniques in CMB, basically studying foregrounds and also some component separation methods. And Dipanshu, who is a PhD student, is studying some efficient ways to study the violation in the CMB in real space. So that's about it, if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Shain. Yeah, questions, Prava. So you use the analogy that map is like iteratively doing mm -hmm. it again. So how many iterations? Uh, well, it depends on uh, how, what the like map converges or not. So depending on, we have a convergence parameter where we see if it converged or not, and then we like define, okay, our map is converged. Okay. So for our estimator, we did like 20 or 15 to 20 iterations. Okay, so, the, yeah. so that means that the SNR improvement that you showed mm -hmm. is like the limit. Slightly what? That's the best you can do. Yes, so at that. that point it gets saturated, so you cannot get more than that, yeah. That's like a factor of order of one. Yeah, so basically the idea is, you know, this uh, reconstruction noise is depends on your, uh, like the CLBB or the power spectrum. So in the lens, mostly in the polarization map, you want to like remove the B uh, from B mode from the lensing iteratively. Mm -hmm. So in that way, the CLBB becomes smaller and that's why the reconstruction noise becomes also smaller. So that's the idea. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to make one comment about yeah. the, so it, there is a, so you made a distinction between uh, intrinsic dipole versus uh, kinema kinematic dipole. Mm -hmm. But I think there is one more, um, uh, you know, hierarchy, so to speak. So okay. there is a non-kinematic, then there is dynamic, and then there is intrinsic. So what I mean by that is that uh, an intrinsic, so it, what this calculation shows mm -hmm. is that there is a relative velocity between mm -hmm. the, our, our frame and mm -hmm. the CMB, yeah. right? That's what it shows. Mm -hmm. So, but in principle, it could be the case that there, the flow that we are in is cosmological and not just because of local motion. Mm -hmm. And in which case, you would have, for instance, these, you know, these people talk about these quasar uh, dipoles, et cetera, mm -hmm. which could be distinct from the CMB dipole, mm -hmm. but, you know, this calculation will not be sensitive to it. I just wanted to point out that because there is a, there are, you know, people often make this uh, thing of non-kinematic is the same thing as intrinsic. It's not. So non oh, yeah, that is yeah. true. But I think uh, that is even more true in quasar uh, dipole, the, 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 the dipole that we see in quasar, because as we know, it doesn't match with the CMB, right? Right, right. What and I'm saying is that that could be because of some in the flow that, you know, the universe is in a flow, mm -hmm. and that could be a dynamical thing, which is the background is different and not just because of the local motion that we see here. So I'm saying that th this calculation is not sensitive to whether the flow is cosmological or not. Okay, but again, I feel like the dipole that you are talking about, due to like you know clustering dipole in the uh, in the quasar. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about clustering dipole at all. Okay, so you are saying yeah. if even if like we like separate out. I mean, the I mean, if, yeah, we can talk about uh, uh, quasars, but my point is only that there is a distinction between intrinsic dipole mm -hmm. versus non-kinematic dipole. So there, I, you know, oh, okay. and there is there are two three things there to be distinguished. Okay. And okay. this just, this calculation shows, and it's a, it's a completely, we have no problems with that calculation. I want to really emphasize that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that it just shows that there is a relative velocity between us mm -hmm. and the CMB. Yeah, you know, so yeah, yeah, that's the kind of the punchline. Yeah. So we yeah. are just calculating the so velocity. the origin of that flow could be cosmological still, in the okay. sense that there could be intermediate. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. The origin can be yeah, anything. Yeah. But the, right. I'm I just, just wanted like to clarify that because yeah. there are no, numerous conversations I've had various people where this was not clear. Okay, so, okay. All right. thanks a lot, yeah. Uh, la one last question. Uh, if not, let's thank Shane again. Thanks.
And the last talk of the session is by Yashi Tiwari uh, towards a possible solution to Hubble tension with Hondesky gravity. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Yashi. I am a PhD student at ISC Bangalore, working with Dr. Rajiv Kumar Jain. Today, I'll be talking about my recent work, which is a possible solution to the Hubble tension with Hondesky gravity. So um, thanks to the previous speakers, because whatever I wanted to convey in this slide has already been conveyed. So I would just start by saying that the standard six-parameter lambda cdm model Explain, beautifully explains the universe, starting from inflation to cosmic microwave background, formation of the galaxies, until present where the universe is undergoing an accelerated expansion phase governed by dark energy. So, but there exist some cosmological tensions which are a trouble for lambda CDM model. A cosmological tension is something which arises when there is a discrepancy in the measurement of some key cosmological parameters arising from two different observations. So uh, this gives, this brings me to the topic of my work, which is the Hubble tension. So as we know, Hubble parameter is the present expansion rate, Hubble constant is the present expansion rate of the universe. And uh, Hubble tension is actually the discrepancy in the measurement of the Hubble constant from two observations. The first observation being the CMB and the other being the distance ladder. So this, with the increasing e uh, time, with the passing years, the precision for all both of these measurements have improved and which has made the tension uh, statistically significant enough uh, at present around five sigma, which is a, which makes it a crucial thing to look at to resolve, to think of the resolutions of this tension. So uh, to understand better, the early measurements, which are from cosmic microwave background, are based on observation of the power spectrum and the CMB, which is coming from redshift of 1100. And this measurements um, take into account the lambda CDM model of the universe. So there is an assumption of what is the underlying model of the universe to obtain a value of H0 from the early measurements. Whereas the late measurements are just based on the astrophysics of stars, like observing some standard candles in the local universe. And it is more of model independent approach. So um, to start, uh, to just explain that how a uh, Hubble constant is uh, estimated from the early universe. So we know that the CMB gives the power spectrum, and which is uh, very nicely fitted by the six parameter lambda CDM model. H0 is a derived parameter from this um, uh, here, and which, whose value is around 67 kilometer per second per megaparsec from Planck observations. So the calculation of uh, Hubble constant from the CMB is as follows. Uh, where theta is the angular size of sound horizon at the last scattering surface. And this is a cosmological parameter which is very finely, uh, uh, which is very well constrained by the observations of CMB. And this is, uh, this is given by the ratio of the uh, length of the sound horizon uh, till the, at the last scattering surface and the angular diameter distance uh, from today to the last scattering surface. The crucial point to note here is that the numerator, which is the distance traveled by the sound horizon from Big Bang to the last scattering surface depends on the pre-recombination physics, where the universe was just dominated by matter and radiation, and there was no role of dark energy. Whereas the late universe calculation, where we calculate the angular diameter distance to the last scattering surface, the dark energy model, the late time expansion history goes into the picture, where H0, there, thereby the H0 enters into the picture in the denominator. Now, the other measurement, which is the late universe measurement, there we observe some standard candles like supernovae or the CFITs. Supernovae, they have some fixed mean uh, mag uh, magnitude and which is correlated with the shape of the light curve, whereas the CFITs, which have a definite period luminosity relation, and these are used to calibrate distances to the farther away galaxies, and then knowing the recession velocities of those galaxies and using the Hubble's law, we get an estimate of the Hubble constant. So uh, one such uh, program is the Shoes team led by Ad Adam Rees and his collaborators who are trying to build a distance ladder uh, to reach uh, galaxies up to redshift of 0.1 and uh, using the CFITs and the supernovae standard candles. And this program has given an estimate of the Hubble constant, uh, which is around 73. 
and as you can see that the Planck value was around 67 and this is 73 and given the precision the significance of the statistical significance of the Hubble tension is presently 5 sigma. And at this point I will also say that there are other measurement techniques apart than the shoes program, distance ladder me measurement techniques like the tip of the red giant branch which also give an estimate of the Hubble constant but that is always greater than 70 kilometer per second per megaparsec which is indicating that there still exists some tension with the Planck even if you don't rely on the shoes result. So uh, now one has to think for the possible resolution. So if we assume that, okay, the, the calculations of the distance ladder are fine and reliable, then there needs to be some modification in the lambda CDM picture. Why? Because this is some information which is entering into the calculation of the H0 from the CMB power spectrum. So uh, when we are modifying uh, the lambda CDM model, we have to keep in mind that we cannot disturb the peaks of the CMB, which is very finely measured by the Planck observations. So uh, all the, uh, this divides the solutions into two regimes. One is modifying the early universe. When we say modifying the early universe, we are actually reducing the sound horizon, which is the numerator in the expression, and not modifying the late part. So the late universe, the pr uh, after recombination physics is still explained by the lambda CDM model, and this automatically requires an increase in the value of H0 to keep the theta fixed, which is constrained from the CMB observations. And uh, some uh, examples are adding some extra radiation in the early universe. And the other approach is modifying the late universe, where you actually uh, change the denominator. It's so keeping in mind that the angular diameter distance to the last scattering surface cannot be changed because the early universe physics is not disturbed and theta is fixed. So, uh, so uh, there are various models like phantom dark energy models which very well explain such type of uh, uh, thing. So it, this brings to my work which where we are introducing a late time modification, we are introducing a dark energy model in the framework of Hondeski gravity. So Hondeski gravity is a generalized scalar tensor theory which involves all sorts of possible interactions between scalar field and gravity so that the equation of motions are always second order. So what is the motivation? So first thing that there have been studies in literature we have, which have suggested that the phantom behavior is necessary to explain uh, the large value of H0 at present for the la late dark energy models. So we want a phantom like behavior of the dark energy. But the phantom behavior is not enough because just phantom behavior runs into some other tensions like uh, it worsens the another cosmological tension which is the sigma 8 tension. So there have, so the various studies have then suggested that phantom crossing behavior where there is a transition in the equation of state from greater than minus one to less than minus one of the dark energy, uh, such type of solutions simultaneously resolve both H0 and S8 tension. So our objective is to have a phantom dark energy as well as a feature of phantom crossing in our model. And this we obtain by using the phenomenology of the Hondeski gravity, use employing different interactions. So I will be working with the dynamical scalar field. There there is no cosmological constant in the picture. The dynamical scalar field drives the late time acceleration. It has some self interactions and the coupling, uh, non minimal coupling to gravity. So, in terms of the Lagrangian, how the scalar field Lagrangian looks like is the first term is the non minimal coupling term, G4 is the non minimal coupling function, R is the Ricci scalar, and then there is a self interaction term of the scalar field, and the last two terms are the usual kinetic and the potential term of the scalar field. We work with a linear potential and we have seen that the changing the choice of the potential does not affect the dynamics that, the, uh, that is brought in by the two interaction terms. So that ex action would be the sum of the scalar field and the matter part, the usual matter part. And the dark energy density will now have con contributions arising from non-minimal coupling as well as from the self interactions. So the G4 controls the non-minimal coupling which is given on the right hand side, second equation, and the G3 is the uh, self-interaction coupling function. So we have three free parameters in the theory, C1, C2, and C3. We choose to work with monomial form of uh, linear uh, in, uh, coupling functions we have started to work with. So C1, C2, C3 will control the strength of the various coupling. At this point, I will bring you to uh, see this uh, uh, equation of the energy density. So the red terms are due to this uh, non-minimal coupling. And the interesting thing is that at high redshifts, the, uh, where the Hubble parameter is large, um, the, these terms could dominate and lead to an interesting feature of taking the dark energy density to negative values. And these will explain some, uh, some uh, interesting, this will give some interesting implications in the observations that we will discuss later. So 
this is the dis uh, model where we, uh, this is the results of the model where the distinct features are shown. The first plot, show, first plot shows the evolution of the normalized Hubble parameter with redshifts. So it can be seen into two parts. At high redshifts, uh, the there is a, uh, the black one is the lambda cdm one for comparison, whereas the colored one are by tuning the c1, c2, c3, the free parameters in the theory uh, to see the evolution uh, effect on the evolution. So on the high redshifts, the expansion rate lags behind lambda cdm, while at there is a crossing, and then at the low redshift, the expansion rate of the model is boosted in comparison to lambda cdm to give a large value of h0 at present around 70 or 72. So this uh, the, the previous part at high redshift is attributed to the presence of the negative dark energy. So the right bottom figure shows the evolution of the energy density of the scalar field in our model, which is negative at high redshifts. And at high redshifts means it before redshift of two or three. And then it becomes positive around present. Um, giving the correct evolution uh, accelerated expansion phase of the universe. So at this point, I will also point out that the total energy density of the universe is always positive. This is just one component which is getting negative, so there are no inconsistencies in the theory. So uh, the negative energy density uh, brings the Hubble parameter below the lambda cdm, as well as this brings an advantage of explaining the uh, one anomalous measurement of Hubble parameter from the baryon acoustic oscillation Lyman alpha measurements around redshift of uh, 2.3 or so, which are considered as anomaly because these are uh, at a statistical significance of two sigma, not that much, uh, from the predictions of the lambda CD model. So, uh, and there have been previous studies which have shown that the negative dark energy models can indeed explain the presence of this uh, measurement of HZ from the baryon acoustic oscillation. And also what interesting feature the negative dark energy brings is that whenever negative dark energy crosses the zero, uh, whereas where it becomes from negative to positive, there is a phantom crossing behavior which is imprinted in the equation of state of the dark energy as shown in the top right figure. Uh, so this phantom crossing behavior is crucial to address the Hubble tension and sigma tension simultaneously. So um, then the other feature is that there is a phantom be equation of state around present. Uh, which is coming due to the other self-interaction term controlled by C1 and C2, which makes the pressure to be negative. And this boosts the expansion uh, rate uh, in comparison to lambda cdm to give a large value of H0 at present. So in the subplot in the equation of state, we can see that around present, the equation of state is phantom. So hence, we construct a model and finally we confront it with the observation. So we use the low redshift data, the shoes measurement, the Pantheon sample, of supernovae light curves, the baryon acoustic oscillation measurement of the expansion rate, and the cosmic chronometer observations of Hubble parameter, and to put constraints on the model parameters, C1, C2, and C3. This is what we obtain. Um, we also uh, obtain the uh, constraints from individual likelihoods, as well as the right hand, uh, the left hand side, the green one shows the final results from the combined likelihoods, and the parameters are well constant except the non-minimal coupling parameter, which seems to be insensitive uh, or not ve so well constrained from the data. And we get a value of Hubble parameter, which is around 70, Hubble constant, which is around 72. So of course, it is going in the right direction to resolve the tension. So with this, I'll conclude that uh, we are trying to um, employ Hondesky -Lag Lagrangian and bring up uh, to construct inter uh, interesting models, which have features like phantom crossing, which are essential for re resolution of Hubble tension. And uh, right now we have done the background analysis. We are, the work in, is in progress, and we are also working on the perturbations to uh, confront the data with the full CMB, uh, to confront the model with the full CMB data, and put more stringent constraints on the parameter space. So, and also see the implications on the growth tension. So, with this, I will uh, thank you all. Questions. Okay, I just had a comment because now there is also increasing interest of using 21 centimeter observations, especially at low redshift, so yes. 0.5 to 3, yes. that yes. range. Um, might be worth predicting the imprints of uh, this behavior because we are trying to measure, say, BAO scales and mm. uh, at those redshifts. Yes. So it might be useful to connect that observationally because that's uh, in very near future we could be constraining those two. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, then let's thank Yashi once again.
Okay, so um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, the lunch uh, is uh, in the library block building. Um, you can just follow the crowd on the terrace. And we will reconvene at 2.15 p.m. So please, uh, we'll, we'll meet here uh, at that time. All right, so let's start the next session of the meeting. And uh, this session will have six talks again. And the first speaker is Saurabh Singh from RI. And he's going to tell us about studying the universe using 21 centimeter observations. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, so I basically want to give a flavor of um, the 21 centimeter observations and how they are conducted, uh, highlighting also some of the experiments I've been working with including uh, in-house experiments uh, right here at RRI, but also other collaborations. So since I presume this is the first talk that talks about 21 centimeter cosmology, just a very brief premiere of what we are trying to do here. So 21 centimeter is a very versatile tool, which can be really used to probe any given redshifts, right from our local universe all the way to redshifts of 200. Um, but the redshift range that we'll be probing for today is uh, this part. So we are right here, and the Big Bang is on the right side of the screen. And uh, we are probing this time when we have the very first generations of stars forming. So in the cosmological redshifts, we will focus at around redshifts of 30, starting from there. And we expect uh, these sources to have heated and ionized the gas. That process would have ended at around uh, this, at, at uh, redshift of 6, or in 1 billion years after the Big Bang. So that translates to redshifts of um, 6 to redshifts of 30. So in today's talk, I want to focus on how do we detect the redshifted 21 centimeter line that's coming to us from this part. And the reason we would want to do this is simply because we have very little idea about the nature of these stars. So in the later part of my talk, I would also uh, discuss the kind of constraints we have already started to put uh, on the properties of these uh, objects, given that they form in a very different regime than what we have in the local universe. The beauty of this line is that uh, it gives us a very fine time information. So the rest frequency is fixed, 1420 megahertz. And looking at the redshift, we have a very specific frequency at which we can observe that line. So you can imagine that lines from different uh, cosmological redshifts are redshifted to different frequencies here. So for example, if you are probing a redshift of 30, it will appear at 46 megahertz. So even if it's a line, we are actually making a very broadband measurement. And that's the key. So we are trying to look at redshifts from 30 to 6, which we can translate to frequency of 200 megahertz to around 40 megahertz. So this is a broadband measurement looking at a series of redshifted lines. What does this intensity tell us? Lot of things. Again, for the, re uh, the redshifts that we are probing, we will only focus on this term. So there are two uh, uh, terms here, which is the spin temperature and the radiation temperature. And uh, later down the talk, when I discuss the constraints, both of these terms become very important. So for all practical purposes, over the majority of the redshift, we'll be talking about the spin temperature can just be assumed to be the gas temperature. Uh, and the background radiation temperature can be treated as CMB. But this can change, and that's something I'll come to later. But overall, you can see that the brightness is very sensitive to the difference of the two. So if the gas, for example, is very cold compared to the CMB, you will see a large negative value and if it's heated in some way and it goes above CMB, you will see some positive values. So this is just a snapshot of a simulation by Andre Missinger. Uh, again, um, on this side uh, is uh, low redshifts going to high redshifts. And the, the simulation essentially shows for a specific property of the stars and galaxies of the first generation, what kind of brightness we will observe. So this is a map of 21 centimeter brightness. It's a 3D cube, x, y, and along the redshift. So this is one slice. 
Uh, initially, the gas is cold. Therefore, the temperatures you will see are negative. That changes when the X-rays are emitted and they heat up the gas. And that's where you start seeing positive values. But at the same time, you can also see there are dark patches happening. And that's because along with X-rays, we also have UV photons from the, these stars. And they can very quickly ionize the gas. And if, of course, if there is no gas, you don't expect to see 21 centimeter signal. And that is very clear by the end of this, which is around 6, which is when the entire gas in the IGM is completely depleted, and you will not see any kind of a signal. Question is, how do you want to measure it from an observational perspective? You can have two different methods. Of course, there are more methods possible. And I'll be focusing on these two. Uh, one is you can take the mean at every redshift. So it's a single number per redshift, and therefore per frequency. And you get a signature that looks like this. This is what we call as global signal. And what you can also look at is the fluctuation at every redshift. And look at how the power is distributed at different spatial scales. That's power spectrum. And uh, of course, it's very sensitive to the nature of these sources. So for example, if there is a delay in the star formation, everything gets shifted, as you can see here. And that's the reason we would want to observe such a thing, because we can very tightly constrain these properties, which right now is completely unconstrained. The problem with doing so uh, are multifold. And that's why, as a community, we started these experimentation efforts in late 2000s. And we still are at a regime where we have upper limits or the conservative limits at best. We don't have a detection at, as of now, uh, taking into account that there are lots of experiments globally who are trying to do this. And the challenges, the two major challenges are uh, these. So the signal comes to us through a range of redshifts. Um, so when you actually observe using a telescope and look at how the power is distributed over different frequencies, because that's where you expect to see the signal, you get, a, you get data that looks something like this. Now, the things that strike out, uh, one is these vertical spikes. And Kirti mentioned in her talk, these are very well-known radio frequency interferences. And especially in the frequency range of 40 to 200 megahertz, we have FM sitting spot in between. But then the baseline is basically our foregrounds. And at these frequencies, the foregrounds are mostly dominated by Milky Way itself. And it, it has a very broadband continuum emission dominated by synchrotron. But of course, there are other radiative processes. And that constitutes this baseline. If you would have dived deeper into it, you would have also seen some systematics. That is basically the property of your telescope. And somewhere in that, buried in the deep noise, is where the signal lies. And the contrast between these is roughly one part in 10 raised to 6. So these foregrounds can be thousands of Kelvin. And the signal, as you have noticed on here, y-axis, the brightness temperature is around 100 millikelvin. So there's a huge contrast, and therefore, a lot of calibration accuracies. Um, the very stringent calibration requirements um, are there when we design such an experiment. So I'll focus on these two aspects. One is the global signal, and one is the power spectrum. So the global signal, there are different experiments happening worldwide. Uh, SARAS is India's only global signal experiment right now. Of course, there are other proposed uh, experiments coming up. And uh, so uh, of course, I'm speaking on behalf of a huge team here uh, for both of experiments I'll be talking about, and many of which are in the audience. So SARAS basically uh, aims to measure the global component of this signal um, in the frequency range of 50 to 200 megahertz, which essentially translates to redshift of 30 to redshift of 6. And you can see this a single antenna experiment, a very non-conventional, uh, floating on water to suppress a lot of systematics. I probably can't get into the details of this right now, but I'll be ha uh, happy to take questions later. So jumping directly to the kind of constraints we have been able to put, this was more well-known, which is we had a claimed detection by our other experiment uh, here, uh, EDGES, which has been ruled out uh, by SARAS experiment. And the reason why this was so interesting is because it was at odds with all the standard predictions of the signal. Of course, there is a huge parameter, uh, unconstrained parameter space. But even if you account for all those parameter variations, this was uh, very, very exotic. And that was essentially ruled out by our latest set of observations by SARS-3. But I, what I would want to focus is what's happening beyond this. So if we go back to the standard models now, um, there is a, still a huge parameter space. And we can, in principle, extend that parameter space by also assuming uh, contributions from the backgrounds. So till now, we had been basically assuming that our radiation background is just CMB. But in principle, we can also have radiation from galaxies in radio wavelengths that can add on to that background. So then what happens, because you are measuring the contrast between the gas and the background, in principle, it can increase. 
So the blue line here is basically um, the parameter space occupied by the global signals, which are completely unconstrained. And we use data that we observed with SARS-2 and SARS-3, the two different editions of this experiment. And the green and the blue ones are basically the ones that are allowed by SARS experiment. Of course, this is good to look at, but eventually what does it tell us about the nature of the stars and galaxies? So of course, there is a parameter space here. And I'll basically point out to three different uh, parameters which we are very sensitive to. The star formation efficiency, which is what fraction of the gas actually gets converted to stars. F radio. F radio is essentially um, the, X, uh, the radio luminosity of these galaxies. And this is basically derived from the local universe where we know that the radio luminosity is directly correlated with the star formation rate and which can be scaled up and down. So in some way, this is a normalization. And similarly, we have FX. FX is basically the X-ray efficiency of these uh, first objects. Um, and there also in local universe, we see that the luminosity in the X-ray is also very directly proportional to the star formation rate. And for high redshift, we put in these additional normalization effects. And what we see is that we are very sensitive to these two parameters. So uh, for example, we are ruling out very high values of star formation efficiency for early universe, anything above 5% at this still at one sigma level though. And similarly, we, we basically uh, disfavor a, a range of the X-ray and radio luminosities. So this uh, was also recently published. Uh, but uh, what we really wanted to is go beyond the fact that we have global experiments, but we also have power spectrum measurements, which are looking essentially at the same field. It's just that they are trying to look at the fluctuations. But the properties of the stars are same, and in principle, they can be constrained by these experiments too. So I'm working with HERA experiment here for power spectrum measurements. And again, it has the same science goal, but it wants to look at power spectrum at every redshift. So based on the last season of the data, we have very deep upper limits on the power spectrum value itself. So the x-axis here is different spatial scales, and y-axis is millikelvin squared, the brightness temperature. And uh, this plot basically shows the current status of the power spectrum experiments. The pink ones are basically the limits that have been uh, derived from HERA observations. And you can already see that these are one of the deepest, but they are still not at the level of the standard signals. Uh, however, at this level, we are able to rule out a big chunk of the power spectra uh, that uh, belong to very high radio intensity uh, from the first galaxies. So just similar to what we had done for Ceres using just a single uh, antenna, HERA that actually comprises around 300 of them when it's finally built, we can constrain very similar properties. And you can see the posteriors, especially for the X-ray efficiency and for the radio uh, efficiency of the very first sources, we are able to constrain uh, uh, low and high values respectively. So basically what we are putting is a, thank you, we are putting a lower limit on this and uh, upper limit on the radio efficiency. And interestingly, we also saw that there is yet another constraint which is nicely peaking around uh, 40 or so in the X-ray efficiency. This is of course assuming that the gas was only heated by uh, high mass X-ray binaries. And basically what we are saying is compared to the local universe, which is this solid line, uh, at very early universe, we actually have much higher luminosities in X-rays. And that is also we expect from simulations for low metallicity environments. But the ultimate question really is can we combine the two, uh, right? Because though we are very different experiments with very different systematics, eventually we, would, we are looking at the same field. And that's exactly what we did and that's the last part of my talk, so hopefully I'll be on time. Uh, so we can basically combine the likelihoods that we individually obtain from each of these experiments. Uh, the problem, of course, is it's a very computationally expensive because there are lots of parameters. You have parameters for the signal, also systematics, foregrounds, and your noise profiles. Uh, so you have to really marginalize over a lot of nuisance parameters here. So we use neural networks here to basically expedite the whole process. And once we have the uh, likelihoods from each experiment, we basically do a, a joint constraint. So this is one of its first kind where we, for the first time, combined power spectrum with the sky average measurements of the 21 centimeter signal. And mind you, both were non-detections. But just by putting together, we could really boost up our constraints on each of the properties, which is the star formation efficiency, the X-ray, and the radio luminosities of these first galaxies. And they are all consistent with each other, of course. Um, and one way to quantify how much of a gain do we uh, have is basically looking at the percentage of prior which is consistent with the data, so, right? So prior is a huge range, it's mostly flat because we have no idea what these properties are. But uh, 
for each experiment, how much of this prior shrinks, right? So for example, SARS-3, SARS-2, um, HERA individually are all, if you just use these data individually, you will have a considerably large fraction which is still consistent, but the moment you combine them, you come at here. So roughly only 65% of theoretically allowed parameter space is now possible by just combining these data sets. And these are the tightest constraints on the radio and X-ray luminosities. And again, one of its first attempt which can be expanded to. So just the last slide, we can actually go much beyond this. Uh, we only till now had HERA and SARS, but we also have uh, measurements of excess radio background and unresolved X-ray background that we can use. And uh, that itself makes it much tighter. This paper is still in progress, so it's submitted, but um, uh, still in press. But uh, overall, what we find is that by looking at the unresolved X-ray and radio backgrounds, our constraints can become much tighter and uh, it's possible to do much more astrophysics with this. So uh, basically, there is no substitute to getting more data and more good quality data. So since then, we have also done a lot of upgrades for SARS uh, so that the level of systematics are further reduced. Similarly, for HERA, we have upgraded its speed because till now it was only observing 400 to 200. Now it can go all the way to 50 megahertz, which has a better systematic control. And Analysis is still in progress for both these experiments. Uh, we have just concluded our observations of SARS in August in Hanley around that region. And similarly for HERA, the last season is concluded. So analysis is going on on both fronts and we basically expect to have much tighter constraints on these properties. And I think I have no time to go further, so I'll stop here and take questions. <laughs> Thanks, Saurav. Uh, time for maybe two quick questions. So your uh, F star. The yes. constraint on it after combining the two data Hera and Saras, what was the value? Right Are, here. Yeah, so so F star is actually mostly constrained by Saras, so there is not much of a significance. Okay. We are still doing five anything percent. above three to five percent is ruled out. Okay. Because Hera is right now with hundred to two hundred, it's only looking at redshifts of ten and eight. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. But and we expect that to further improve once we have the higher redshift data from Hera. Okay. And uh, from the from the power spectrum measurements, do you get the real space image of the fluctuations? Uh, right, so uh, that's a possibility and there is a subgroup within collaboration that does that. We basically bypass the whole imaging process. So mm -hmm. we, we take visibilities and we can directly form the power spectrum using the quadratic yes. estimator. Yes. So idea being that the foregrounds are localized at yeah. very small K modes. Yeah. So yeah, so for this results that I discussed, there was no imaging done, okay. but there is another paper coming up which actually images and then form the power spectrum. Okay, please send me the paper. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is there another mic there? Yes. Uh, so what is the prospect of, let's say, new physics for this SARS? Uh, so like these observations are fairly agnostic to like different models and we are open to testing things. Right now, the only uh, constraint comes from our frequency range. So we are right now observing, thanks to Hanley radio quietness, before we were not able to access uh, FM band, which we are able to do that now. So we are going from 40 to 110. So it based, compared to the previous RS3 results, we can finally look at slightly uh, lower redshifts too. So that expands our parameter space, but in terms of models we can investigate, that is really up to what our theory collaborators can provide us. Okay, thanks. Okay, one last question. Uh, thanks, Saurav. The preliminary slide that you showed, mm. I saw there was a line on the uh, X-ray background. Mm. Uh, where do those constraints come from, observationally? Yeah, observationally, they're all different experiments, actually. Um, right, so the references are mentioned, uh, and they're actually separated by very different years and also very different uh, energy bands, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, we also believe that some of these uh, unresolved X-ray background could simply be because there are unresolved X-ray sources. So these constraints can further be lowered if we have more better uh, sky maps in X-ray, like uh, more resolution. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Saurav, and uh, move on. So next speaker is uh, Akash Kumar Saha, and he'll be talking about hunting primordial black hole dark matter in Lyman Alpha Forest. Yeah, so today I'll be talking about how to search for primordial black hole dark matter using Lyman Alpha Forest, and this is based on an ongoing work done in collaboration with Priyank Parashiri and also Ranjan Laha, who is there in the audience. So first of all, by now we all know that dark matter is there in the universe, 
And there are various different evidences for its existence. So some of these evidences are here. So cosmic microwave background, bullet cluster, galaxy rotation curve. Now, I'll not go into the details of any of these evidences, but the bottom line here is that all of these different evidences tell us that dark matter must interact by gravitational force, right? But till now, we don't know if there is some non-gravitational interaction that dark matter like, interacts by, right? And as a result of which, the mass range of interest for dark matter is huge. So you can see here, the mass almost starts from 10 to the minus 22 EV, goes all the way up to some solar masses, right? So it can be a particle, it can be a black hole. We don't really know. Now today I'll be talking about the latter part, or the latter, uh, latter category, that is this primordial black hole. And the mass range of interest will be from 10 to the 15 grams to around 10 to the 18 grams. So the first question, what is a primordial black hole? Well, primordial black holes are just like any other black hole, but the only difference is that these are not formed due to star collapse. These are formed at a very early stage of the universe. Now, after formation, they act like just other, any other black hole. And if we know the mass and the spin, we can determine the temperature. And so in the first expression, you can see, right? The MPBH is the mass of the black hole. The S-star is the dimensionless spin parameter. And depending on them, we can determine the temperature. And depending on the temperature, what these black holes will do is that they will Hawking evaporate, right? So basically, what they will do is that they will produce a bunch of standard oil particles. And the spectra of those particles uh, is given here. So here, uh, the gamma is something called a gray body factor that basically tells you what is the probability of a given particle to surpass the potential of the black hole. And this E dash is basically the total energy of the emitted particles, taking into, the, into account the rotational velocity of the black hole. So the first question is, how do you detect the primordial black hole dark matter, right? So as I said, this primordial black hole dark matter is basically evaporating and producing a bunch of standard oil particles. And we know how to detect standard oil particles, right? So what we can do is that, let's say they are producing electron positrons, photons, neutrinos. We can try to detect those, right? And people have done that. And people have uh, got some interesting bounds on primordial black hole dark matter. Now, there is a second way. And here, the idea is, as I said, that primordial black holes are evaporating and producing, let's say, uh, electron, positron, photons. Now, what these electron, positron, and photons will do is that they will dump their energy in the intergalactic medium, right? And so the thermal and ionization history of the intergalactic medium will be modified in presence of primordial black holes. So let's see how the temperature is kind of changed in presence of primordial black hole, right? So here in the x-axis, I have the redshift. In the y-axis, I have the temperature of the intergalactic medium. Now, just for reference, this black dashed line is a CMB temperature. Now, let's focus on the blue line here, right? So this blue line is actually the standard intergalactic medium temperature without any sort of in exotic heat injection, right? So it's falling off. Now, let's say we have primordial black hole dark matter in the universe. And let's say their masses are 10 to the 16 grams. And FPV is 10 to the minus 4. So FPV is the quantity that we use a lot in this sort of analysis. What this basically means is the fraction of dark matter made up of primordial black hole. So if I say FPVH is 1, then all dark matter is primordial black hole. So if I take just these two parameters, what I can see is that so the green line is for the non-spinning primordial black hole. The red line is for the spinning primordial black hole. So clearly, you can see that the matter temperature in presence of primordial black hole is actually more than the standard thing, right? So there is a temperature increase in presence of primordial black holes. So now the question is, what we need here is that we need a thermometer that will tell me the temperature of the intellect medium at a certain redshift. And from that, I can maybe search for primordial black hole, right? Now, fortunately, we have a thermometer that is this Lyman alpha forest. There is another thermometer that is 21 centimeter signal that sort of just talked about. So first question is, what is a Lyman alpha forest? And why is it a forest? Well, there is a very well-known transition in neutral hydrogen. That is this Lyman alpha transition. So the idea is that inside neutral hydrogen, at n equal to 1 state, if we have electrons, they can absorb photon of 12, 16 Armstrong and go to n equal to 2 excited state, right? So this is this Lyman alpha transition. And the reason why these sort of transitions are very important for cosmologists and astrophysicists is because we know that in the early universe, most of the baryonic matter was in form of hydrogen, right? And that's why these kind of a transitions of hydrogen is very important in understanding the evolution of our universe. Now let's understand the basic idea of this Lyman alpha forest, right? So what I have here is that let's say I have a uh, quasar at redshift z equal to 6. And we are getting photons from this quasar, right? So because it will emit wavelengths, like wavelengths at all different uh, spectra at all, all different wavelengths, so what will happen is that we'll get a kind of spectral-like structure. So here in the plot in the x-axis, I have the emitted wavelength, lambda. In the y-axis, I have the flux. And so let's say this is the spectra of this quasar that I'm seeing, right? Now let's see a scenario where I have a neutral patch of hydrogen so the photon is going through. Let's say there is a neutral patch of hydrogen through which it's going through, right? At z equal to 6 itself. 
Now, as I said, that whenever a photon of 12 cystic Armstrong encounters a neutral hydrogen, it will cause this lime alpha transition, right? So, as a result of which, what we'll see in the spectra is that the photons or 12 cystic Armstrong will get absorbed because it is making the transition of this lime alpha, right? So, as a result, what you'll see in the detected spectra is there is a dip at the 12 cystic Armstrong. Now, things get more interesting where we have, let's say, a patch at z equal to 3, right? So now the thing is that this patch is at a different redshift than this one. And so what will happen? The photons that were a lower wavelength in this redshift will get stretched, and it will become 12 cystic Armstrong here and get absorbed, right? So that is the reason why you are getting a dip in a different wavelength, right? And this thing can keep going on and on and on. So in realistic scenario, this is something you get. So in the x-axis, we have the emitted wavelength in Armstrong. In the y-axis, we have the intensity. And so this is the spectra of this quasar at redshift 3.62. And what you see is that you are getting these absorption lines many, many more times, right? So from far, it looks like a forest-like structure. That's why it's called a lime alpha forest, right? And lime alpha forest is actually a very like, well-measured thing today. But now, in our context, the question is, how does it tell us about the evaporating primordial black hole, right? So as it turns out that the width of this absorption line is actually sensitive to the temperature of the intergalactic medium. So what I mean by that, the more temperature I have in the intergalactic medium, the more these uh, dips will be wider. And the lesser temperature, they will be more narrower, right? So as I previously said, that primordial black holes are heating up the gas. So what will happen essentially is that I will get more wider uh, dips in the uh, lime alpha forest. So if I want to track down the temperature evolution of the intergalactic medium, these are the terms that are needed. So the first term on the right here is the standard matter temperature evolution, which takes into account the expansion of the universe and also Compton scattering, all of these things. The second term is an interesting term. So this is the photoheating due to realization. So what the idea here is that when the first stars are formed, uh, they were emitting photons, and those photons can ionize the neutral hydrogen, right? So now what will happen is that when the photon ionizes the neutral hydrogen, there is an electron that is kicked out, and this electron can dump its energy in the IGM, right? So that is this photoheating that I'm talking about. And last but not the least, we have the uh, we have the contribution from the primordial black hole dark matter that we are considering. So now let's see if we have realization in the universe, can we really differentiate between new physics and what we know, right? So again, in the plot in the x-axis, I have the red shift. In the y-axis, I have the intergalactic medium temperature. And this red line that you can see is for the case where we don't have any sort of primordial black hole or new physics. It's just the for, like, uh, photo ionization or photo heating due to realization, right? So as you can see, the temperature is increasing at the time of realization. But now if we have primordial black holes, that is shown by this uh, violet colored line, right? So let's say the primordial black hole mass is 10 to the 16 grams and FPB is 10 to the minus 2. Then as you can see, the temperature just keeps on increasing, right? So the bottom line here is that even in presence of realization, you can see there's a clear difference between the case where we don't have primordial black hole and where we have primordial black hole. So now what are the data sets that we are using? So uh, typically, the way people find out the temperature of the intergalactic medium is that they have the existing data sets of Lime Alpha Forest from this BOSS, HIRES, all of these spectrographs. And they also do hydrodynamical simulations. And from comparing these two, they try to infer the temperature of the gas. So in the y-axis, again, I have the intergalactic medium temperature. In the x-axis, I have the redshift. And these uh, blue data points are from this Walther data analysis. And these red data points are from this GAICOR data analysis, right? So these are data points that we are using. And to put very conservative bounds on primordial black hole, the assumption is that the gas temperature that will be raised because of primordial black hole should not overshoot these data points. And when we do that, these are the limits that we obtain. So in the x-axis, we have the mass of the primordial black hole in gram. In the y-axis, we have the FPBH. That is, again, the fraction of dark matter made of primordial black hole. This uh, red dashed line that you can see is coming from the assumption that, let's say, we have photoionization, but we don't have any photoheating. So that's kind of a conservative approach. And this kind of deeper red band is coming when we vary over different realization models. So anything out of these lines are ruled out. So we cannot have primordial black holes sitting here. Now, we are not alone in the parameter space. There are many other limits. So these are the other limits. Now, again, anything out of these lines are ruled out. And I will not go into the details of any of these bounds, but you can ask me questions. But the main idea here is that, as you can see, our limits from uh, Lime Alpha Forest is competitive with the other existing limits. And in future, we hope that we'll have many more uh, results coming from this Lime Alpha Forest data set. So to conclude, we have seen that Lime Alpha Forest acts as a calorimeter for any sort of exotic heat injection. 
evaporating uh, low mass primordial black hole can affect this uh, absorption lines and from there we can put some bounds or discover primordial black hole dark matter and in future we hope that we'll have many more data sets with lesser error bars, a better understanding of realization and from there we can understand more about the universe and the nature of dark matter. Thank you. Thanks, Akash. Uh, time for questions. Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. I have a question. Uh, so how do you distinguish uh, the uh, dispersion in the uh, width of the line from the overlapping of several lines? Yes. So, so the idea here is that uh, one thing is that you are having the absorption due to neutral hydrogen, right? That is this Lyman forest, right? Yeah. Now, the question is that we have many other things also, right? Through our uh, like line of sight, right? We have galaxies and metal lines also, right? So these are actually kinds of the backgrounds that people deal with. So what do I need here is that I need a clean neutral hydrogen absorption lines, right? I don't want any sort of contamination, right? And people have many different ways to actually uh, do this. So one way is that, so here I'm probing, let's say, intergalactic medium, right? But we can have a galaxy, right, in front of it. How do I know that the line is not from galaxy, right? So one way is that you look for the clustering of these lines. So if it's a galaxy, what will happen? They will cluster together. Lines will be clustered together. But intergalactic medium is not like really clustering together, right? So there are ways in which you can actually differentiate it's coming from like purely neutral hydrogen or some contamination is there or not. Okay. Thank you. So uh, have you also explored that this fo uh, radiation can also distort the CMB? Uh, the spectral distortion may happen because then you may get a joint constant because people has worked. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so what you're talking about, uh, so as I said, I didn't explain this plot. So you see uh, there is this green line. Right? I don't know if you can see, right? Huh. So there's a CMB constraint, right? So I think there people have taken into account this anisotropy, uh, then this uh, polarization, all of these data they have looked at. But you can always do a joint analysis. Yeah. I think huh. that will improve the yeah. bounds, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. that we have not yet considered. But okay. yeah. Any other questions? So I had a question actually. Uh, as far as IgM heating is concerned, there might be tons of other processes which might heat up IgM. Yes. So why do you sort of focus on only one particular aspect? Uh, why is it sort of so important in the sense that you know there might be other other contributions to yes. IgM heating at the same time? Yes. Yes. So so the idea is that uh, let's go back. Yes, so here you see, right, the temperature is not really governed only by standard and the primordial black hole, right? There is a term sitting there that can be lots of things, right? Stars and galaxies, everything can be there, right? So the idea here is that what you're saying is more important when you're trying to discover, let's say, primordial black hole, right? So let's say you want to have an excess in the lesser temperature, right? So there you have to really know the backgrounds that are there. Then you are sort of saying, okay, there is an excess. Can I do it with primordial black hole, right? Now, the conservative approach, when we are putting bound, we are not saying these are coming from primordial black hole really, right? What you're saying is, let's say, uh, there is a kind of flux that is giving rise to some temperature, right? So we are saying that this, let's say I have a temperature measurement. So let's say I go to this plot. So let's say these are temperature measurement, right? So what I'm claiming is that the temperature increase due to primordial black hole should not overshoot these limits, because this is all I have, right? I know the temperature. It should not overshoot, right? Now, if you include realization and all, your limits will be strengthened. But I'm not claiming that I know all the backgrounds, right? So at this moment, realization, we really don't know that really. So for discovering aspect, those things will come into play, all of these different contributions. All right, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Akash once again. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Amlan Chakravarti, and he'll be talking about uh, can cosmology allow a mass varying dark matter? Can you hear me, right? Yeah. So hello, everyone. Today, I will be talking about the work that I have done recently in collaboration with Professor Shubhina Das from IIA, Shiv Shetty from RRI, and Dr. Anirban Das 
from SLAC Stanford and CTP Seoul National University. So the topic of my talk is can cosmology allow a mass varying dark matter? So I will be briefly giving you an introduction at, as I am sure that you must have been bored uh, hearing same things over and over again from the start of this meeting. So then I will be talking about mass varying dark matter and then its cosmological Im implications. Then I will try to argue that it can actually elevate this SA tension and it will provide a mass detection. And then I will conclude. So you have seen this many times, so I will not go into the details. So basically what I will say is that the dark matter is the second most abundant element in our universe. And thanks to Akash, I didn't know he has the same pictures in his <laughs> talk. So thanks, for, thanks to him that I don't have to explain all this. So I can go. <laughs> so I have a little bit more time. So we know that Lambda CDM is the most successful model till now in, our, uh, in explaining the evolution of our universe. So it is a six parameter model. So AS is the amplitude of the primordial spectrum. NS is the tilt. Omega B is the, actually the density of the baryons. Uh, cold dark matter density is the omega CDM. Theta S is the sound horizon at the recombination. And tau reionization is the optical depth at the reionization era. So in here, we actually take cosmological constant lambda as the dark energy. And baryons, we think of the, all the standard model particles and having the four fundamental interactions. And uh, CDM is considered, the dark matter is considered as cold and collisionless. So this is a most successful model in explaining many phenomena in the universe, namely this Planck data, CMB map we see, and as well as the large scale structure to greater extent. So, but still it posed some of the problems that was uh, discovered decades ago. People have worked on this. So there is some uh, problem like missing satellite problem and core cast problem and two week to fail problem. This is basically that uh, using lambda CDM model, if you do an n-body simulation and try to compare with the observational data, so you will find that uh, satellite dwarf galaxies uh, predict, uh, predicted to be higher than the observed ones. Uh, the core density of the DM, uh, DM halo at the center has uh, has a cuspy nature instead of a flat uh, in the in-body in simulation. And too big to foil problem is that the D satellite galaxy should have a rich dark matter content, but uh, they are seen to be have a loss, uh, less amount of dark matter content. But uh, there is some controversy that uh, baryonic feedback can actually solve some of these problems. But it is still worth mentioning here because this problem first, when they first arise, people started to look for beyond lambda CDM model. And they, this actually gave rise to these different candidates of the dark matter. So may, very famous one which people have a high hope from is the weakly interacting massive particles, which are called the WIMPs. But uh, now the parameter space of the WIMP is, has already been shrunk to this sweet spot, almost touching this neutrino floor where you can't distinguish whether the collisions are happening from neutrinos or the WIMPs. So then there is this warm dark matter as well as this mixed dark matter where 5% is hot dark matter and 95% is warm dark matter. These two actually kind of solves these problems, but these two actually poses a bigger problem that is the cosmological tension that everyone is talking about from the morning. And there are other uh, candidates as well, like primordial black holes, Akash talked about, as well as axionic dark matter. These are the things, uh, these are the candidates. There are many candidates that has been proposed, but I will not go into the detail. My main motivation of this work was that the, to solve this essay tension that ar arised our motivation towards this work. So my main objective is to convince you that there is a possibility of mass varying dark matter in our universe. But this concept is not very alienated concept in our particle physics models. There have been many models that have been proposed in the past where uh, scalar field is interacting with some fermions and due to the change in the field, the mass of the 
uh, fermions are getting changed. So there are lots of models like this you can find. So, but we will not go into the detail or, or consider a particular specific parti uh, particle physics model. We will take a, instead we will take a empirical, empirical equation of a mass varying dark matter and see its cosmological implications which have not been done before. All of them have done the particle physics side of phenomenology, not the cosmological implications. So as you can see here, here the mass varying dark matter is related to this uh, Z value. So this ZT is the transition redshift so from where the, ma uh, the dark matter starts uh, previous to prior to ZT, the ma dark matter acts as a relativistic particle. And then just after ZT, it becomes non-relativistic. So this capital M is like a, is the final mass. So actually what, uh, what it shows is that it's neither hot or not the, uh, nor warm. So it has two parameters, depends on two parameters to become non-relativistic. That is one is one, a, one is M, and another, another is ZT. We consider fast transition here, and also fast uh, instantaneous non, uh, transition to the non-relativistic side of the dark matter. And also, if you uh, using this assumption, if you, if you calculate the energy density of this mass varying dark matter after becoming non-relativistic, you will find it proportional to PQM. And in this work, we have considered the temperature to be one-tenth of the photon temperature. So now what happens is that prior to ZT, the dark matter is relativistic. So it will uh, put an extra contribution to the delta N effective. So if you look at this plot, here I have plotted uh, with uh, respect to warm dark matter of the same mass, that is 1 keV, and delta Z is taken to be 1. So if you look at this plot, so initially, the dark matter starts, behaves like a uh, relativistic particle. The energy density falls like a relativistic particle. And suddenly, due to the fast transition, at ZT, it jumps. So its energy gets increased. But remember, it's a smooth jump, and then uh, falls like a matter. So you, if you calculate this, you can find this expression. And for our working purposes, we will always consider uh, ZT greater than or equal to 10 to the power 5. And for that, we can evade the stringent bound on the delta N effective that is given from BBN or CMB. Uh, so now I will come to this uh, main part. That is, we have uh, you implemented this model in class and calculated the, all the Boltzmann hierarchy and then tried to uh, plot this matter power spectra. So we have plotted here matter power spectra with respect to lambda CDM. And uh, for reference, we have also given in the dashed line uh, for the warm dark matter model so of the same mass, that is 1 keV. So one in the left panel, we have uh, fixed the mass of the dark matter and uh, changed only the redshifts. And in the right panel, we have fixed the red transition redshift but uh, look for a different mass. So this is actually proves my earlier statements that it indeed depends on two parameters, that is transition redshift and mass. So one thing to look for is that suppression in the uh, higher k value. So suppression in power in the higher k modes, that means the small length, length mode, because of the reason that prior to ZT, the dark matter acts as a relativistic species. So it actually nullifies all the perturbations within its free streaming length. So that's why you get a suppression in the higher K modes. And also in this, in this case, for a fix, uh, for different masses, so for higher mass, it will have a higher thermal velocity after just becoming the non, at the, at the time of the transition redshift. So that is the f highest free streaming length. And so that's why it will uh, starts to uh, drop at a higher K value, uh, sorry, the lower, lower K value. And uh, uh, for red one, you see that it starts after the blue ones. Uh, it starts dropping. So, and also one thing to notice is that if you look at the delta N effective uh, expression, it inversely proportional, proportional to the mass of the dark matter. So, so if you have a lower mass, then that means that you are actually contributing more relativistic energy in the universe prior to ZT. So that's why you see a higher suppression in the uh, in the red curve. So that is what actually differentiates this model from the warm dark matter model. And also one thing to notice for that there is some oscillations in these plots. So that actually comes from because the dark matter was relativistic. 
so that uh, because of that it actually adds an additional drag in the photon baryon plasma so because of that it actually uh, adds a in, uh, additional phase shift in the baryonic acoustic oscillations and that's why you see this wiggle structure and since delta n effective is higher for lower m so the wiggling is more for the lower m so sim similar thing can be uh, seen in the cmb power spectra we have uh, plotted cmb power spectra with respect to lambda cdm for temperature anisotropy as well as the e polarization anisotropy so here you can see the similar thing the suppression of power and as you go to the low as you lower the transition rate shift much more more and more then uh, the suppression of power is gets higher and higher and also the wiggling is due to the phase shift so now i will talk about the sa tension that is the main motivation of our work so i claim that our model will actually suppress the uh, the reduce the SA tension that comes from actually Planck uh, mismatch in the uh, observation from Planck and kids uh, data that is the weak lensing uh, survey data. So there is a almost 2.7 sigma mismatch uh, in the SA. So, so to solve this tension we need to actually reduce the matter fluctuation in the K uh, values from range to 0.1 to 1 H per mega parsec. So now uh, we claim that not only cosmology can allow this mass bearing dark matter, but it also solves the SA tension. So and uh, so we will see that. So for that we ran an MCMC analysis for this. And first we ran for the rate curve. We ran only using the Planck data. And for uh, next one is that we use the Planck plus uh, SA kids data. So for that if you look at this mass plot, you see that for Planck it could not constrain the mass, but for when we add the acid prior, it actually detects the mass of the dark matter, and that means that our model actually favors the uh, weak lensing data. And as well as, if you see that acid plot, there after putting the acid prior, it gets uh, reduced very much. And also, if you look at the ZT plot, the transition plot. The ZT is actually the lower bound comes around 10 to the power 4, so it doesn't hamper the CMB. So, physics point of view, we are safe. So, now if you look at the SA value from lambda CDM, we know it we get 0.832. After uh, our mass bearing dark matter, we add in the lambda CDM parameter model, and only for Planck run, we get 0.823. But after adding SA prior, it reduced even further and we get 0.79. So if you calculate this chi-square, then we get, for Planck it doesn't reduce much, but after putting SA prior, the, it uh, reduces drastically. So uh, we can see, say that our model actually flavors the weak lensing data and uh, our model is better than this uh, lambda CDM model. So I would like to conclude that this mass bearing neutrino actually can evade this uh, stringent bound uh, on delta, delta N effective from C uh, CMB and BVN uh, due to its very uh, small contribution uh, and, uh, prior to the ZT. And also it is due to its uh, radiation like behavior before the transition redshift, we can uh, get a suppression in the power uh, both in matter power spectra as well as the CMB angular power spectra. As well, also due to this del non-zero delta n effective, it adds an additional phase shift in the power spectra. That's why we see those uh, oscillations in the matter power spectra. And also, if you uh, if we run the MCMC, we saw that it reduces the SA tension. And also, with uh, additional uh, in addi addition of the kids data, it actually uh, helps to detect the mass of the dark matter, and that means that it favors the weak lensing data. So I would like to thank you. Thanks, Amran. Uh, time for quick uh, questions. Hi, thanks for the very nice talk. I look forward to the paper in archive. So there's a comment beyond your work. I think, so because you're suppressing the power, you can also look at, uh, I mean, I, I guess you're already doing it, looking at Lyman alpha or even the high yeah, we GW, have a plan. GW we galaxies. Have a plan. So they will also immediately constrain these things yeah. at these scales. That, one H mega parsec yes, inverse yes, and things yes, like yes, that. That's yes, where it's yes. coming. Yeah, we have a plan. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah, very nice. Talk. Thank you. Any other question? All right. If it's not, let's uh, thank Kamlan again and move on. <laughs>
So the next speaker is uh, Jishnu Sai P. Um, he'll be talking about inflationary cross correlations of a non minimal spectator and their soft limits. Hi all. Uh, I would like to first. I would like to thank the organizer for this opportunity. Uh, as the title suggests, I'm going to talk about inflationary cross correlation of a non-minimal spectators and their soft limits. Uh, this is our recent work that I have done with my supervisor Rajiv Kumar Jain, and which appeared recently in Jack Hep. Uh, we know that in the inflation uh, in a simple model is effectively described by a single scalar field, but there's a plenty of uh, other motivation to consider light degrees of freedom present during inflation. So we call such a light degrees of freedom as spectators. And here in this work, we consider a specific kind of uh, non-minimal spectators and its cross correlations with inflationary perturbation, say like scalar and tensor. And we study such a cross correlations in the particular limits. So our work actually motivated around in the context of inflationary magnetogenesis. In that context, the large scale magnetic field is assumed to be originated in the context of inflation. And in that case, you can identify that spectator with the gauge field. And uh, people have been studying the cross correlations with such gauge fields with, uh, with uh, curvature perturbations and the tensor perturbations and the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, more importantly, back in 2012, uh, this people, Jane and Sloth, has identified a particular consistency relation associated to these three-point functions. That is, if you consider the cross correlation of uh, curvature perturbations with the two powers of the magnetic field, if you take the squeeze to the limit, that means the momenta of the curvature perturbations going to the zero, that's what I meant by the soft limit. In that limit, you will see that these three point functions will take the form of product of two two point functions. And other than this kinematical factor of momenta conservation, there will be an effective strength. That strength is completely determined by the direct coupling of this gauge field, which is denoted by lambda here, and the dot denotes the cos time derivative with respect to the cosmic time, and it is the Hubble parameter. And these kind of things can be achieved by using full field theoretic calculation and taking the limit. But uh, people have also shown that there exists a semi-classical way of obtaining this result uh, by using the conformal nature of the gauge field. So this poses a question whether such kind of uh, three-point functions can be studied uh, uh, studied from the context of conformal nature, or is it the case with the usual Maldasena kind of consistency relation? So to explore this question, we construct a setup. In that setup, we generalize the context of uh, inflationary magnetogenesis. So we consider a, a non-minimal spectator. What I mean by non-minimal is that such a spectator is actually directly coupled to the inflaton. In that case, we study these three-point functions. So in general, we don't have to use the specific form of this Lagrangian. We show that uh, the, the properties of the Lagrangian is independent of the consistency relation. So this can be uh, elaborated in next slides. But however, uh, if you want to do verify it in the full field theoretic form, you have to assume the specific form of L sigma. So let's move on. Uh, it's the same uh, for the electromagnetic case. You will have the electromagnetic Lagrangian and this lambda. Okay. Uh, it's because you have to amplify. Because of the conformal nature, you cannot produce the magnetic field in the early universe, right? So you have to break the conformal invariance. That's why it's time dependent. Or it's. Well, the coupling is time independent. Right? No, time dependent. It's coupled to inflaton. The phi is inflaton. Okay. So they are exchanging the energies. So that's what I was trying to say. So, so without assuming the specific form of L sigma, we can make a lot of general claim. For example, if you want to study the correlator zeta sigma sigma, in that case, you can talk about the interaction Hamiltonian associated to such, such interaction Hamiltonian can be written in this form. The T minu is the energy moment and tensor of this uh, spectator. And delta G minu is the inflationary perturbations, which can be obtained from symbol ADM 
decomposition. From the ADM, you could see that the, the first two terms urge us to do a lot of integration by parts with respect to time and space. So if you do this integration by parts, and you, will, you can write the total interaction Hamiltonian in this fashion. So the rest of the terms are slow roll suppressed. And this interaction Hamiltonian is proportional to your curvature perturbation. And this is the Hubble parameter. And this is actually the total four divergence of the energy moment of the tensor. So we can make a general claim, claim that if the four divergence of the energy moment of the tensor of the spectator is zero, so this correlator is slow roll suppressed. If you want a large signal, then it should be beyond the usual uh, minimal setup. So in our case, uh, without assuming L sigma, we can compute what will be the four divergence of this energy momentum tensor by demanding the diffeomorphic invariance of this action. So if you, if you can do it very easily, and you could see that this four divergence is actually proportional to the four, gra four gradient of this direct coupling. So this will allow us to think about the interaction Hamiltonian. And from the interaction Hamiltonian perspective, we can think of some semi-classical method to calculate such a three-point functions. So I will use a actional perspective, so the semi-classical derivation. What I mean by the semi-classical is that using the two-point function, can you compute the three-point functions in the squeezer limit? So to think about it, what I mean by is you have an interaction Hamilton, you have an interaction action. If you take the squeezer limit, can you map by a reparameterization whether can you make this action into a quadratic level? Then you are through. So from the two-point function, you can reconstruct the squeezer interaction Hamilton, you know. So in our case, for example, this is the interaction action. So in the interaction action, we supply our earlier result. You will see that this will be your, your interaction action. And if you can map lambda to this, so if you know the two-point functions for any lambda, then you can construct this three-point functions out of uh, new redefined lambda. So this is how we determine, because we, we compute the two-point functions in the modulated long wavelength L, and we will compute it. So in more detail, if you want to be in a bit more clarity, we can do it in the flat gauge. So in the flat gauge, you can write the interaction action as in this form. So the first actions come from uh, Taylor expanding the coupling in terms of inflaton, and this is the first term in, the, in that interaction, the rest uh, in the flat gauge, gravity is not dynamical. So rest of the interaction coming from laps and shifts. So you could show that laps and shifts are slow roll suppressed. So the other interaction Hamilton, other interaction terms are slow roll suppressed. So the leading order term is given by this. So what we are asking is that can you compute the two point function sigma sigma in the background of long wavelength delta phi L. So you can do that. You can absorb the effect of lambda in this fashion. So if you know any two point functions with respect to any lambda, so by redefining the coupling, you can reconstruct this three point function. So that's what I said. Uh, so this three point functions, you two point functions, you tailor expand, then you correlated with the delta phi L, you obtain this three point functions in the squeeze limit as before. And you could see that the structure is same and the same structure will come down. So this is nothing to do with, the, so far we have never assumed the form of the spectator Lagrangian. So this fact is actually independent of the spectator's specific nature. So this is a consequence of direct deletonic coupling. So this consistency relation is a consequence of direct uh, direct coupling. That's what we want to mention. So, so that's what I have already highlighted. So then, if you want to verify whether these claims are correct or not, you can do it with the full field theoretic calculation. In order to do that, you can assume this Lagrangian is minimal or non-minimal, conformal, non-conformal, or even we can try with the non-minimal derivative coupling, and we, we may get something surprising in, while, uh, while we are coming. So in the full field theoretic calculation, we assume, as I said, we, 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 we consider, other than this direct deletonic coupling, we also consider the non-minimal to curvature tensor, curve, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky tensor as well as Ricky scalar, and we, for the simplicity, we consider the quadratic potential for the spectator. And uh, as I was telling, it was motivated around in the context of inflationary magnetogenesis. In that case, we usually assume the power law direct coupling. So if you assume, if you throw all these details into, and you can usually do the usual mode expansion and use the interaction Hamiltonian and perform the three-point function. If you perform the three-point functions, for an illustration purpose, if you turn off the non-minimal derivative coupling, I can show that this three-point function is proportional to the usual momentum conservation plus three integrals. So the I1 and I2 are coming from the uh, kinetic part, particularly I1 come from the temporal derivative, I2 come from the gradient part, and I3 come from the massive kind of terms. 
So if you want to study the squeeze limit, you could see that in the squeeze limit, zeta is, you can, we are, what we are trying to say that the soft limit of zeta will give you that zeta is frozen in the super horizon. And if you use the equation of motion and the constancy of zeta, if you stare enough, you could see that this factor is already contained these two factors. So if you do the, so for, while converting into the PDF, I lost a lot of modulus. So here is mod zeta square, mod sigma square, plus my claim is that I1 actually contains I2 and I3. So in the, in the, in the full, full result, if you take the squeeze limit, and if you, if you assume this identity, I1 contains I2 and I3, you could see that there is an exact cancellation between I2 and I3. And it's not taking any asymptotic limit. It's exact for any time. You could show that this three-point functions in the squeeze limit is actually proportional to 2n. And the 2n is actually identified as lambda dot over h lambda. So then I was, what I was trying to say earlier, if you, if you turn on even the non-minimal derivative coupling, this result doesn't change. OK? So, so I think so far so good. Um, so next thing I want to tell about, if you turn on the non-minimal derivative coupling, you could see that uh, uh, we can also try to compute what is gamma, sigma, sigma also. So and we can say that uh, uh, we can also study the squeeze limit associated to such a consistency relations. And, but compared to the scalar consistency relation, we know that tensor consistency relations are universal. They are never violated unless you have an anisotropic background. So since your background is isotropic, you expect tensor consistency relation to be valid. In that case, one usually assumes the assumption that the tensor perturbations are adiabatic. So what I mean by adiabaticity? So adiabatic mode, what I mean is it is actually locally distinguishable from a coordinate transformations. And, and here, in the presence of non-minimal derivative coupling, you can say that you are not really a, in an adiabatic mode. You can distinguish the superhorizon, frost, and tensor modes. So then the question is that if you compute the cross-correlation of tensor perturbations with the spectators, you could see that you will get this result. And if you do the usual Maldacena kind of approach, you will get this result. So the only difference between these two results is this factor. And this, this factor will be there if alpha is turned on. So in the presence of alpha is the strength of non-minimal derivative coupling. So what I was trying to say is that uh, we can turn the argument around. So if you have a superhorizon frozen gamma, or the tensor perturbation, and if you have a violation of usual consistency relation or usual soft theorems, you can say that there exists a, a signature of non-minimal derivative coupling. That's what we have done. OK, so these are the summary. So the consistency relations derived for cosmic magnetic fields are generalized to any absolute dialectonic coupled spectators. And we show that the tens, uh, such a consistency relations are a simple consequence of dialectonic coupling. And uh, this is also, there is also associated nonlinearity parameter, which we have also computed. We have also computed the tensor co cross correlation in a toy model, demonstrated a violation of the usual tensor consistency relation with a non minimal derivative coupling, even though background is isotropic. So then this violation actually turned around and say that uh, this might be a distinctive, distinctive signature in the presence of such a non minimal derivative couplings. I hope I'm on time. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks, Vishnu. Uh, questions? I yeah. just have one comment. I think in the beginning you started saying that it was gauge coupling, but it's actually a dilettron coupling to the Maxwell action. I think that's what you actually mean, I think, right? Uh, gauge, the, OK, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just, sorry. That, yeah, so the lambda is the thing that couples to the Maxwell's action, not yeah. a gauge, OK. No, I, I said it's coupled to the gauge field. No, but you said gauge coupling once. That's why I felt that oh, it should I'm be sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 if I said so, I'm sorry. <laughs> but here it's very clear. It's yeah. dilettronic coupling. Yeah. Thanks. Very nice talk. Thank you. Any other questions? Have you connected with observations? No. Nope. The first line says cosmic negative field can be generated, are, uh -huh. are generalized. Uh, no, uh, what I meant is that the consistency relation derived for magnetic fields are generalized. So how do you connect it to real observations? OK, so so far this this has been a theoretical one. I haven't, uh, so this is, this is a generic question coming from the magnetic field, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we, we we thought about considering this in the case of this an isocurvature mode for
for example, if you have a, this kind of spectators present during inflation, they will be imprinted as an ISO curvature in your, in your CMB perturbation or something. So if that ISO curvature is directly coupled to the adiabatic part, so then this can be connected. That's the zeroth order thought we had on this from an observational perspective. Okay. You also had three-point function calculations, right? Yep. So but we don't have an observation of magnetic field that's right. or any other isocurvature yeah, mode, that, that, right? That, we have only right. constraints, right? Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. What exactly is the question? The question is, <laughs> how will you connect it to observations? That's, uh, is, is, is that, that sufficient, that is, whatever I said that, is? That's sufficient. Oh, fine. Uh, any other question? So one thought is that uh, if the spectator is an isocurvature field, all these three-point functions are essentially the non-gaussianities, which are induced by the cross-correlations of a adiabatic mode with the isocurvature mode. Okay, and if you think of just a just a naive expansion of a, of a, of your uh, fluctuations into an adiabatic and isocurvature mode, and if you start computing the two-point and the three-point function, these cross-correlations will come at some some point. If you compute the uh, the three-point functions, okay. And so this actually provides a way to at least estimate in some models. And maybe you can use, uh, you know, the con of course, there are no constraints on the non-gaussianities of the isocurvatures, OK? So this is something, you know, one can keep doing theoretically at least to understand the level of uh, non-gaussianities which could come from the isocurvature modes. Uh, any other questions? If there aren't any, then uh, let's thank Jishnu and uh, move on. Next speaker is uh, Soumya Deep Basak. Um, he'll be talking about constraints on primordial black holes from gravitational wave microlensing. Too much of PBH stuff in. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm Swamili. So today I'll be talking about uh, the constraints on primordial black holes from gravitational wave microlensing. And this work was done with the collaboration with all the people mentioned here under the uh, supervision of Ajit at ICTS, who is present, present here. And uh, uh, for your reference, uh, this is the link of our paper, which got published last year. OK. So quickly, in the introduction, we know uh, almost 25% of the mass energy content of the universe is filled with an unknown form of matter, uh, which is known to us as dark matter. This interacts only via gravity. So in our work, what we do, uh, we, we consider if a significant fraction of this dark matter is in the form of compact objects like br uh, uh, black, black holes of primordial origin, they can cause microlensing effects in the gravitational wave signals, potentially observable by LIGO and Virgo. <clears throat> and in our work, uh, we use the, uh, from the non-observation of these microlensing signatures in the binary black hole events from the uh, O1, O2, and O3A observing runs, we try to constrain the fraction of dark matter which are made of these primordial black holes in the mass range 100 to 100,000 solar mass. So this quantity FDM, which is actually FPBH, uh, is the quantity of interest. This, uh, if it is, it varies from zero to one. So if it is one, it means that all the dark matter is in the form of primordial black holes. Uh, fine. So uh, what uh, I just mentioned about microlensing of GW. So what is uh, this thing? So basically, uh, uh, um, uh, um, so basically lensing means it's the deflection of uh, light or in our case gravity, uh, gravitational waves. It's the bending of gravitational waves due to the presence of a of an intervening mass, uh, massive object. So in our case, we, um, uh, uh, in the mass range that I mentioned previously uh, before, 100 to 100,000 solar mass range, we consider the microlensing of GWs. So in, uh, in the case of microlensing, it basically says that the, uh, the f uh, it gets a frequency dependent magnification or modulation of the unlensed waveform. So if we have a GW uh, gravitational waveform in the frequency domain, it gets modified due to the presence of uh, an intervening object, and this is solely characterized by the mass, or the rather the redshifted lens, uh, redshifted lens mass, and one more parameter that is called the dimensionless source position, that is uh, 
denoted by y. So it roughly means the 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 uh, the separation of uh, the position of the source from the from your line of sight. So in in a dimensionless way. So uh, so having said that, the lens waveform looks uh, frequency dependent magnification times the unless waveform. So here I am showing you the uh, the unless wave uh, unless waveform as well as the lens waveforms. Uh, due to the presence of several lens masses, keeping the y parameter to fixed at one. So wh what we get to see here, this is the unless waveform in the gray color. And when we have, uh, if we introduce lensing due to the pres presence of hundred or thousand solar mass lenses, the waveform gets modulated, modulated in this way. What we get to see here more, the more the mass of the lenses, the modulation is more. This is what is expected. And the left hand side shows uh, the frequency domain waveform and the right-hand side uh, shows the time domain waveform. Fine. So, so far I just, I showed uh, how the waveforms will look. But in reality, what we have is the data detected in our detectors, LIGO and Virgo, uh, detectors like LIGO and Virgo. So how do you quantify the lensing signature of these signals detected by our interferometers or detectors? To do so, uh, we, uh, we define a quantity called odds ratio. This is, uh, this, or this is actually a degree of belief of one hypothesis to be true from the other. So in our case, we have two hypotheses. The signal is length. This is the HL hypothesis, and the signal is unlensed. That is the HU hypothesis. So the odds ratio is defined as the posterior probability of this lensed hypothesis to be true given the data over the posterior probability of the unlensed hypothesis to be true given the data. This can be further decomposed into two quantities. The first quantity is called the prior beliefs of these two hypotheses, and the second quantity is called the, uh, called the base factor. So uh, we, get, uh, we get, uh, get, get these base factors or, uh, or odds ratio by doing something called parameter esti estimation. Uh, I will be talking about this later. And uh, uh, for lens signals, or the signals to be lensed, we, uh, we need to have these odds ratio uh, to be much, much greater than one, or in terms of base factor, if we uh, say, the, then the base factors should be much, much greater than one. Fine. So I just told about this uh, uh, Bayesian analysis. So when we act practically do this Bayesian analysis, analysis, we do this parameter estimation. Uh, first, let me talk about what I'm showing here. So the, here I'm showing here, uh, showing here 18 GW events that were detected in the observing runs O1 and O2. And we have done parameter estimation of these 18 GW events using both unlensed and lens templates. And the left hand, uh, the left side of, uh, or the left plot shows uh, the posterior distribution of the lens mass uh, for all these 18 GW events that are mentioned here. And the upper uh, horizontal axis shows the log of the base factor for all these events mentioned here. So the, what we see here, the maximum of base factor that we see here is 0 0.2, uh, where is it? Yeah, 0 0.2 in log 10 scale or 0 0.5 in log E scale. So this shows that the base factors are not significant or high enough for the lensing hypothesis to be true. And one more thing to notice here that we don't see any uh, constrained posterior, uh, recovered posterior on all these 18 GW events. On the other hand, if we look at the right-hand side of this plot, here we, what we have done here, uh, in a Gaussian-like uh, um, uh, uh, noise, we have injected a signal of uh, like GW150914 like signal. We have injected that and we have tried to, rec we have recovered this using both unlensed and lens templates. And this is very, um, this shows a very similar pattern um, of this GW150914 this is the actual signal, and this is an injected signal. And this is an unless uh, signal or injection. And uh, similarly, this, this is the base factor, which doesn't support our lensing hypothesis to be true. On the other hand, this, this is an actual, uh, this is a uh, lensed injected signal, and we have, uh, uh, we have done the parameter estimation using both lensed and un unlensed hypothesis. And if you look at the base factor value, this is sig significantly high, it, which is like 21.6, I guess. Or, uh, um, or 26.7 in log E scale. And also we see a narrower posterior distribution on the lens mass scale. So this, sh this shows the degree of belief to do this uh, uh, parameter estimation or uh, to believe this um, 
base factor thing or hypothesis um, or ratio thing. Fine. So this, uh, so far I've shown you the 18 GW events that were detected till O2 observing them. But if we also consider the uh, the, the O3A events, there we, uh, we have found 36 GW events. So now we have total 54 GW events, and people have done um, in in the lensing community similar uh, uh, parameter estimation analysis. And there also, they have found the maximum of base factor was found to be 1.15. This also shows no compelling evidence of microlensing. So this is the this is the cumulative histogram plot of the log base factor of the 54 GW events that were detected till O3A. And uh, fine. So this says that no lens compelling evidence of microlensing was found. So if we know this, uh, if, if we have this data, then what we can do? We can compute the posterior of the fraction of lensing events. How do you do that? So we have this information that we have uh, uh, detected 54 GW events till O3A, and we have found no lens detection. That is NL equal to zero. NL is the number of lens events. Then we can, we can, if we have these two information, we can combine that to find a single piece of information that is called the lensing fraction, which is defined in this way, lambda L over lambda, where lambdas represent the, um, uh, uh, represents the um, Poisson expected counts for this uh, uh, for the total events and for the lens events. So what I mean here, we have to assume something. We assume that the uh, total events and the lens events follow a Poisson distribution with a mean of 54 in the case of total events and in a mean of zero in the case of lens events. So if you know the, uh, the uh, and in that case, that is called the likelihood. And if you know the likelihood, we can uh, construct the post uh, posterior distribution of these events. So here I'm showing the posterior distribution of the total events and the lens events. And if we can construct these, the posteriors of these events, total events and lens events, we can cal calculate uh, to uh, the uh, pos uh, posterior distribution of the lens events ratio. Fine. So if you know the posterior distribution of uh, of the of the lensing ratio, how do you translate that? to find the posterior distribution on the fraction of compact dark matter. So this is the data that we have till O3A. Then we just need to do, um, uh, th uh, this is the only equation that I'll be showing. If we have uh, this, quanti uh, this quantity, this is actually data driven. So the data that we have right now, 54 total events are observed and no len lens event is there. And uh, so to go from this space to this space, we need one more quantity. This is called the Jacobian. This is, co this is our search sensitivity how sensitively we can do our search to find the lensing fraction Jacobian. This is called the lensing fraction Jacobian. And this is how we relate the lens driven ratios posterior distribution to the posterior distribution of the compact dark matter, given the data. Fine. So to find the second quantity, which is the uh, Jacobian, we, we uh, create our, cre uh, we mi mimic the universe in our computer system. How do you do that? Uh, we generate a population of binary black holes to find the detectable lens events. And we start by simulating a population BBH following some astrophysical, realistic astrophysical models. And we assume these primordial black holes, which are the lenses here, are distributed uniformly in co-moving volume. And how do we define, uh, define uh, the lens events in our case uh, when we are doing this astrophysical simulation? We, when we have generated uh, many, many number of uh, GW events, those events which are uh, uh, which are crossing this threshold value that I've just that I've sh uh, shown here in this plot, the maximum was found to be 1.15. We consider that to be our threshold, and for those events which are crossing this threshold, we consider them to be uh, detectable lens events. And we, uh, when we know these things, we compute the fraction of detectable lens events for different values of this compact dark matter fraction or the FPVH or FDM in my notation. Fine. So when, uh, after doing all these simulations and all, I'm showing you the results. Uh, here we have computed the lensing fraction U as a function of FDM. So these three plots show uh, this lens. Okay, yeah, I have three more slides. The lensing fraction is a function of FDM for three different choices of source redshift distribution. And here we have considered uh, four different choices of monochromatic lens mass function. And uh, these different line styles correspond to different choices of PSD for O3A, O2, and O1 observing lens, respectively. Fine. So when we know these two pieces of information, we can translate that to find the posterior on FDM. So here, I'm showing 
for uh, four different choices of uh, phonochromatic lens mass functions for three different choices of source redshift distribution. And here, we, uh, I'm showing uh, this posterior on the FDM, assuming two different priors on lambda and lambda L, if you remember these two definitions. The flat prior correspond to the solid curves and the Jeffries prior correspond to the dotted curves. And these uh, uh, dotted or the circle circles represent their 90% upper limit with or the with 90% credibility. Fine. So when you knew when we know all these things uh, in the previous plot, I've shown you for four different choices of lens masses. But in this plot, it, this is called the exclusion plot. Here I'm, uh, we have shown uh, uh, an extended version of that in the mass range 100 to 100,000 solar masses mass range. Uh, FDM, uh, the upper limit on FDM. So for different choices of prior, the left part uh, is for flat, and uh, the right part is for the Jeffries prior choice. Uh, for different choices of prior and for different choices of the source redshift distribution, what we are getting is from 50, roughly from 50 to 80 percent is the upper limit on FDM. And uh, fine. So this 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 is the bound that we have got so far till O3A, and this shows a future roughly a future bound. Uh, so right now, uh, we, are, we were here, uh, 50 to 80 percent. This is for a particular choice. Th in this case, it's, uh, we have shown here for 1,000 solar mass range. And uh, this, is, this shows the projected bounds on FDM uh, with the expected number of more uh, GW events in the future. So O4 is the current, or, uh, current observing run, uh, or, the, or the ongoing run. And uh, assuming that no lens event was will be detected, we can project uh, how FDM will improve in the future uh, with, the ex uh, with the ongoing run. So this is about the future work. And in summary, uh, non-observation of microlensing signatures uh, in GWs helps us put the upper bound on FDM. And the limits depend on the assumed redshift distribution of binary black holes as well as the Bayesian priors used in the analysis. Nevertheless, we are able to place upper bounds on FDM in the range 50 to 80 percent. And these bounds will get significantly better in the next few years with the increased number of events and also with increased lensing optical depth. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for your patience. Thanks, Samadhi. Uh, questions? Yeah, I think I missed. Can you go to the constant plot that you're showing for PBH? Uh, yes, what is this WB that you're showing? Oh, these are some of the existing constraints coming from the EM observations. W means wide binaries. OK, OK, OK. Oh. And uh, in your, I think, third slide uh, someplace, uh, can you go back? Yes. So here, uh, in the left plot, hmm. uh, why suddenly changing this uh, lens mass from 100 to 1,000, there is like this oscillations coming in? Uh, you mean the right hand side or left? Left, left, left hand side. Ha, huh, this is uh, uh, because lensing becomes dominant then. OK. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Uh, just a curiosity, this is probably beyond your work. Do you mm -hmm. know if somebody has done uh, lensing of PBHs when they're clustered? With a cluster? Yeah, when, when, they're, when they're clustered. When so they're clustered. Clustered PBHs. We will talk about uh, some, due to some <coughs> inflationary things, you can have PBHs in more more in a cluster, and what happens with these lensing constraints? Um, I mean, Ajit, do you know this? I, I so this people are looking at the case of quasar, quasar lensing, quasar micro lensing. Yes. And the, at least the one study I have seen that the clustering effect is not no, uh, very significant. Significant, yeah. so, so do you know, has anybody done this for gravitational waves? Uh, not for gravitational waves, sorry. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, uh, so for quantifying the preference of the model uh, for a data, you uh, defined some quantity which is prior odds times the base factor. Right. So, uh, but in your in your plot for different events, you showed the base factor, right? Yeah. So why did you define this quantity? Uh, because? Um, I said either in terms of base factor or in terms of like, odds, this is called the odds ratio. So to get the odds ratio, you need to have the knowledge of prior odds. So uh, you can consider that your lensing hypothesis is equally probable as your unlensed hypothesis. But we have worked with uh, uh, base factor here. Whatever you are seeing is the, are the base factors instead of the, the odds ratio. OK, so here you don't take the prior odds. Um, uh, we don't. We okay. haven't taken this. OK, OK, thanks.
uh, you showed that uh, there is a frequency dependent uh, yeah magnification so what is the like lowest mass one can probe by a gravitational microlensing of gravitational waves like what is the lowest mass um, i mean um, technically you, uh, in our study we have considered this mass range 100 to 100000 so right. the, the right. choice of this 100 um, is to just to um, consider that uh, uh, that lensing will be sufficient enough that you can get a different uh, uh, posterior distribution on FDM which will be different than the prior on FDM. If you go below 100 solar mass, then your lensing will not be sufficient enough that it can distinguish your lens signal from your unlens signal. It will look something like this. So if you have an unlensed here, the lens will be like very much overlapping with the, the, the lens one. Thanks. All right, let's move on and thank uh, Shamati once again. Thank you. Um, last talk of this session is uh, Shubhadi Bori. And he'll be talking about the first search for high energy neutrinos from galaxy mergers. So yeah, so hello everyone. I am Swadeep from IIT Bangalore. So firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my work here. So this project, I am working with Priyank, Mausumi Ma'am, and Ranjan. So uh, for centuries, we have understood the universe by observations using light or photons. But uh, however, uh, recent advancement, uh, recent advancement in neutrino astronomy have allowed us to see the universe through neutrino eyes. So recently, IceCube, a neutrino telescope located at South Pole or not, uh, observed a diffuse neutrino flux from every direction of the sky. And currently, the exact sources of these uh, neutrinos remain a mystery. And also, it is, pointing, uh, it is pointing out that there are actually hadronic accelerators in the universe which are far more energetic and complex than we previously thought about. So this work is regarding the search for high energy astrophysical neutrinos from ice cube, uh, observed by ice cube from galaxy mergers. So why, are, uh, why we are interested in uh, neutrinos? To uh, uh, understand this question, we have to go to the cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are uh, charged nuclei, which are hitting our Earth in every second uh, from every di direction in billions and billions number. So one of the big questions in physics is what are the sources of these cosmic rays and the acceleration mechanism behind it? So you, you can see here that this is the plot of the uh, flux of the cosmic rays versus energy. So the x-axis is the number of particle detected per meter square per second per steridian per GeV, and the y-axis is in energy, uh, x-axis is energy in electron volts. Okay, so you can see that both, in both x-axis and y-axis, there are lots of orders of magnitude variation. Okay, and the highest energy we can produce in our mankind is at LHC, that is 13.6 collision, 13.6 uh, TeV collision energy, which is something around here. And the highest energetic cosmic ray particle we detected is around 10 to the power 20 EV. So there is a six or seven order magnitude of difference. So nature knows some ways to accelerate these particles that we do not understand yet. So the problem is with the cosmic ray particle is these are charged nuclei, okay. So they get bent in uh, galactic or intergalactic magnetic field. So using these particles, we actually cannot trace back from exactly where these are coming from. But these cosmic ray particles can interact with the matter or radiation inside or near the source to produce gamma rays and neutrinos. So gamma rays can travel in a straight path, but the problem with the gamma rays is if it is very high energetic, then it can interact with the CMB photons, which are very large in number, to uh, produce electron and positron. So thus, the signal can be attenuated. So for an example, uh, one PV gamma ray can at most travel a distance of 10 kilo per second. So if you ever detect a gamma ray uh, sitting at Earth, you are sure that it is not coming from another galaxy because the mean free path length of one PV is 10 kilo per second, which is roughly the radius of our Milky Way. On the other hand, the neutrinos are chargeless, so they do not get bent into magnetic, uh, in magnetic field, and they are very weakly interacting. So they are the perfect ideal messengers 
using those, like uh, we can prove from where exactly the uh, new cosmic, uh, from exactly where they are coming from. So the idea of this work is to understand these neutrinos to understand the source of the cosmic rays. So here the, uh, in this cartoon diagram, the source is a uh, black hole and this is a uh, Fermi light gamma telescope. So yeah, so the idea is to understand these neutrinos to understand the source of this cosmic rays and the acceleration mechanism behind it. Okay, so uh, we have a fantastic uh, detector neutron telescope located at South Cube, uh, South Pole. Okay, so this is a cubic kilometer detector. So you go to the South Pole, uh, you put, uh, you pour hot water, dig some holes, you put some strings with digital optical modules. So these digital optical modules are uh, like your sensors, which can detect light. So how it can, uh, how is this uh, working? I'm, uh, I will tell. So uh, in this picture, this is our Earth. So this is a, uh, the South Pole here, and this is ice cube, and the vertical strings are there, and the digital optical modules are de deployed here. So it happens that when neutrino is passing through the detector, or uh, anywhere in the Earth, it can interact with the nuclei of that uh, constituent medium. So here it is ice. So when neutrino passes through the detector, it can produce an associated charged lepton. So if it is a muon neutrino, it will produce a muon. So this muon are long-lived particle, so it will uh, travel a long distance in the medium. So in the ice cube, it is ice. So while uh, traversing through this detect uh, this ice medium, the uh, speed of this uh, muon is faster than the uh, speed of light in in that in the uh, I mean in the here it is ice. Okay. So thus it can uh, produce Cherenkov light. So which is which is in a optical region. So it is a bluish kind of uh, bluish light. So these digital optical modules can detect the light here. So it is like a, uh, there is a dark room and uh, some strings are there and lights are uh, deployed in the strings. So uh, if you throw an object, so if it hits the lights, the li the bulbs will get light enough. So it's kind of that thing. So using the directionality uh, of this uh, muon, we can actually tell the directionality of the parent neutrino with an uncertainty. So uh, we'll use this muon neutrino events because they have a uh, better angular resolution to search for the, uh, to, to, to see if these neutrinos are coming from the galaxy margin. So this is the current status of the uh, astrophysical neutrino sources. So this is the flux versus energy plot. So in the y-axis, this is the flux multiplied with energy square. So this is in TeV per centimeter square per second. And the x-axis is the energy in GeV. So here the gray band and the brown data points are the observed astrophysical neutrino flux from uh, muon track events and combined electron and tau cascade events respectively. So, and this, the purple band and the orange band are the flux of T uh, NGC1068 and TXS0506 plus 056. So these are two confirmed neutrino sources by ice cube. So NGC1068 is a uh, safer galaxy and TXS 0506 plus 056 is a blazer. So you can see here that the flux of these uh, two confirmed sources is way too below than this uh, observed astrophysical diffuse neutrino flux, right? So it is roughly 1% of the observed diffuse flux. So you can ask me like, uh, what about the other sources like this uh, NGC 1068 and this blazer? So there have been studies which have uh, taken into account all the safer galaxies like NGC 1068 and like these blazers separately. And it has been shown that up to 30% you can produce the uh, diffuse flux that has been observed by ice cube. So the, then the question is remaining that what are the other classes of sources that are actually contributing to this diffuse flux? So these are the proposed neutrino sources in the literature. So the people have searched in blazers, GRBs, AGNs, uh, nebulae, uh, ch choke jet, supernova, FRBs and many, many more classes. So uh, here we want to ask a question, like what if the galaxy mergers are actually contributing to these high energy neutrinos that has uh, been observed by ice cube. So these are some theoretical papers uh, which have shown that it is indeed possible that these galaxy mergers can produce uh, gamma rays, high energy gamma rays and neutrinos up to 10 to the power 17 EV. So this is a, a cartoon diagram. So we know the galaxy mergers are like when two galaxies, galaxies are in a merging state and there is a baryonic tidal disruption uh, there. So here two galaxies are merging and at the core region where, uh, at the region where these, are, uh, these two galaxies are merging, so strong shocks can be formed 
and thus the cosmic ray particles, so this, this is basically proton, the hydrogen, will get accelerated. But these accelerated protons will move through the interstellar medium of the galaxy, right? So that, uh, then it can hit another proton to produce pi plus pi minus or pi zero. So this pi plus pi minus can decay into neutrinos. So the, I, uh, so, so the, so the theoretical motivation is telling us that the high energy neutrinos can come from this galaxy merger and we can observe uh, sitting at Earth using ice cube data. So we'll look into this. So uh, what we are trying to do, we have taken two sky maps. So this is the, this is, these two sky maps are in celestial coordinate system. The x-axis is the array and the y-axis is the declination. So the left side uh, sky map is telling that how many neutrino numbers are coming from that direction per square degree in that sky map. So here is the color bar. And the right hand side, uh, we have uh, taken six different catalogs. So these are the uh, positions of the different uh, galaxy mergers in the sky map. Okay. So these colors are different for uh, different catalogs. So we have used six different catalogs. So we want to see here that what is the statistical angular correlation, statistical correlation between these two sky maps. And we have used 10 years of MION uh, ice cube track events data. So uh, to see that, we have done two types of analysis. So one is single source analysis, where you look at the sky, you know the exact location of a galaxy merger, and you try to see what is, uh, what is the number of neutrinos can come from that uh, particular galaxy merger. And another is uh, this stacking analysis, where we add up the signal contribution from each galaxy mergers to see as a whole what is the flux contribution from the galaxy mergers totally. So to do that, we have to do some uh, statistical robust analysis. We have defined a test statistic. So this is basically the logarithmic ratio of two hypotheses. So one is telling that neutrinos are coming from the galaxy mergers, and the another is saying that the neutrinos are not coming from the galaxy merger. So NS is the uh, parameter which is telling that how many neutrinos are coming from the galaxy merger. So it is NS equals to zero. So it is our uh, null hypothesis, that denominator here. So uh, there is a theorem in the statistics. Uh, it's called Wilkes, Wilkes theorem, which tells us that if your data follows the null hypothesis, so here it means that neutrinos are not coming from the galaxy mergers, then uh, the maximized these test statistics will follow a chi-square distribution. And the degree of the freedom, uh, degrees of freedom of this chi-square will be the difference of three parameters in these two hypotheses. So here we have a fixed uh, number in it, so you only have uh, one free parameter. So if, we, if our data follows the null hypothesis, then uh, it, it will follow a chi-1 square distribution. So what we have done, we have taken each galaxy mergers, we have defined the TS for each galaxy mergers, we have uh, maximized these TS statistics varying this NS, and we have a distribution of the TS maximum. Now, if, you're, uh, if a data, if a random variable x follows a chi-1 square distribution, then root square x will follow a uh, normal distribution. So this is the result of the, uh, the uh, we have the distribution of this root ts max. So this y-axis is logarithmic scale. So we, we can see that uh, our data is following actually the uh, normal hypothesis, uh, normal distribution. So it is implying that the neutrinos are not coming from the galaxy mergers. Okay. So next we have uh, calculated we have ranked the galaxy mergers according to their significance. So he here we have plotted the flux versus energy. So this energy in GeV, and the flux is in uh, GeV per, uh, flux is multiplied with energy square, and this unit is in GeV per centimeter square per second. So here are the five uh, most significant galaxy mergers neutrino flux upper limit we have calculated. So I have just chosen random energy, so these are basically lines, straight lines, and here we have assumed that the flux is following a spectral index of minus two. So basically the flux is proportional to energy to the power minus two here. And this NGC 1068 and this uh, TXS 056, 0506 plus 056 flux is actually, uh, we have uh, shown here just for comparison. And uh, this is the uh, result from the stacking analysis. So the y-axis is again the flux multiplied with energy square in GeV per centimeter square per second per steridian, and the x-axis is in energy. And uh, we have taken three different models. So uh, for three different spectral indices, so uh, this flux is proportional to the e to the power gamma here. So gamma is minus 2, minus 3, and minus 2.53. So this minus 2 is motivated by the Fermi acceleration mechanism, and minus 2.53 is motivated because the astrophysical neutron flux measured by ice cube follows this spectral index. And this minus three is actually uh, 
because of the astrophysical neutron flux uh, is close to this minus 3. And this green band and the uh, black data points are basically the observed total diffuse flux from muon neutrino event and combined electron and tau neutrino event. So here you can see that the flux of all, the, all these three models is actually way too below this uh, than this observed flux. So uh, if you see at here 10 to the power 5 GeV, this gamma equals to minus 2 is not even uh, contributing 1% of the total diffuse flux. So here we are concluding that uh, actually we have, uh, there is no galaxy merger in the catalogs which are significant that it, uh, it can uh, emit neutrinos and the uh, gamma rays, uh, I mean, we have analyzed uh, in using this uh, stacking analysis and we have found that actually these are, uh, the contribution is very less. So yeah, this is all I had, so thank you. Thanks, Shivaji. Uh, questions? So I can ask a question. So if these galaxy mergers are not the sources for the neutrinos, what else could be there? Uh, this is an open question. I mean, we have no, to look but into that. It's like some thoughts. <laughs> what What are the thoughts? Like, what are people looking at as possible? So people uh, have looked into uh, these classes of sources here. So, so blazers, gamma rays, uh, AGNs, nebulae, uh, and also like uh, galaxy mergers. We have not found anything. So we have just put upper limit. So pro, uh, if we have more data, then we can put more. We can say more about uh, so more do some about of these sources completely explain the ice cube flux or no uh, at maximum it can explain 30 percent of 30. the observed flux yeah. mm -hmm. because i have heard it, it is if i'm not no. wrong it is minus 2.7 the most accepted uh, accelerated i mean acceleration theory is like fermi second order acceleration mechanism right so that is actually motivated by that Any other questions? Everybody seems tired. All right, if there are no more questions, then we stop uh, the session here. So let's thank Shubhadeep and all the speakers of the session. And uh, Saurabh has some announcements to make. Just two quick announcements. One is, of course, much awaited tea and coffee is downstairs. We decided to shift it before the discussion session. But before that, we'll have a group photo just outside this building. So we'll go first uh, in the front, uh, and uh, we'll be a group photo, and then we can go and have coffee. And we'll reconvene at, yeah, 4, 420? Yeah. So we'll reconvene at 420 then. Mm -hmm.